Hello, welcome, James. Your chat is your ability to provide us the questions you want to ask the people who are here and with us today. So what I'm going to do is I am going to turn it over to Craig to get us going. Welcome, Craig. Oh, good morning. Morning, noon, I guess noon, morning for, for some of our folks out there, but on the East Coast, it's actually noon, but it, it is good to be here. And I wanna say welcome everyone to the 2021 National Coding Symposium. And this is hosted by the American Printing House for the Blind, as well as uh, the Connect Center, which is part of the APH and the California School for the Blind. I'm Dr. Hey, Craig Hedder, and I am president yeah. here, which is- Hey, tell me when it's quarter after, will you? Uh, this symposium represents about two years of planning and replanning due to COVID. Um, but I think what you're going to see is we've assembled some of the greatest talents in the world here to speak with all of you about coding and perhaps the path forward for your future. And it's only fitting that we kick off this conference with uh, a, a truly amazing individual. And when I think about his accomplishments, I really consider him royalty in the field of blindness. His work has had an amazing impact, not only in education, but mostly in the workplace. And so it's a distinct honor to introduce one of the greatest innovators in accessible technology, and that is Ted Henter. A little bit about Ted. Uh, Ted, after losing his vision, learned that he learned the skills he needed uh, to develop job access with Windows speech in 1987. And we all know that as JAWS. And to this day, it's one of the most widely used synthetic speech software packages on the market. Um, Ted Wynn also on to found Henter Math, which provides visually impaired students every opportunity to get a quality education in math and science, which of course is the foundation for coding. So thanks in large part to JAWS and Henter Math, people who are visually impaired can now pursue fulfilling careers in the technology field. And without saying any much more, I'll let him tell his story. And as you listen to his words, it's my great pleasure to introduce Ted Henter. Ted, it's all yours. Thank you very much. That was very kind of you. What I would like to talk about today is uh, be prepared. The Boy Scout motto or success happens when preparation meets opportunity. <laughs> I'm uh, getting a little choked up. So I was, I was blinded in a car accident 40 some years ago. I was 27 years old. And I uh, had a couple operations and I woke up in the hospital and I knew I was gonna, I knew they weren't successful, the operations and I was gonna be blind. That was a big shock for me because I had been grown up being a surfer, a water skier, a go-kart racer. And at the time I, uh, in my late 20s, I was a professional motorcycle racer, eighth place in the world championship. So when I was looking at the future, being blind, I thought, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? I had an engineering degree because I had always planned that when my racing career was over, I could be an engineer or a mechanic. Well, now that all went out the window. So I was depressed. For the first time in my life, I think I was depressed. So I had about 10 minutes of despair in the hospital room. And then uh, <laughs> a warm faint feeling came over me, like a spirit in the room, like an angel. And so it told me, you know, somehow it communicated, hey, blind people have been around for thousands of years. Get over it. <laughs> You're going to be OK. And so I never, I never worried about it after that. But it still took me a while to get back on my feet, so to speak. And this thing about opportunity and success and preparation. Um, it's, I didn't put it all together then, but I have since then, that you have to be prepared because opportunities are gonna come along and it's up to you to be ready. You can't control the opportunities, but you can control the preparation in many. So, and that's why I went to school to be an engineer or all that stuff that I already mentioned. I'm looking at my notes. 
the division of blind division of blind services here in Florida they they provide counseling and and employment opportunities and advice. So they said, well, uh, you know, computer programming seems to be a pretty good career field for a blind person these days. So I decided, okay, I'm going to give that a try. So I went back to school. And this is the late 70s. There was no access technology. <laughs> when I was in class, I met a friend, a lady who offered to help me. She would read me, read to me what's on the screen. And, and I would figure out something in my head and tell her what to type in because I couldn't even type. That was not something that engineers learned back then. So uh, I was going to school. I was preparing myself for a, a career. Well, my wife worked for an attorney the attorney's husband owned up a couple of hotels on the beach here in St. Petersburg, Florida. And they came over for dinner one night. He and I got to talking. He was an inventor. And so was I. I had a couple of patented inventions for motorcycles. And he liked me and he offered me a job right there. And that's my point about preparation and opportunity. So I went to work for him. But as I said, there was there was no access technology, but a guy named Dean Blasey, who you've all heard of, he had uh, made a, a, a computer terminal talk. So he came down to install it and train it, and we became friends. So it was years went by that I thought, wow, that was awfully nice of a guy like Dean who owns a software company to come all the way down from Maryland to Florida. And then I figured out, well, it was the middle of winter. There was snow everywhere up in Maryland. And he had a hotel on the beach in St. Petersburg. <laughs> He's a pretty smart guy. Um, we got to be friends. I would call him up just about once a week. Why doesn't it do this? How can I make it do that? And when I say a talking terminal, I mean, it didn't talk like we know of that today. It would only spell one letter at a time. So if you're doing COBOL and you get to the perform statement, it would go P, E, R, F to get the picture. Very frustrating, very slow. It was tough to do a good job with a product like that. But things were changing. Him and uh, Mike Romeo, the guy, the Romeo Brailler that you've heard of, uh, they were working on it all the time. Eventually, they came out with a, a full speech synthesizer, and things were moving along. Well, they, Dean asked me to come up and demo the product because he figured I knew it better than he did for a competition that Radio Shack was putting on for disabled people. So I did, and we became even friendlier. At the end of the contest, Dean offered me a job. And I said, well, no. I know my wife's never gonna leave Florida. Her family's there. It's nice and sunny down there. Uh, I don't think we'll make it. So a week went by. Finally, my wife asked me, well, what did you and Dean talk about at dinner? Well, he offered me a job and I told him no. He says to me, huh? And from the find out, she was all, all good about moving up to Maryland and going to work for Dean. So that's what we did. That was in 1981. And that was the beginning of about four years of really a terrific employment opportunity for me at what was then known as Maryland Computer Services. And I met D, well, I got to be friendlier with Dean and met Mike Romeo and several other programmers there. And we developed the Total Talk, the Total Talk DC, uh, the ITS. And I learned how to be a, a pretty decent programmer, nothing special. But I had to learn um, assembly language, which was totally new to me. So I'd go home at night and my wife would read the book to me. I'd go back the next day and ask a few questions and get to work. It was quite a learning experience for me. And it's that thing about being prepared when the opportunity comes along. I didn't expect Dean to offer me a job, but he did. And I was prepared for it. So time goes on. Looking at 
that competition with with Radio Shack, we placed third. And it was a there was a I don't know, a couple hundred bucks prize money. So Dean went out and bought a, a beer keg for the office. <laughs> That's the kind of place it was. Very casual. So oh, I learned never underestimate a woman. That would be my wife, because I didn't expect her to go along with that opportunity. And never assume you know the answer until you've investigated it. And be prepared. If there's something you really want to do, like in my case, be an engineer or a motorcycle racer or a software designer, uh, prepare for it. Go to school. Talk, get a job. Even at the low level, get a job and learn a lot. That's where I learned most of what I know or knew about coding was on the job. So as time goes on, after about four years, the business was in trouble. Dean got fired. I got laid off. I moved back to Florida. And I was working for enabling technology, the guys that make the, the Braille embossers, as a consultant and tech support for the software that they had bought from Dean's company. Well, they called me up one day and they wanted me to go to Chicago to train a blind businessman up there. I did. Spent about a week up there. Bill Joyce is his name. We became good friends. He liked the water ski. I liked the water ski. Uh, we did a few ski trips. I did. I visited him several more times. He had a place down in Florida also. And it, when, and I kept telling him as we're training, well, gosh, I wish I could do this, and I wish I would do that. But I didn't have the time or the smarts to fix it. So one day he just says, well, why don't we start a company? And he says, I'll, I'll provide them money and you run the business. So that was the start of Hunter Joyce. And that worked out great for about mm, three years. And uh, uh, Bill had several other irons in the fire and he came to me one day and he offered me a, uh, an opportunity to buy the company, his half of the company for half of what he put in it. So my wife and I figured it out and we, we managed to do that. But that's now it's up around the early 90s. So I was struggling in the business. There was a lot of competition then, though. Uh, GW Micro had a good product, Telesensory, Arctic Technologies, and Jaws for DOS was just one of, of several. And I was on the board of directors at this training center for disabled people called Abilities. And this other fellow was on the board too, Jerry Bowman. So one day after the meeting, he offered me a ride back to the office. And we got to talking. He was a, huh? He was a human resources exec with Honeywell, retired. And um, one thing led to another, he came to work for us for free for at least six months. He, he was just volunteered, got us straightened out personal wise. And then he came on board for about 10 years and he retired when we sold the company in 2001. Yay. It was just one of those things, you know, opportunity came along. I never would have figured it out for that year. And then similar with Glenn Gordon, I'm not gonna to say too much about Glenn because he's on pretty soon. He and I became friends because he was using our software and he wanted some changes. Well, I didn't have the time or the smarts to hosted make by the changes. Willis with 17 panelists, comma. And I, um, I suggested, or maybe he suggested, look, I'll give you the source code, you make the changes and let us share those changes with other people. So that's what he did. So as time went on, I was convinced that Glenn was a very smart guy and very trustworthy. And over time, we got to talking and he came to work for Henry Joyce and he became the the most important technology guy for our company and for jaws he figured out a lot of the really tough stuff and over the years we had other developers too that are very significant like carl wise who will be speaking with you he was a math teacher at the school where my kids went he walked in one summer day at the beginning of summer wanted a job and so well, well okay we we weren't doing all that well 
And I said, but there's no guarantees. So when you know summer came, he had to decide whether to go back to work as a teacher, go to work for us. So I told him, well, okay, no guarantees, but come on board. And so there again, there was a preparation. He was prepared. He wanted to be a technologist. I needed some good people. And so the opportunity just walked in the door basically. But the preparation thing is the important thing. Um, uh, Eric Dambry, you've, you've heard of him. I'm sure some of you have. His dad was blinded. He was a blinded vet. He got an open book from Arthur Stone. Uh, Eric helped his dad set it up. He liked the technology he called Jim Frechterman, who I think is on this program too. And Jim told him to go see me. So he walks in the door one day, wants to talk about being in sales. And I had just had to lay off our sales lady for misbehaving at conferences. <laughs> I don't want to go into details, but uh, I told Eric, eh, I don't want to, I don't want any more salespeople. They're just too much trouble. And we're a small company. There's about 10 or 12 of us. And we got to be, he, he convinced me he was very interested. So I gave him a CD and I said, okay, here's Jaws. Go away and, and learn how to use it. Come back and show me. Well, he did a couple of weeks later. And he could use Jaws almost as well as I could. And he's a sighted guy. So we hired him. And he's still with the company, the Sparrow. As is Carl Weiss, but I'm not sure if I mentioned that. And Glenn Gordon. So these things, it's just amazing the way things work out. Uh, I'm not sure of the time. Mel, do we have time? You're doing good. You got about two minutes. Two minutes, okay. One not so funny story I, I want to impart. Back then when I decided to go back to school and be a computer guy, uh, my counselor took me over to the University of South Florida, which is in Tampa, which is about a half hour away from where I live. And I had a meeting with the uh, head of the department. So we walk in there. I'm fairly new to this, you know, I don't know much about the rights of disabled people. There was no Americans with Disabilities Act yet. There was no access technology. And this guy just right up front told me, I don't want any blind people in my, in my class. I had a guy once, it was just too much trouble, it took too much time, and I'm sorry, but I don't want you in my class. Well, I was shocked that it never happened to me before. So I went home and thought about it. I was kind of you know, confused. But then I thought, well, that's not the only college. It just so happens there was one right down the street from where I live, but it was the same college, but a branch office. So that's where I went and I uh, learned a little bit about programming. And the point is, sometimes what looks like a stop sign is actually a directional sign. So if you're on a path that you think is what you want, but you run into a roadblock, maybe you just gotta stop and think and maybe there's just a, another way to go. And so I learned a lot of important lessons along the way. I've got more to tell, but I know I'm short on time. Is there any questions I can answer? <laughs> Currently, you've had people in the chat who have have agreed with you, and that's really what I've been seeing, not real questions, but more nodding their head in your direction. That's fine. Should I say some more? <laughs> well, we are right time. at 10 to 1, or uh, what? depends on what time you are. We're at 20 minutes cool. after whatever hour you're at. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm done. I, I could talk. <laughs> more but i know you've got more important people oh well, you are very important thank you so much uh, thank you for the opportunity to say hi to glenn for me when he comes on well he's oh. coming on right behind you so you can say hello if you stick around hello around. I, thank you thank you so much ted it was a pleasure to have you speak and an honor to, to hear your story thank you're you you're too kind you're too kind i'm going to mute yes, my thank mic thank you hello well, hi, everybody. It's great to be with you at the National Coding Symposium. And it's great to follow Ted because Ted was one of the people who really influenced me at a time that I had very little knowledge about programming and software development. And I'm here to talk about coding as our 
most of the people on this week's panels. And it's kind of hard to talk about this topic without you actually learning to do it. It's a little bit like if you're blind, people have undoubtedly tried to explain colors to you. And if you've never seen colors, you have no idea what they're like. And no matter how many words people use to describe those colors, uh, hold on just a moment, I'm jangling. So no, ma no matter how many words people use to describe the colors to you, you will not understand it. Coding is a little bit like that. So I can't possibly hope to teach you coding in this next little bit, but what I'm hoping to be able to do is share some of my experiences and give you some ideas if you're interested in exploring whether or not this is something that you're interested in as a career or as something to simply help you in another career, you'll have some resources that'll help you along the way. So Ted mentioned that I joined his company. At the time, I was working at UCLA, uh, working on programs in Unix, which for those of you who have heard of Linux, Linux is a big deal now. Unix was the thing that preceded Linux. I was doing that and at that point, Windows was just becoming usable by most people in the world. Windows 3.0 had come out and it wasn't accessible to those of us who were blind. And I had this idea that although I had become a programmer, that suddenly I would be out of a job if I didn't help make Windows accessible. Now, keep in mind, at this point, I knew nothing about Windows. But I convinced Ted that I would work really hard. He hired me, he gave me a shot. And quite honestly, I don't know why. It never occurred to me that I would not be successful at it. And that's not because I thought I was terribly smart, by the way. Okay. It's okay. more because I just was so focused on the goal. Nice. Have you ever had a situation where you're so interested in getting stuff done that that's what's at the forefront of your mind and not really whether or not you can do it? That was the situation with me. And it was really, if anything, stupidity and not knowing all the stuff I didn't know rather than the fact that I was particularly clever that allowed me to succeed. The other thing that, that allowed me to, to do reasonably well was a person named Chuck Opperman. He had worked for Ted before I did. We had a little bit of an overlap. He knew lots about Windows compared to me. He created a framework for JAWS. It didn't work very well, but it did sort of work. You know, you could start it up and it might read one or two items on the desktop before it crashed. But it worked just enough that I could study what he had done and begin to make very tiny little changes and fix very small, minuscule issues one at a time. And I cannot tell you how much these small successes mean. If you think about any task that you need to perform and you think about the whole thing, it often is overwhelming. This, ha this continues to happen to me today, by the way. This is not a, <laughs> a thing that you outgrow. But if you pick it into small pieces, even if those first baby steps you take aren't very impressive, aren't very important, it's amazing what it does to your outlook on the world and your outlook about the project. And so I encourage you, not just with coding, but with anything that you try, to make small steps, do tiny little things that you're pretty sure you can get done, and then think about the problem again. Because as you begin to sort of peel away the layers one at a time, it does get easier and easier to move on. The other thing that I want to say just generally that has much less to do with coding probably than with real life is learn to be resourceful. And I mean this not, not in the technology sense, although the technology sense is really important. You need to know your tools. 
You need to know your screen reader. You need to know the environment, the tool where you're writing code. Those things are important. But being resourceful goes beyond that. It goes to the whole topic of solving problems. If you have a problem and you simply post email to a mailing list or you post on Facebook or Twitter and you ask for help and you and it's obvious that you haven't thought about the problem for very long, people are going to be less eager to reach out and help you. If you indicate that you've done some research, that you've read an article or you've read a book or you look something up on Google and you've explored and you tried it on your own, that's what, get other, that's what gets other people interested in your success and helping you succeed and really wanting to go those extra miles to make sure that happens. It's true in terms of small problems you may pose on the internet, but it's also true when you're in school. When you go to college, for those of you who do, there will be situations you will meet professors who seem very resistant to helping you as a blind person. And you'll get some people who are just ignorant and don't know exactly what to do to help, although you know, disability services do a, a good job of trying to educate the faculty of campuses. But there's nothing like getting to know your professor. I would always go up to my professor the first day of class. This was before computers, but the idea is still the same. And talk about how interested you are in their class, how interested you are in pulling your weight and doing as well as everybody else who are not blind and not wanting your blindness to be thought of as, you know, making it easier for you. You say those things to the professor, you know a little bit about what you need and how they might need to modify what they're doing. If you ask them nicely and explain that if they do these things, it'll make it easier for you. You may find that the, one of one or many of those professors become your biggest allies and your biggest supporters, people who are likely to write you letters of endorsement later on. That's really different than sort of demanding, right? You can always demand at the end. It's always easy to get meaner, but it's kind of hard to start out mean and obnoxious and get nicer. And so even though it is all of our rights to be treated with dignity, it does tend to do better asking people for assistance rather than demanding it. I mentioned a little earlier that learning your screen reader is important. For those of you who are using a phone or a tablet, if you're interested even slightly in coding, you're gonna to need to start using a PC or a Mac. And I'm just gonna start saying PC and JAWS because <laughs> JAWS is the thing I've been working on for almost 30 years now. And I'm not gonna talk about other tools. Other tools do exist, but for, for the purpose of my discussion, it's JAWS. Let's talk a little bit about coding. Generally, it's making a computer do what you want. And that you know starts from writing a web page to put something interesting on the screen. It's writing some code to make an item on the web page do something when you click a button. But then think about it. What, what is it that puts the web page on the screen? It's a web browser. How was that web browser written? It was written using code. Well, okay, what does the web browser run on? It runs on an operating system. Your iOS or Windows or Android are all operating systems. All of those are written with code. And so from the ground up, everything involves coding and programming. It took me a very long time before I took my first programming class to understand what it was. I remember growing up and I was like five or six and I guess because I had a logical mind, a friend of my mother's said, he'd be great in software. And I had no idea what software was. And coding is nothing more than English words 
for telling the computer what you want to have done. And there are lots of programming languages. You may have heard of some of them. JavaScript is the language of the web. Python is a very popular language and one that I recommend probably as your first one. Uh, it's used a little bit on the web. Uh, it's used for things in the background. It's used for AI and machine learning. It's sort of a general purpose language. The list goes on and on, but all of them essentially do the same thing. They take your ideas, they take what you want the computer to do in an English-like language and translate it into the language of the computer's internals, essentially ones and zeros. Different people write different programming languages to accomplish different tasks, but fundamentally, they're all the same. They all have the same basic building blocks. You, you get things done in slightly different ways, but the ideas are the same. There are things called functions, which are you know small portions of the program. There are conditions, there are statements, there are classes, and there are you know a handful of other concepts that you need to grasp. So there's good news on this front and bad news. The good news is that there is good news. No, the bad news is that your first programming language will be difficult to learn, or at least hardest to learn. The good news is that all subsequent programming languages will be much easier. I mean, I don't know lots of languages. I probably know half a dozen and three of them really well. Uh, and, and if you pursue code, you'll probably fit into a similar category. You need to experience it hands-on to know if you like it. And it comes in useful in a variety of fields. Uh, I read an article recently about a journalist who was trying to track down a crooked judge. And that judge sat on a particular court. And although you could go to a website and find every case that that court had adjudicated, you couldn't find cases by judge, you know, and there were, let's say, 50 judges who served in that municipality. And so uh, what they call digital reporter went and wrote a little program to go gather all the cases that that, you know, jurisdiction ever prosecuted. And once they were able to download the information about all those cases, then they could find all the cases with this particular judge's name in them. And it took a while, but it would have taken much longer, you know, like years with multiple people doing the research to do that stuff manually. And this is the kind of thing that's becoming more and more common where you're not using coding as your career, but it is helping you in whatever your, your uh, primary goal is. Computers really are the least judgmental people you've ever met. They do not judge you. They do exactly what you say. It's not their fault that you don't know what you mean. They think what you say is what you mean. And the goal, whenever you write code and it doesn't work the way you expect it to, is for you to figure out either what you wrote that was just wrong or how could the computer possibly be interpreting what I'm doing differently than I'm thinking about? If you think of it as a puzzle, you will love it. If you think of it as a fight, if you think of it as the computer is out to get you, this is not something that you will enjoy. I, I, <laughs> I guarantee it. But if you do treat it as a puzzle, you may find that this is one of the most alluring things that you've ever had in your life. And I, I encourage you to, uh, to learn a language, more on that in a second. Uh, a couple of myths that I wanna just dispute. One of them is that programming involves lots of math. It absolutely does not, unless you're 
coding for something like astronomy or other scientific pursuit where math is key to that science. But just writing programs that, you know, put things on the screen or do other things, uh, you know, compute information, gather information, that does not require high order math. If you've made it through, you know, algebra, you're going to be fine. There are a couple of mathematical concepts that programming uses that aren't taught necessarily in uh, traditional math classes like Boolean logic, uh, but you don't need to be a math whiz to, to do well at programming. The other one is that coding is visual. And in some ways, maybe you can say it's visual, but I think when most people think about it being visual, they think about programming as putting things on the screen. And how is a blind person or low vision person gonna put something on the screen that looks really good? Uh, and that's a good point. Uh, we probably aren't. And lots of coding does have to do with things that go on the screen. But even with that, more and more these days, companies are using graphic designers and other people who are really interested in interface to develop those things and develop how things look. And then there's code that even though it's involved with what goes on the screen is the logic that's written in the background and doesn't involve knowing how the screen is laid out. And the second part is there's this concept of front end versus back end. Front end is what's displayed on the screen, what a user sees. The back end is all the logic that goes on to make things happen. So think about Twitter. When you see something on Twitter, what you're actually seeing is information that comes from somewhere, right? If, if tweets from millions of people are being aggregated, it's not your personal smartphone that, that's pulling all of those tweets together. It's something in the background. And that's what I mean by back end. There's lots of coding that involves storing the tweets in a database or other place where they can easily be retrieved, retrieving tweets according to the specifications of an individual user. The list kind of goes on and on, but that's all back end work that does not require seeing something on the screen. You can write code in an editor like Notepad. I don't recommend it, but you can. When I started and was working on JAWS, that's essentially what I was doing. But now there are things called uh, integrated development environments or IDEs, and they do have an editor and that's where you enter the code, but they provide a lot of help. So uh, one of them that is, is becoming more popular now is called Visual Studio Code. And it's not necessarily my favorite, but the reason I'm recommending it to you as the first one to learn is because it's popular enough and accessible enough that lots of people are writing articles about using it. Not so much articles about using it with a screen reader, although there are you know, some limited ones, but about using it generally for, for various projects. And that's, that's a good place to start. I do suggest Python as an introductory language. And that's because you can write what are called console applications. They're essentially things that will gather information uh, and print something out from top to bottom. So you don't need to be at all concerned about how things are looking. You're concerned about making things happen. You know, you can write a short Python program that says print, you know, four plus five and it will show you the number nine. And then you can, you know, move on to another step, which is ask the user to enter two numbers and, and, and put those together. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, quickly is that Python is a great language for accessing content from other websites and websites that would be easier to gather their data programmatically than it would be to necessarily find them on the web. All of the popular sites, with the exception of Facebook, it seems, 
have APIs for getting at much, if not more of the data that you can see on the screen. For instance, YouTube has a Python module that allows you to gather information about individual videos or about the most popular videos. You can get and write a small Python script that uses a module, which is code that other people have written, to figure out what the top 10 videos are on YouTube. That's only 10 lines of code, maybe fewer, maybe six or seven, depending upon how you write it. So you can do tiny little baby steps uh, to get yourself going. You may want to wait and take a class in, in college, but if you have the opportunity and have a little time over the summer, you might want to explore, you know, read a book. Um, I have some links that I'm putting up there uh, in terms of Python. There, there is a wiki that talks about Python for absolute programming beginners. You can learn it that way. Uh, there are lots of resources online where you can get more information. There's a blind programming list called Program-L. All of these things, by the way, in the resources that I've sent to Denise and, and she'll be making available on the National Coding, Coding Symposium website. Uh, Program-L is a bunch of blind folks, mostly programmers, mostly coders, uh, who are there to help and answer questions. As I said earlier, ideally, try to do a little research on your own. You'll be amazed by how much Google will find for you. And even if it doesn't find you the final answer, learning to be resourceful and trying to figure out just how far you can get before asking a question is going to make those questions more specific and sort of increase the chance dramatically of other people being able to help you and being really interested in helping you. So we're coming down to the end. Um, there are a couple of other things I could talk about, but I want to find out if any of you have written uh, questions in the chat. Hi, Glenn. This is Leanne from the background. There are a few questions in here, and I will do my best to understand them because coding is new to me. So first question. A student who is blind fails a beginning class because the professor uses an inaccessible, and this is where I'm stuck, IDE. IDE, yes, exactly what can, right. What can we who serve college students do? I think it's I think it's a mixed, I think it's a mixed bag. The, the good news is that for most programming classes and projects, there are many ways to skin the cat. And for those of you who have cats, I apologize for that poor analogy. There are lots of ways of getting to the final uh, end, but you need to sort of know. And when I say you, I mean either the student or you as uh, su the support uh, staff need, need to be knowledgeable, either directly or by doing research and asking other people. You know, progr program L is probably a great place to look. Um, I'm certainly willing to, you know, answer questions if, if they're sent to me. My, my email link is in the information. Uh, the problem is that professors don't necessarily know what is and isn't accessible. They may not be the ones interested or willing to do the research, but if you can go to them with ideas about either possible other IDEs and environments for creating the work and or if the assignments are inherently visual, come up with other assignment ideas that are less visual, but that would teach the same concepts. I think, you know, all but the most curmudgeonly of professors are <laughs> going, to, going to be willing to go along and quite honestly be relieved that they're being given some information as to how to proceed. And those of us who are blind and have done this before are more than willing to offer up ideas and information as we can to try to help in this. Because to me, it's, it's often much more ignorance than it is uh, lack of interest on, on the part of professors. 
Thank you. Another one. So we had many people in the chat sharing information, though some might not have been able to see that if they're on the phone. So a person was asking, I would love to see what sorts of platforms other blind coders use to code with because it allows someone to read it with JAWS and see the results and be able to debug at the same time. You mentioned some and other people were writing, I use Python, I use VSC, I use VS Code, I use Visual Studio Code. Wasn't sure if you wanted to add anything. Okay, yeah, and so, so let, me, let me try to clarify. VS Code and Visual Studio Code and VS and Visual Studio, um, there are really only two products there of that of that mix. VS stands for Visual Studio. So no matter how you slice and dice it, the original Visual Studio uh, was written years ago. It continues to be an enhanced. It is the best environment hands down for writing code in C++, uh, C Sharp, uh, it's fine and it's good for the web. The problem with it for the web is not that many people are using it for the web comparatively these days. And so if you need help, it may be harder to find help for it, even though it's totally accessible, uh, than it would be to find help for Visual Studio Code. Visual Studio Code is becoming more accessible. It has, you know, just, just like Visual Studio has its quirks, but certainly can be used. Uh, for something for the web, I would recommend that probably, uh, unless you're feeling daring, in which case I'd say use Visual Studio. There's IntelliJ that we're working on to improve our JAWS support that's used for writing Java. There is PyCharm, which has the same general uh, underpinnings of IntelliJ. And so when we, when we improve IntelliJ, we'll fix PyCharm. That's another popular tool for writing Python. Those are, the, those are probably the big ones that I can think of. But again, if, if you have a specific question, feel free to reach out. Another question from one of our students, where does the operating system code live? It lives in a house at 224 University Avenue. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Typically, the operating system lives on files that start out on the hard drive, specially named files. And then when the operating system first, what's called boots, it essentially is pulling yourself up from the bootstraps. It's starting out by reading a tiny little amount from the hard drive and what's called the master boot record. And gradually, one piece of information points to the next until different files are loaded from the hard drive. And then ultimately, the operating system is then in memory. And that's where the operating system code executes. It's not unlike any program that then is subsequently loaded because that comes from a hard drive as well. It gets loaded into memory and then executed. OK. A question about a program. Have you looked at the Quorum programming language? I have looked at it only to read the description, but I have not tried it. And so I will go try it. I mean, everything that I've read about it is that it's a programming language used to teach programming primarily to blind people, or at least uh, it, it's very usable teaching people with uh, teaching programming to blind people. I don't, I don't have an opinion about it. My, my uneducated opinion is that it, it might be a very good programming language to learn first, you know, just like I think Logo used to be a really good language to teach kids. Um, I think the problem is it's not, as, it's not as popular as some of these other languages like JavaScript or Python or C Sharp. And therefore there might not be as many resources and it's probably not a, a direct path to anything permanent, but as a, as a starting language, I think there are a lot of good resources out there and that may be a good approach. Well, we have run out of time. 
we have lots more coding symposium coming up. And if I remember correctly, Glenn, you're on one of our Q and A's later this week. I am on, I think I'm on the final one. I, I think I see your name on Friday, if you're in Eastern time, otherwise do your math, Eastern time at 5.30. And so that would be another great place to come and join. And it sounds like pick your brain. You, you have had lots of wonderful questions and people doing great sharing with one another. And you speak definitely to people who are saying, yes, that's something I struggled with. I'm moving forward or I would love to explore coding. That's why I'm attending. So you have inspired more. Thank you very much. And I don't know that there'll be any of my brain to pick again on Friday, but assuming there's any left, I'm happy to uh, let you pick at it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Well, thanks everyone for being here today. We're, we're very excited. Um, Leanne mentioned a few minutes ago that we are um, close to 300 attendees uh, in the last session. So hopefully that uh, will continue to be the case. And I am here to introduce our panel today. This and Juan is, uh, is here. If he would turn on his camera, I would be able to add him to the panelists. So this panel is a panel of um, coders. And the moderator today is Steve Clower. He's a software developer with Desmos. Uh, we have Juan Hernandez as a panelist, and he is a software engineer with Best Friends Animal Society. Dr. Stephanie Ludi, did I say that correctly? Yep. Professor at University of North Texas. And Ken Perry, a senior software engineer at the American Printing House for the Blind. And now I will turn this over to our moderator, Steve. All right. Uh, thank you, Denise, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, glad, to, glad to be here and uh, participate in this first ever coding symposium with uh, APH. All right. So before we start getting into the questions, um, I think it'd be great to kind of learn a little more um, about each of our uh, panelists, um, kind of you know, what got them to where they are and what they do. So we'll go in uh, alphabetical order uh, by last name. So uh, Juan, would you like to give some information as to, as to what you do as a coder? Uh, can you hear me? Yep, sound good. Okay, sorry, I, I, my video is not working. Uh, so I'm gonna have to be without video right now. But um, a little bit about myself. Um, is that what you asked? Sorry. You yeah, sure yeah, I'm yeah. Answering. Just yeah, just some some background. Uh, okay. What, what kind of stuff you work on? Sure. So I have been a. Um, so I've actually been coding since I was ten years old, <laughs> um, which was a long, long time ago. I've been a professional software engineer for the last twenty years. Um, currently, uh, I work for Best Friends Animal Society. Um, I work on a lot of their data. Uh, database work, um, ETL, uh, database work, um, coding a lot of SQL scripts for transforming data, moving data from one server to another. Um, previously, I've worked on Android development. I used to, I was the first software engineer to ever work for Ira as a, as a blind software engineer to work for Ira, um, which was a long time ago. And so yeah, that's a little bit about myself. All right, awesome. Starting starting at age ten. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was I can, a nerd. I had a good oh, hey, I was, I was, I was too. That's about <laughs> when I started too. Uh, programming stupid programs with BASIC on a Braille and speak. Um, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was C plus plus uh, for me, but basically, yeah. Uh, yeah, ba it's it was, all about it was, the mentors. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was BASIC uh, and, and and then C. All right, um, Stephanie uh, from my alma mater at uh, University of North Texas. Um, love oh, really? to learn a little more about you. Yep. All right. Um, so, good morning or slash afternoon, everyone. I guess it's all afternoon at this point. Uh, I'm a California native, uh, so that's kind of why I, uh, Adrian knows me a little bit. Um, I started programming when I was in middle school, uh, although it was a long time ago. So they were on Apple II computers. Uh, and I thought it was very interesting, but I didn't really know what programming really was outside of what I did. Um, 
And so I went on to university and I actually started in computer engineering, and that, which is the hardware side. Um, but I switched over to computer science because I thought that the um, software side of things was more interesting to me. So I continued on and I got my bachelor's and my master's uh, and my PhD. But along the way, I did work in the industry for a bit. So I've worked for, for Xerox for a bit. I had done some uh, freelance work on the side uh, for a medical lab, as well as um, some other small companies that needed work done. Sometimes it was on the web, sometimes it was desktop. So I've along the way learned many, many languages. Um, I've used both Windows and PC. I've also worked on terminals. Uh, Xerox, they had their own terminal system at the time. Um, what I do currently, I am a faculty member uh, in computer science and engineering. Uh, and so with that, I do teach students how to develop software, uh, including project-based work, because I think hands-on is very important. Uh, on the kind of other hat that I wear in terms of research, I, I do work, so I am involved in the programming and design of software uh, on iOS and web-based software um, and, and desktop software. Uh, partially to allow students to have more accessible experiences in learning how to program. So I've done work there. Um, some of you may have used my JBrick software uh, to program Lego Mindstorm robots. And so that was one of my projects. Um, and so that was text-based programming, but some of the work that I do now uh, is for the web, but it involves making block-based systems more accessible. Uh, and so that's, you might have heard that in terms of things like Scratch, for example, which out of the box are not accessible. And so to me, because they are used so extensively, especially in the younger grades, uh, we've been doing a lot of work in terms of trying to make them more accessible. So that way students can use them independently, as well as in collaborating with their sighted peers. Wow. <laughs> Very impressive. Very impressive. Uh... Wish you'd been at UNT when I was a student. <laughs> the big school, I can imagine. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. Um, and uh, Ken Perry, uh, definitely well known, uh, especially to APH, because you've been at APH for, for quite some time now. Uh, care to give us some background on yourself? Uh, I've been coding since seventh grade when I was cited. I was, that was 37 years ago, um, but I didn't go into coding. I went into electronics, joined the Air Force. Um, and that's where I lost my sight. So at the, when I lost my sight, they told me I couldn't do electronics anymore. So I took software engineering in college. And, uh, so for the past 27 years, I've been coding. I run a commercial game that's online, uh, called the Hala. So it's a text-based game that's been around since the late eighties. And uh, I worked at Mac Printing House on just about everything. I'm working on Braille Blaster. I've worked on the tactographic display. I wrote Tetris tactily. Um, I've done things on the mobile manager, the first uh, Braille Plus 18, which is the first Android uh, phone. Uh, I've worked on shoot, so many things I can't even think. But right now I'm working on some Arduino kits for the blind. So what we're trying to do is make um, Arduino hardware and stuff more accessible by just creating kits that are developed mainly for touch sound and everything. Whereas, you know, normally you get an Arduino kit, it has blinking lights, Well, we're trying to make kits that are more touch sound um, oriented for starters. Um, that'll include things like Raspberry Pi and uh, Arduino boards. And, you know, so we hope to continue this um, you know, accessible kits and stuff. So that's, that's what we're working on right now. All right, great. Yeah, uh, APH is definitely well known for kind of bridging those uh, those barriers and tearing them down in a lot of cases uh, with with these types of things. The uh, the Arduino stuff, especially, um, I, you and I will need to talk afterward <laughs> somehow because I'm interested in that myself. You're already on my field test list. All right, hey, great. <laughs> All right, so yeah, we've uh, definitely got. Uh, quite a diverse group here. Um, so um, I guess the, the first question that I'd, I'd like to pose here, uh, I guess we'll, we'll start again with you, Juan. Um, when you began coding, I mean, what, what type of just 
basic technology skills did you have to to master to to make that possible? Um, especially if you started off blind, um, you know, did you find a certain type of operating system, uh, screen reader combination, uh, you know, more effective than another? Um, did you edit in say a real basic kind of code editor? Did you go full blown uh, development environment? Um, what do you think? Um, yeah. Um, so I, I guess I, uh, I'm trying to remember, it was so long ago, almost, uh, well, about 30 years ago when I started coding. Um, so I originally, so skills, let's start with skills. So to code, you know, you obviously have to, you know, be able to type on a computer. Um, and so one of the most basic skills I learned from very young on an Apple 2GS um, in the in the mid 80s uh, was, you know, touch typing. Um, because, you know, it, it's, it, coding is just, just text, typing text uh, and lots and lots of it. Um, and there are so many different symbols that you use for coding, you know, uh, conditional symbols, equals, and, you know, all the different symbols that, you know, um, you find on the keyboard. And so being able to access them in a rapid way instead of like chicken uh, typing, <laughs> as I call it, chicken pecking with one finger, um, which is very difficult to do when you're blind because you can't see the keyboard. So touch typing was to me, one of the beginning major skill sets that I learned. Um, but with, with touch typing came use, um, you know, learning how to use a screen reader. So back when I was learning to code, I, start, I started coding, um, in, on, in DOS um, with a screen reader called Vocalize, which was the predecessor to Windowize, which is no longer with us. Um, but, uh, and so I would just code, uh, like I just said earlier, I learned C++, but I did also learn um, QBasic. And so I was, I was working on that in just the basic editor in DOS. Um, and so, you know, that's where I started. And I just started with very basic programming uh, tasks, you know, just little tiny little, uh, you know, asking questions and response, you know, to get your basic input output and moving to more complex things like little mini, uh, like tic-tac-toe games or spelling games and stuff like that. So, yeah. All right, great. Yeah, so uh, typing, I, I think is uh, <laughs> definitely an important skill to have. Um, Absolutely. As well as being able to operate your, your screen reader, whatever that happens to be. Um, definitely uh, a lot more choices today, um, even <laughs> though uh, Windowize is sadly no longer with us. A uh, quick segue, um, I worked on that project um, <laughs> before uh, I left. So kind of sad to see that one go, but uh, what do you do? Life um, moves on, right? <laughs> yep, in, indeed. Yeah, so that uh, kind of leads me to a related uh, topic here. Stephanie, I'd like to kind of get your thoughts on this. So for, for me, uh, growing up, uh, learning coding, um, I found it very advantageous to be able to study code, uh, especially with uh, lower level languages like C++ or even uh, assembly where, uh, you know, you have a lot more symbology to work with, you know, uh, less than, greater than, uh, braces, semicolons, and all that kind of stuff where punctuation is essential um, in order to, to, to write a program. Reading that in Braille helped me learn and retain that uh, immensely. But, uh, you know, I, I grew up learning both uh, speech, Braille, and print uh, kind of all at, at the same time because uh, my sight was uh, degrading. So kind of curious, um, what, what are your thoughts, especially from uh, the vantage point of a professor? Um, as far as uh, literacy skills, um, do you find, especially with uh, more technical topics, do you find uh, speech to be enough? Is print better? Uh, do you prefer Braille? Um, yeah, what are your thoughts? I, I'm, I'm not a Braille user, um, but certainly uh, for me, it's, um, it's more uh, modifying the print because I have to re read things in, um, inverted. So it's white on black and enlarged. Um, but I have found over the years, because you know, I'm getting older, that um, 
certainly at times, depending on the content, it might print might be suffice, but at other times having a uh, voice can be helpful. But I found that relying on, on audio is generally not a, a good approach in, because of the fact that there are such subtleties often in content, uh, whether it be the symbology that's used or, or other elements of the material being conveyed that um, I, I'm not able to just use audio itself, but it can sometimes uh, complement using print. Uh, not, and I would imagine just working with students that I have worked with who use Braille, that, that has often been the case for them too, where Braille is very important for them and, and having those skills where, audio, where they use Braille and comp, kind of complement it with the audio. Um, so that's kind of my, my take on, on that. But, but for me though, um, having to have text enlarged um, and, and inverted actually makes a huge difference. I just have to sometimes switch it off when I'm presenting stuff to students uh, just because uh, sometimes looking at a page inverted depending on what else is on it can be very strange if you're not used to that. Um, but when I certainly when I work with my own uh, material, I just kind of set it up exactly how I need. And I also have an extra large monitor as well. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. When I, uh, when my site was a little better and I still had some usable uh, vision, um, I, I was exactly the same. I did everything reverse contrast if I could. Um, kind of curious, do you find uh, any, you know, uh, one, one mode say like uh, in, in large print uh, more, effective for certain tasks or does it just kind of depend on you know how you're feeling that day um so i would say certain tasks just because if you if i am coding um i do enlarge it but i have to kind of i can adjust things like dpi and not just percentage of magnification in order to be able to try to find a balance of how much can fit on the screen um that way I'm not you know, scrolling all over the, the place to try to get somewhere. But one of the things I also find helpful, and I've seen other programmers with visual impairments do this as well, is you have your code with you, but you also at times have notes uh, aside from that. And certainly it's nice to document your code. That way it you know, explains what it does and you can go back to it later and you, you can recall, oh yeah, that's what it does or share it with someone else. Um, but when you have very large systems that you're working on, because most things are not one file, uh, it's, it's nice to have an extra place to have some notes uh, that you're working with to kind of remind yourself where things are and being able to jump to things very quickly. Uh, and again, kind of having that in a format that works for you to be able to access quickly and use quickly is very helpful. Yeah, that's a great tip. Uh, one I should adopt myself, uh, especially if you take a break from a, a piece of code um, sometimes for years and come back. <laughs> you may think that you remember how you did it, but uh, it's almost guaranteed you're going to wonder what's going on and have yeah. to re-familiarize yourself with your own code. Um, yeah. So th this is interesting. So we've, we've gotten, uh, it sounds like we kind of have a, a full range here of, uh, of, of perspective. So uh, Ken, I'd like to kind of get your, your take on this as well, especially uh, from, from your perspective as someone who had, uh, full site starting off, do you find uh, any mode more effective uh, than another as far as uh, literacy and coding? Sorry, it really depends on what I'm working on. Uh, I've had to work on, you know, Braille displays and stuff. So, you know, knowing Braille really helps, uh, formatting helps, but I don't use it on a regular basis. I use audio output because I'm total and Reading Braille, uh, I lost my sight at 21, so reading Braille is a bit slow for me, but it comes in handy when I'm looking at a formatting or things like that. Um, but I also have to know it because I, I've been tutoring people, um, something I do on Zoom since COVID. So, um, you know, it just helps to know how other people view things. Um, but I do use audio from almost everything. Uh, I also am lucky enough to, you know, have one of the, uh, the uh, tactile graphics displays and those really will be helping in the near future when those start coming out. 
Um, I mean, it won't be the ones we originally made, but there's stuff coming maybe by us, maybe by others. But uh, I think those are going to help uh, in coding a lot of things. So, but I do, I do love audio out. Great. Yeah. And as someone who learned Braille, um, you know, starting off real, real young, I think I started at age five, um, kind of along with print, you know, I, I would, I would call myself uh, totally fluent uh, and proficient in it, but I'm like you, uh, if I'm coding most of the time, I, I use speech unless there's something very, uh, very specific. Well, or, uh, I, think, hmm? I, I think the problem is when I started, when I first lost my site, we were in eBay still. Um, so we weren't in UEB Braille and a lot of the, a lot of the codes were, you know, impossible to, you know, really tell what they were in Braille. I started out in assembly and, and things like that. And, and trying to view that in the old Braille code is almost impossible, right? It's, you could go to computer Braille, but then you're kind of learning two or three Braille things. And since I was learning Braille, I didn't want to have to learn you know, multiple codes. So I stuck with audio and I've gotten pretty good. I mean, when I was in calculus, uh, I took calculus totally blind and, uh, you know, I'm sure a lot of other blind people listening do the same thing, but, you know, I could, I could stick a five page calculus problem in my head and manipulate it. So, you know, that's kind of how I do coding is it's all mentally. My wife catches me every once in a while and I'm doing the Stevie wonder head waving because I've got one of the largest screens, you know, I, you know, can be look up in the top left-hand corner of my room and that's something I've got saved up there. So I do a lot of visual memory, even totally blind. And I'm not sure I even call it visually visual. It's more like a registry that I can stick things in and, and recall them. So that's how my weird brain works. <laughs> I'd like hey. to add to what Ken, I mean, I, I completely agree with what you said. Uh, you know, me, I'm, I lost my sight or, um, you know, not in when I was like very super young, like you learned Braille when you were five, but I, I learned, I think I learned Braille in my early teenage years. And so, you know, that, that 10 year span makes a huge difference in like the quality of speed you get from reading Braille versus you know, like, I, I, I mean, some, some of my friends that I grew up with re read Braille so fast and I'm like, wow, I, I just, I can't do that. And so audio for me was the big, um, you know, I would say 80% of what I do today is audio, speech audio and 20% is Braille. Um, but the visual thing, the visual, what you call visual memory, I, I, that's exactly what I call it. And it drove, I mean, I'm sure you had the problem when you took calculus, it, didn't it drive your teachers nuts that all of it was in your head? Actually, and they kept they kept saying show your work show your work and it's like why actually the teacher <laughs> I can just give you an me. answer yeah the, the teacher <laughs> called me and said he thought he that I was cheating so in class exactly. one day he, he called me <laughs> out and said okay you're going to do this problem and so I did and that's you know I, I think people don't understand that with enough work and enough practice there's amazing things you can do with your mind exactly exactly yeah and you know there's there's a, a common misconception that uh, just because you're blind doesn't mean you don't use the visual part of your brain. Um, I I don't know about the the rest of you, but uh, for for me, Braille being the mode that I've used the most as far as uh, the written word, I actually see you know words in my head in Braille. I don't see them in print anymore. I have to make a, a mental effort to to switch. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, uh, this this discussion of uh, of calculus does uh, kind of lead me right uh, nicely into my next question here, which is, you know, what what role um, has uh, you know STEM topics like uh, or subject rather like uh, math, uh, I guess <laughs> math, math most of all, but also just you know reading and writing. Um, you know, what has that played in, uh, in in your coding? Like, were were any of you interested in math? So, starting starting out did you learn it just because you had to because your degree said so so you could you know I'm gonna ignore pass, math forever <laughs> i'm gonna pass on this one because if people want to know my theories on this uh i'll be doing a session tomorrow on are there uh shoot i can't even remember the topic of my thing uh, but it's are there uh, learning uh, are there things you need to know before you learn to code so this is going to be in my talk so i'm gonna let other people answer this question <laughs> All right, uh, Stephanie, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, so um, 
my computer science degree was in a college of engineering. So because of that, there were basic requirements for all engineers to take. So I had, I went to a school on the quarter system, by the way. So instead of two terms a year, it was three. Um, so I had to take a four calculus classes. Um, math, math was actually kind of a challenge for me uh, just because uh, the accommodations were kind of lacking at the time. I uh, actually repeated it <clears throat> a couple of times. So, um, you know, it was it important. Given what I do, uh, I would say statistics and probability is, is very important. Um, and I know people that work in, in uh, game development who, in, who use uh, a lot of math and other areas of things like simulation and uh, AI and all these other things where math is uh, certainly very important, but not all aspects of software development require high level math. Um, certainly one needs to be literate in math. So there sure, certainly should be a certain level of uh, mathematics literacy, uh, but um, sometimes some requirements are there because of the college that you're in, if you're in engineering versus the College of Science, for example. Same thing with science requirements. I had to take a lot of physics, uh, certainly more than I, I ever have used after. Uh, but uh, th sometimes that's why it's done. But again, you don't always use it yourself. Like if someone gave uh, gave me an equation to solve in calculus now, I'd have to take a while in order to be able to research how to do that again. Um, but certainly, again, other areas, because I of the work that I do, I use a lot of statistics and probability work, and that has more ref relevance. Um, certainly discrete math also has relevance for computer science. So again, it, it kind of depends. Um, as far as the writing, uh, in reading, yes, uh, definitely use a lot of that. Writing, I do a lot of writing. Part of it is this, the research that I do because uh, I write papers and things like that. But also in terms of um, relating how to do things to others um, and creating materials for that, web-based or um, print-based um, is, is one area. I do a lot of reading because I'm, you know, you're a continuous learner. That was one of the things that I learned very early on in my undergraduate degree is you will not stop learning and nor should you uh, because you want to be current in your field. And, and so, um, you know, sometimes that's taking classes, but other times that's things like uh, reading someone's blog or, you know, looking things up or can, we're interacting on Stack Overflow or a lot of other forums and things. And so that can have a lot of different ways that that manifests. But a lot of that involves, you know, again, both taking from what others have, have available for you to learn from in addition to giving back to others that need that help. And that can take a lot of different forms. Wow, really great insights. Uh, yeah, it, it, learning is something that uh, should, should never stop. Um, I, I think we've all could have gone through that phase where you know, you're ready to just be done with school and get on with life and then you don't ever have to learn again and you hear these cliches that oh you never stop learning well it's true <laughs> it's true and learning especially in a technical field like coding you you know if you take a break for a few years you have a lot of catching up uh, that you may have to do um so you you got to stay on top of it but if you enjoy it it's 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 fun to you know to study and learn how new things are developing um, reading and writing, especially, um, is I, th I think a skill that isn't emphasized enough for, well, in, in a lot of areas, but especially for, for coding, some of the worst documentation I've read came from people who, who program, um, they can write code, they can work algorithms out in their head. They make great software or hardware, but if you can't communicate how things are supposed to work. Uh, into language that either other coders or even more importantly, just everyone else who's not a coder can understand, that's going to be a problem. Um, so yeah, math, math is uh, something that uh, I, I also feel you should be literate in, but you definitely don't have to be an expert in it. Um, I'm certainly not. And I work at a math company. So um, there you go. Uh, Juan, what do you, what do you think about this? I, I agree. Um, 
you know, oftentimes uh, universities require these huge requirements for math. When I went and got my computer science um, degrees and my master's, you know, all the, they're always, you know, there was, uh, because they were through the science and engineering department, they always required, you know, the full complement of calculus used from, you know, single variable to multivariable calculus, linear algebra, which is, which is useful in artificial intelligence engineering, uh, discrete math, very important um, for computer science. But, you know, honestly, you, you, you know, you'll have to take these classes in, at university, but um, keeping up the skill set of like, you know, multivariable derivatives or integ integrations with calculus, you won't really ever use them in, in most programming, web development, standard de desktop app development, you know, mobile development, you know, you won't use any of that stuff. Um, you know, only in like gaming, you'll need mathematics and physics. Uh, game development, I mean, our AI, again, like I said, our linear algebra, there's some others, um, but the majority of development, you know, just basic knowledge of algebra, for the most part, will get you through. Um, I, do, I do want to throw a little in. I do want to throw a little in. Um, you know, I thought I'd never use it coming out of college, but one of the first assignments I had, well, one of the first jobs I had was with my brother's company to do environmental tracking in Utah. <laughs> And I instantly was using calculus formula to get these web forms of, of these, you know, uh, visual outputs. And uh, if you really want to do, you know, it's kind of goal based. You really want to know what you're going to be doing with the coding. For instance, if you're going to get into speech synthesis, you may need to know some really intricate mathematics, or you may not, depending if you're going to use AI that is already created. And so it really depends on how you're going to do stuff. It's really good to have the information. You may never use it, but to understand what something like, if I say Fourier transform is, it's a huge thing to know what it is. So you know what you're looking for and you know what it's going to do. Right. I, yeah, I completely agree. But, you know, that being said, you know, it's still, those are still more like boundary software engineering jobs. You know your standard development. You know, yeah, just a, so, a solid math sk skill set. Algebra, you know, algebra, some discrete mathematics will, will serve most people. I would say ninety percent of people well. But every once in a while, you'll get a programming task that does need some advanced math. And having taken those classes, uh, you know, and at university, you know, years later, it's easy to come back and, you know. Google it on the internet and refresh yourself on how this is how something is done. So. Yeah, yeah, totally and agree. <laughs> reading and writing, like, uh, like, I'm sorry, is it Stephanie that said? Um, uh, uh, she said that reading and writing, you know, as engineers, we have to communicate all the time with our non coding uh, colleagues, managers, oftentimes uh, managers and, and project managers. Uh, uh, other people that work on the team, designers, they don't code. They, they, you know, they're part of the team in some various aspect, but they're not coders. And so you have to, you know, relay, you know, issues, bugs, uh, feature, feature modification, updates, and, and good, you know, proper English. That way everybody can understand it. Yeah, really good. Really good. Uh, something that, uh, I'm sure uh, <laughs> I've, I'm kind of interested uh, to learn the answers uh, to, to this particular question here. Um, how do you navigate working with sighted peers, um, especially if your colleagues are, say, uh, you know, uh, product designers that do a lot of uh, visual prototyping or uh, similar, similar work like that? Um, see uh one just talk so uh i guess we'll uh pass this one over to stephanie okay <clears throat> so it, it partially depends on on what it is that they're trying to convey to you um i i often get things uh in writing that are color coded and i don't see color at all so even though i have vision i can't see that and so with that i i have them I, well, I, sometimes they're very good in, in remembering that, but if they're not, I, um, 
well, one, remind them, and two, uh, ask them to uh, have another key to use that I can use to be able to go through that information. Um, and, and so that makes it uh, helpful. I sometimes will, you know, I have to ask extra questions, but they're generally accommodating. Uh, for things like things that are related to, to code, um, it's good to have standards that everyone on the team is following. And so that way it can mitigate some of the confusion and things that can arise from code. So having styles in terms of naming things and how things are organized can definitely minimize some of the, you know, hunting for things that can uh, be in code. Um, and so that I take advantage of that. Um, in terms of um, things that are particularly visual, like a screen, uh, I will sometimes need to sit down with the designer and go through it. And so that way they can kind of walk through it with me. Um, so I can kind of uh, envision it in my head. And I'm thinking something like a static image. So not something on the web where I could use, uh, where I could use something like a screen reader or have it enlarged. Uh, sometimes things are just literally a static image where you just kind of need to get a sense of it. Um, but I do kind of push uh, the designers where I need to in order to think about how to explain it, especially in our case where a lot of our projects, we need to get feedback from persons with visual impairments of all different types. And so it is important for us to be able to convey things in, in and I'm usually the first test of that. So if they can at least get it past it so that I can understand it, that's, that makes the first cut. But then we need to go back and make sure that, um, that things are otherwise well uh, defined and labeled and conveyed in ways that everyone can understand it. And occasionally that means that something needs to be brailled uh, or having certain graphics created uh, depending on what type of feedback we're getting. So there, there is so much that can be, um, there's so many different types of information I, I get on any given day, whereas it might be something like spreadsheets, really big spreadsheets or code or, uh, or screens to show um, UI prototyping that, um, you know, I just kind of work out a system with whoever are the people behind that to kind of keep things uh, done in a way that is efficient uh, in ways to get feedback uh, that still can just be integrated into the process that they're using to create them. Great. Uh, how, how receptive generally have you, have you found people like you send them a reminder? Um, do they remember next time or do you have to constantly remind them to make things so that, uh, you know, that you can respond to their, their requests? Well, it sort of depends on, on where I have worked. In some places, it's uh, people sometimes have been less receptive, but certainly where I work currently, I work with a lot of people closely enough on a regular basis that it is just kind of integrated in. I mean, even something as simple as um, a, a recent boss of mine uh, where he just sends me the slides for meetings ahead of time uh, as opposed to not getting them. So certainly, you know, there are even just little stuff like that where it's just, oh, okay, you know, he'll, he will send me those an hour before the meeting. So I'll have them in place. Is, is a huge help and it's just a matter of just, you know, throwing it in an email as an attachment. Oh yeah, that's that's helpful, not just for work, but for in general, uh, you know, general uh, <laughs> presentations or even classes uh, in college, especially. It, uh, I found it very helpful uh, when I could get cooperation from uh, professors, uh, you know, send me the, the slides you're gonna show ahead of time uh, then I could follow along. Uh, Definitely a, a really big help there. Yeah. Uh, Ken, what do you think? Um, you're kind of in a unique position there, uh, working at an organization uh, staffed with uh, plenty of, uh, of, of blind people, but also plenty who are, are fully sighted. Yeah, I think I'm in an extremely lucky position. I mean, when I started out, I coded for myself in, you know, and I still do for commercial reasons uh, in, in, as a hobby, but in, at APH, uh, I, I'm lucky to have a position where um, we think accessibility first in most cases. Um, the sighted coders that I work with are uh, used to having blind and low vision people working with them. So they don't come steaming in with a UML diagram or, you know, find the most graphical tool to create something. Uh, and in some cases, 
some of the tools we use, command line tools, are much more powerful than some of the graphical tools out there anyway. But, you know, with things that are being done with things like IntelliJ, uh, like the JAWS accessibility and that that's working on it, even in BDA, there's a couple issues with that. Um, IntelliJ is actually trying to be more accessible themselves. Um, so a lot of the IDEs, the, the, the development environments are becoming more accessible. Uh, I was around when, you know, I had to help build the first scripts for uh, Visual Studio uh, 2005 or 2003. I can't remember. Anyways, uh, nowadays, a lot of the in integrated dev development environments come with some accessibility built in. So mainly when we start a project, we make sure the stuff that we work on is accessible from the start uh, because we have people that are involved with it and because our business is making stuff for people with visual impairments. So uh, it's kind of really easy for me. All right, great. Yeah, you talk about Visual Studio, that's making me pine for the, the days of uh, C++ 6.0. <laughs> visual Studio 6 was like the first visual environment that kind of worked. But, uh, you know, I use Borland 5 because I wrote the scripts for uh, VCL, so um, in JAWS. And Visual Studio, you know, I, I was so, it was so hard just to make buttons. Nowadays, I don't think blind coders realize how difficult it was back then before layout managers. And heck, you know, I, I kind of feel for people like uh, Ted Hinter and Larry, who started out with a, you know, one line text editor, you know, and that's what they did stuff with. So uh, I think we're, you know, there isn't a better time to be a blind developer. I'll, I'll tell you that. Oh, absolutely. Man, the, the tools that are out now, especially you can even pick operating systems uh, oh, yeah. and, have, and, and have really good, uh, good success depending on, on how you learn and what kind of things you want to work with. Uh, yeah, so we're getting close to time here. So I've, uh, I think we've got time for one more question. And I think I want to ask this one in particular um, for the benefit of uh, any of our younger participants or, uh, you know, that might, might be interested in this. Um, We'll start with you, Juan. Um, what what advice, if you could go back in time and give your uh, teenage self one piece of advice, what would it be? Um, I I guess what I would say, the the to me the biggest like thing I've learned over the years is, you have to be your own advocate. You know what you need for yourself and how you work, how you think. And so, you know, people, people aren't going to, you know, in the professional world, people aren't going to do things for you. So you got to do things on your own. So you have to, you know, through, you know, communication and everything, just advocate, you know, how you want things to work and be able to compromise, meet people in the middle. Um, unfortunately, we live in a sided world um, and most of us work you know, uh, you know, most of the time it's working with sighted people. And so if building relationships, managing that relationship so we can meet each other in the middle, so you can do your advocacy, so you can get your work done, to me is the most, one of the most important things I've learned over the years. Yeah. And you, you'll have to advocate. Um, I know this may sound like a downer, but uh, it never stops. Um, I advocated no. through school. I had to fight pretty hard <laughs> all the way through, uh, especially high school and, and college, just to get, uh, you know, accessible materials or accommodations, um, even yeah. in the workplace, it, it's, it's happened. Uh, and yes, at my previous job at a blindness company, um, <laughs> believe it or not, had to do it there too. So learn those advocacy skills. Absolutely. Huge, huge. Uh, Stephanie, what would you tell your younger self? Um, that it's okay to, to fail sometimes. I went to a very competitive university and so there was a lot of stress. Um, so the fact that I was struggling at times in things like math or some of the introductory subjects um, was, was put me under a lot of stress. I was also under scholarship as well. Um, but even with that, um, yes, schooling is important, uh, in this case for the goal that I had, but if you are not an A student all the time um, and you make mistakes, it's okay and you can learn a lot from them. 
So that certainly the advocacy definitely is important. I want to second that one too. But I just wanted to add that because I know sometimes some students are um, get very risk averse, even adults can get that way. Um, and it's, it's good to take risk, even though sometimes you may not always get it. Or if you don't quite get it right the first time, you can still learn something and you can try again. Yeah, really good advice. So something that I've, I remember being told a lot growing up <laughs> from multiple people is, uh, you know, you're in a very competitive environment, uh, you know, being in a sighted world. So you, you have to be better in some ways than, than everyone else. And that is stressful, but it's okay to, to fail sometimes. Everybody does. That's how you learn. That's how you grow. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken, what would you tell your younger self? Pride goes before destruction. Um, that's that's a good one. But really, I agree with the, the two that have already been mentioned. Um, it's one of my hard parts, though, is I was uh, I lost my sight, like I said, in the military, and I was very self sufficient. And something I've had to learn, because I mean, I I went right into blindness without you know, weeks of depression or anything like that. But the one thing I was stubborn on and still am is I hate to ask for help. It's something that drives me crazy. But sometimes you have to, and sometimes it will speed up everything you're doing because communication, as we said already, is important. But you may find that you can help others by asking for help. And, um, that's, I guess that's one of my difficulties is being able to ask. So I would, I would go back and kick the stubborn person into asking earlier because I think I would have learned faster. I mean, I've learned a lot, but I think I would have learned faster if I was able to ask for more help uh, at times. So, yeah. Wow. That's a uh, <laughs> really wise advice. Um, all right. Uh, we are, We've still got a few minutes left here. I want to leave just a few minutes here for uh, for questions. So I'll kick it back over to, uh, is it uh, Denise that's managing that? Actually, it is Leanne. And I am Leanne, here. You apologies. have had so many questions. I know we will not get to them. I will pass them off to our question and answer session if we don't get to them. That'll be done on Friday. So if your question doesn't get answered, realize we've got lots of sessions left. We have some questions about an educator wanting to bring a CS to the school. What would you guys recommend as the best program for teaching my students who are blind or visually impaired? I used Code Academy, but it is not the most accessible. I had luck with Quorum, but I am trying to find a program that would work with Python. Maker, Maker Code has the new simulator for Microbit, and it's amazing. And it's accessible. You can slide the, you can slide the things it uses Python, it uses JavaScript. You can switch from Blockly to JavaScript to Python. So it's, it's maker, um, maker Code by Microsoft. And if you search for it, search for Microbit Maker Code. And uh, I, I'm, it's, it's about 90% fully accessible and they are working on it every day. Okay, the next one. Can anyone here give more information or websites about Lego Mindstorm and learning programming. I apologize, I don't know what those are. Uh, I'll, I'll take that one because I used to coach Lego League. Um, so the nice thing is that there are a lot of options. Now, mind you, Lego just came out with a brand new uh, series of robots. So there'll be some probably hiccup in terms of catching up with the new tools, but there are a lot of options in terms of learning to program Lego Mindstorm robots. I mean, the one that comes with it is um, block-based. So, you know, you click and drag and it's definitely not accessible, but you can use pretty much any language you want. It's just sometimes you need to flash the RAM on the brick in order to do that. But a lot of times um, you can use anything from Java to Python to even things like Visual Basic, uh, C++, um, you name it. So. Uh, and I know Quorum also supports at least the uh, the one that has been in, in the case up until this year. I don't know if they have the new one yet, uh, but you, you definitely have a lot of options is uh, just as I would say, if you are brand new, 
to probably go with something like either Quorum, if you have access to it, you know, where it runs on the new uh, series if you want it to, uh, or, or Python, uh, something like Java or C Sharp, it, it takes a little more of a learning curve. Uh, the other thing too is of course with Lego Mindstorms, you have to build the robots. They're not a pre-built uh, uh, set. So with that, there, um, there has been some work done to have some accessible building instructions to get you going. Um, but one of the nice things about them is that um, it's a nice team project. So uh, I have worked with students who are blind to who build robots. And so it definitely is possible. You just wanna lay out your pieces in a way that you can locate them. And that's like half the battle, to be honest. And, and like anything else, um, you might have a little trial and error. Think of it like um, building a little bit as you go. And it's, and it's perfectly okay to have to rebuild parts of your robot because that is part of the process. You're not gonna get it right the first time. Um, you know, Even after you start programming, you might need to rebuild part of your robot because something isn't compatible and that's totally okay. It's important to mention the Make Code Simulator now has an EV3 plugin that, that is also accessible with Python. So this new thing that Microsoft's doing is pretty impressive. Well, we are at our 10 minutes before the hour. So this is our stop time. I would like to thank Steve, Stephanie, Ken, and Juan for participating. There are lots more questions. I will move them forward to the Q&A session. So hopefully you'll have an opportunity to attend. If not, you could always watch the recording. If you are listening for a closing code, this session for ACVREP credits started at 12 with the keynote and ends now. If you are listening for that closing code. Leanne, oh, the closing so code will be at the end of the next panel. Oh, next panel. Okay, thank yes. you. I needed that. <laughs> Thank you so much. And so we have another 10 minute break. We will start at the top of the hour while we move our presenters in the places they need to be. Olaya, I am going to make you host. Thanks, Steve and Stephanie, Juan, Ken. We, we appreciate your participation. And that was a really great panel. Lots of great questions and, and answers. We are going to gather um, questions from the chat and attempt to put together a frequently asked questions list on our resource page at the end of the symposium. So if your question did not get answered, um, if it does not get answered in the Q&A, don't worry, we will get the answers for you and you can find them there after the symposium. Welcome back you guys for our second panel of this morning session. Um, we are excited to uh, have this panel called, entitled, If I Learn to Code, Do I Have to Be a Programmer? Uh, our moderator is Pete Denman, a research scientist with Intel. Joining on this panel is Joseph Hodge, the Global Innovations Product Manager at APH. Also Peter Tusick, the Humanware Brand Ambassador for Blindness Products and Kai Lee, an accessibility analyst for Fable Tech Labs. Uh, Pete, go ahead and take it away. Thank you so much, appreciate it. Thank you everyone for having me here today. And it's nice to meet you guys virtually. Um, I'd like to say right off the bat that the way that I was hoping to deal with these questions today was just to um, kind of give a little anecdote about where I'm at and maybe um, ask the broader question to everyone on the, on the call here and then uh, have you guys answer as you feel. I'm not gonna call on you indi individually unless we kind of break, unless things kind of slow down a little bit. But, um, so I guess we'll just jump right in there. Um, I'd like to start out with a quick like little story about who I am, that way you guys understand that um, I'm a little bit different type of uh, disabled than, than the vision. So I broke my neck. Um, about uh, 30 years ago, actually, when I was 20 years old, I'm 50 now. And uh, um, that left me a quadriplegic. So I, this hand, if you can actually see, I am a, I'm a 50 year old man. Um, I'm wearing a button up shirt um, and a black uh, 
black undershirt in the background. There's a there's a um, Rexel sign from an old um, an old pharmacy that used to be across the street from my house, and I have a white ceiling and blue walls around me. Um, just to give you a little background about um, about who I am, and what it looks like. Uh, so you can actually, if you can see me, I can. I'm holding up my right hand right now, and you can see that I'm rotating my wrist, but I can't actually move my um, fingers or my wrist at all. Um, I can move my elbow and my bicep and my tricep somewhat, just a little bit. Um, and so, um, so I'm I am um, I'm uh, moving my my arm about uh, a little bit here. Um, and um, and basically, so I'm a quadriplegic. I'll give you a little background about um, how I began in, uh, to code and some of the things that took me down my journey. And I'm going to open it up to you guys to see where where you um, happen to be. So when I when I was um, uh, injured for about 20 years, I had a problem in my neck where I was hospitalized for um, for about a month, and they did surgery on my neck that. Um, turned into a, a big problem um, where I couldn't move my arms at all. My my um, my manager at the time told me to stay home and just start thinking about this this interaction problem that I'd been working on for a while. He told me just to put that in the back of your head and start thinking about it. I watched a TED video on on biomimicry and that led me to start thinking about how nature looks at data. That actually um, got me sketching up some ideas because I'm a visual artist. I'm not a programmer. Um, I never thought about programming. I've done a little bit of it in the background, but being in labs, everybody codes. And I couldn't convince anybody of what my idea or how my idea would manifest itself. So I actually used the other people that were around me, everybody that knew how to code in my direct vicinity. I was asking, how do I do this? And how do I put this together? How do I get these things to work? That way I could show my, my designs to the programmers. As soon as I showed my design to the programmers in a, in a um, way that they could understand it in code, they got excited about it. And it turned out to be a tool that we used um, in, a pro in a project. And it is now a de facto um, standard inside of our lab for visualizing data. Um, and I couldn't, have, I couldn't have gotten that point across without learning how to do some rudimentary code. It was terrible. Um, it got thrown away. All the code I did got thrown away, but it actually was a stepping stone to get it to a place where programmers could uh, take it from there and really learn how to do something on their own. Do you guys have examples of how you, how um, being able to do a little bit of code or understanding how other people code, how that actually helped you get your point across better? So Pete, uh, we'll, we'll throw it from Pete to Pete here as uh, we're going to do the, the Peter handoff, if you will. Uh, this is Peter Tusick from Humanware. And, y you know, I, I also am not, uh, I'm not a, not a coder. Um, I, I am totally blind and I've worked with our products for a long time. And, and a lot of what, what I come back to in, in, in my daily work is the user experience side of things. So when I, uh, oftentimes, you know, when, when we're in sort of backroom meetings or we're trying to develop or work through uh, the workflow of a new product or looking at how a product will be best utilized in a, in a certain environment. So maybe in a middle school environment versus a, a college environment or developing a user, you know, a use case. Um, a lot of the times I will ask the coders or programmers or those who are in R&D how they go about what they do um, in terms of, and then building it upon the experience of kind of what, what it is we work with. So when we try to develop a, a product for a braille reader or a, a blind person who is a braille reader, a lot of times we're doing that in a very specific way, a very linear way, or, um, you know, and I, I'll take my own experiences as well and kind of put myself in those shoes, but really trying to bring it back to a sort of uh, using the, the user experience side. So I, I'm, I'm not as versed at all in the programming side of things. I've tried. Um, I certainly have dabbled with some very basic sort of app creation or trying to change layouts of things. But a lot of times um, where I think it does help is to know kind of the, the user experience and what we're going for. So being able to relate to different sectors of, of your users of, or of kind of putting yourself in those other, in, in other, in other folks' shoes, I guess, if you will, um, helps me on a daily basis for sure. Hey, Pete. 
Um, this is Joe Hodge. Um, so I would say for me, <clears throat> before getting the job in global innovations, I was uh, doing quality assurance at APH. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I think the, the where coding sort of helped me or, you know, I'm not a coder either, um, but just having knowledge and how things work with computers. So for me, that started at a, at a really mm -hmm. young age. Um, I think I was like four, I got my first ever Braille and Speak 640. And, you know, I used to uh, actually develop games on it. Uh, they had a program where you could sort of emulate text-based games. And that sort of got me understanding like how a computer works, how, uh, you know, entering commands, you know, gives you a result, um, you know, doing this, does that, you know, if this, then that kind of thing. Um, so that translated into my work with the QA because <clears throat> I was able to help the programmers uh, figure out what they needed to do uh, from an accessibility standpoint to, to make a better user experience, kind of what Peter was saying. So all of it sort of relates. Um, and I think, you know, I'm, I'm kind of really fortunate to have grown up in the time I did. Um, I just missed the DOS days back when I was a kid, uh, but I kind of taught myself the command line. Um, you know, a lot of, uh, no one ever really teaches the command line uh, these days, but <laughs> um, I've kind of taught myself and, you know, I, I don't know, just the speech uh, output um, helped me just try things. So um, you know, I guess all of that sort of helped develop me into being a good QA and that you know, I like to see if I can crash things and, um, you know, see what happens when I do a certain result. So all that kind of helps make things better for the end user. Hey, Pete, uh, this is Kai. Um, yeah, for me, uh, I definitely started out early as well. Um, uh, I'm, I'm also totally blind. Uh, and I started early with technology. Um, I'm a bit younger. So uh, I remember playing with the um, Braille Light Millennium 40s and uh, using a very early copy of JAWS, uh, not super early, but still pretty early, I guess, uh, with 4.5 or so. Um, and I've, um, I, I've grown up experimenting with uh, code and um, looking at how programs worked. Um, of course, uh, taking things apart, breaking things, um, and dabbled in uh, Linux and all sorts of uh, other uh, related areas as well. Uh, and so um, even though I too am not a coder, uh, all of those experiences helped um, develop my technology skills. Uh, and a lot of them are very much uh, transferable. So um, that I think that pretty much helped me start. Uh, and uh, like uh, the other panelists have said, um, when I do QA for Fable, uh, I'm looking not just at the technical standards, but also looking at the user experience and how uh, the technical standards and the design choices that developers make impact that. Nice, thank you so much, guys. Um, sorry, I was going on mute because somehow uh, a beer truck has decided to park underneath my window and um, is making a lot of noise. Um, so um, my next question has to do with empathy and a couple, you guys touch, touched on this just a little bit and I'll give you another example, a little anecdote here. So um, I had the great fortune to work with Professor Stephen Hawking before he was, um, before he passed away just a couple of years ago. And um, and in that process, when I first um, met Stephen, my job was to actually do user um, uh, research with him and find out what his needs were. And one of the very first things I noticed um, was low tech, um, but it really emphasized how somebody with a disability can actually understand other people with disabilities um, a little bit better. Um, so I was in his office and I was watching as his helpers would walk around behind him. And he kept looking over his shoulder, trying to figure out what they were doing or how they were doing it. And the next time I came, um, I brought him a little mirror and popped it on the corner of his desk. 
And it was one of the bigger wins that we had with Stephen because he could now see what was going on behind him. Do you guys have any examples of how your disability has helped inform you to be more empathetic and how you create for other people? All right, I'll, I'll jump in. We'll go. We'll go in this order. We'll try reverse order. Kai, you can, you can, you can uh, rock and roll the next one first. You know, when when it comes through, um, I, I love this question because a lot of times I talk about no tech, low tech, and high tech, and I believe I stole that from somebody along the way. But I really think it illustrates. You know, there are so many ways we can use technology, and there are also so many ways that um, you know we we have to be able to problem solve our way through the use of technology. A lot of times, especially for a, for a Braille user, a blind user, we use our problem solving skills on a daily basis. Um, we know at certain times, you know, when we put something away in a cabinet, um, the, the type of box or can that it's in, we're remembering what that is for future reference. Um, you know, when, when we're looking at something like the, the low tech side, the labeling of household objects or the use of bump dots or um, having a rubber band around the conditioner versus the shampoo. So we're not, we're not just putting conditioner in our hair. Um, those that would be sort of that that low tech side and then you have your high tech of sort of all of these devices that we use and what would be also what I try to understand is that my version of no tech low tech high tech is not a, what everybody else's version is so where I might be benefit from memorizing how many clicks I have to turn my dryer um, to get to a the, the fabric softening setting um, somebody else might need more feedback than myself so you know, it, it, it really does come down to um, trying to to understand other other others needs um, in these spaces, because we're not all going to have that same takeaway from a situation or a scenario that we're placed in. And uh, I think it's really important. And it comes comes down to what, what Kai said in the previous question about, you know, when, when you're able to break something or you're able to kind of look at, at how a design doesn't work, you know, as somebody who codes or programs or builds that they might think it's the greatest piece they've ever put together. But the feedback from those around you, or someone's doing QA like Joe or, or, or somebody's breaking something, you know, I do a lot of this with, with the testing that I do. Um, it's just as important to have that side of it as well in helping somebody who is coding and programming understand sort of what the, uh, you know, what the drawbacks can be or how products can be changed and how we can be empathetic towards multiple users, not just somebody who's a braille reader, but maybe somebody who has low vision or maybe somebody who is deafblind comes into play and makes a product <clears throat> more versatile. So it's kind of my, my understanding of that. And I'm going to throw it over to, to Joe or Kai. Hey, um, before you move on there, Peter, can you uh, give a little bit more um, example of how you interface or talk to your uh, the developers on your team um, to communicate those? Sure. So I am the, the my, my official title is Brand Ambassador of Blindness Products. And, and it's a, a very open sort of uh, job title and an open sort of description. But I, I work very closely with sort of the front facing side of humanware. So I do a lot of product training. I do a lot of uh, demonstrations, a lot of content creation. But at the same time, I am we're, you know, working very closely with the product management side of things to be the eyes and ears of, or the, or the boots on the ground, if you will, um, trying to, because I'm in so many school environments or so I, I encounter so many different types of users, whether it's myself walking into a VA, um, with somebody who is newer to vision loss, who may be in their seventies, uh, or working with a, a college student who is learning how to program or code, right. And having certain needs on a device. Or, or sitting down with a second or third grader who's a new Braille reader. And what, what I do is I take that and I try to catalog that feedback or put it into useful messages and kind of have these weekly or biweekly meetings to help those, the, the product management team, as well as then those in R&D to understand what I'm hearing in the field, um, what I'm hearing users needing, or really just as, as sort of, you know, what are the needs of our of our users and, and blind people in general when it comes to braille and, and sort of blindness technology so i try to catalog that and it, it comes down to a lot of kind of what joe said um, being able to uh, be a, have that good qa or have that good communication from the front like the front of the house if you will to that that sort of back room side where things are actually being developed is super super important and so i do communicate on a daily certainly a weekly but if not daily basis with with our product managers and then also um, from time to time directly with the teams themselves who are developing the products thanks so much 
And Joe, uh, Kai, are, are, do you guys have any um, additions on how you might use empathy? Yeah, um, I, I definitely appreciate this question because um, as uh, Pete said, there are so many different use cases, uh, many different people with uh, different needs and skills. And so um, it's, it's important to remember that how I do things is not how somebody else does them. And um, that it's important as uh, a professional to really expand your understanding outside perhaps of your own disability community and um, connect with uh, people with other disabilities, whether that's through Facebook groups or uh, uh, Twitter or other methods and really um, ask questions and uh, learn about how they do things. And I think you'll be surprised at the many different uh, innovations and both low-tech and high-tech solutions that people employ. Um, because uh, for me, I, I would say I definitely find um, low-tech solutions to be equally as important uh, when I'm doing my work or when I'm trying to problem solve uh, because a lot of us, um, perhaps know a lot about technology, but uh, when it comes to finding solutions, high tech solutions aren't always necessarily the best. So, you know, going back to Pete's uh, solution for labeling things or even using an uh, inaccessible piece of tech and counting uh, clicks on a knob or whatever, uh, those are still very valuable tools in, in our toolbox to um, use. Uh, and so, uh, an example of this is uh, 3D printing. I've recently gotten into 3D printing and uh, many of the tools uh, in that area aren't very accessible. And so I have to use both um, low tech and high tech tools, uh, high tech in terms of looking at the different programs and uh, ways of adapting them to be more accessible uh, and low tech in, in terms of using the 3D printer. And uh, so the one that I have, um, I memorize menus, count knobs, uh, listen to the uh, little uh, beeps that it provides, uh, and take all this in to figure out a solution. That, uh, that's a really great point. Um, I want to cut, circle back to that as soon as we hear from Joe, because I have a couple of uh, couple responses. But Joe, take it away. Yeah, so I'm going to come at this just kind of finishing off here. <clears throat> um, you know, yesterday, I've had to go to the doctor a bit more than I'd like recently. And, um, you know, it's it's interesting. Um, I'm a pretty high tech guy, I would say more often than not. Um, but, you know, one of the problems with high tech is what if you don't have an internet connection, for example, a lot of things you need the internet for. Um, and so I was in a hospital yesterday where my cell signal was blocked, the Wi-Fi sucked <laughs> and it really took me back. And, and so it's really good to have those toolboxes, uh, you, you know, everything in your toolbox. So I had to count doors and unfortunately there wasn't labels, uh, you know, in Braille. So I couldn't tell what room was what. And a lot of it is just going back to just sort of O&M 101, you know, and, and doing certain things. So, um, it's it's uh it's always a interesting thing. I think there's a spot for everything, and and kind of like what Kai was saying, not everybody learns the same way. Um, so I used to kind of choose a screen reader, for example, and what I found in my job is that it may take two or three screen readers to do certain tasks, and and it's okay. Like you know, I can still love one screen reader, but use the other ones as tools to complete my job. Um, so. Um, you know, as far as, as far as low tech in my house, I, I use bump dots a lot to, uh, label, um, touch screens, uh, things that, you know, dishwashers, um, you know, things that just aren't accessible at this point. Um, but, um, you, you just never know when you're going to not have that high tech item to, to complete your task just due to network connections or whatever. So it's always important to kind of have that solid you know, base um, to get things done. Right. Well, that I, that's another really great lead into um, what we what we were just talking about. Kaylee was just talking about the three D printing, um, and so I wanted to ask you guys uh, about um, about how you create solution, or let me put it a different way. There, um, the only consistent thing between any two can 
um, disabilities is that they're inconsistent. You're never going to find two people who have the same amount of abilities and approach problems in the same exact way. When I was first injured, we had a we had this little guy who sat in a closet uh, at Rio, a Rehabilitation Institute of Oregon. I'm from Oregon, and um, and he would build out custom solutions for. But he. Pete, this is Adrian. If you can hear me, you are cutting out a little bit. Um, yeah. um, um, uh, I think it's really powerful. This new generation of people who are who are coming up with ideas um, and then just com custom creating that solution. The maker field is huge out there right now. Um, you can you can have Arduinos and a 3D printer and come up with a, a um, either a low tech or a super high tech solution. Um, do you guys have examples of how you've put together a 3D um, print or come up with some other sort of... Um, Alexa, what is 60%? Uh, Sorry, I didn't catch that. Somebody was asking my Alexa about 60%, so um, it didn't understand the full question. Um, do, you guys have, um, do you guys have any examples of, um, of how you've used custom solutions to solve your everyday problems? Sure, I'll uh, jump in again, um, since we were on the topic of 3D printing a bit. Um, for me, uh, anytime I look at anything new uh, that hasn't really been uh, played around with uh, in the community in terms of uh, just lots of uh, shared knowledge, um, I look at the current tools, I, I try them, uh, I make notes perhaps, um, and look at other areas uh, and, and other solutions that have uh, worked. So for example, with um, making the 3D printer accessible, uh, the model that I have uh, allows you to memorize um, the menus uh, because none of them wrap and uh, there's a click knob. It also beeps every time you hit the top or the bottom of the menu uh, and when you land on an, a menu option. But you know, being able to memorize all that uh, is not the ideal way um, because you're uh, having to spend a lot of time memorizing rather than trying to figure out what whatever else is going on. Um, and in the 3D process is uh, somewhat complicated. Um, lots of variables that can make your print uh, break and uh, not work. Um, and so one of the solutions that I came up with is uh, writing a menu guide. And I took this inspiration from uh, others in the community who've tried to make video games accessible, uh, where the game was playable, but uh, the menus themselves weren't accessible. And so they came up with this way of writing uh, a list of menus and uh, the structure and um, which buttons to press. And so I, I took that idea and uh, I've been applying it to uh, 3D printing and uh, writing up documentation and hopefully uh, this will uh, be shared and um, others will be able to either use the same model or uh, take from it what they will and uh, hopefully expand our knowledge into an area that hasn't really been explored as much. So I, I love I love what what Kai's saying, and I it makes me think of a couple pieces here, and they're not directly related to 3D printing, but more so to as something I touched on earlier, and something I will absolutely touch on this afternoon, uh, the afternoon session. I'll I'll be doing a keynote and talking a lot about problem solving, and you know that this makes me always come back to being being a kid, um, and in the late 90s there was no internet, there was no YouTube, right? I wanted to play video games. I was really into it, but I was totally blind. And I had a Nintendo 64 and just getting into that space of memorizing menus, right? So I could play hockey. Um, being able to problem solve something, even being outside in the neighborhood and saying, I want to play with my friends. Um, instead of using a rubber ball for street hockey, we're going to crush a can so that I can play. You know, those sorts of pieces, all of that problem solving. Um, yes, it's, it's definitely 
going to differ from from place to place or situation to situation. But I think a lot of that um, ingenuity, right, being able to problem solve and, and create solutions for ourselves to problems that maybe may be unique to us is really important. From the 3D printing side, uh, I am not, I do not have a 3D printer, but I have a lot of friends who are very into it. And I have one friend in particular who tries very hard to get me into Dungeons and Dragons and to play different sorts of games and things like that. And he's found in, in the Thingiverse uh, being, you know, having 30 sided Braille uh, die and things and being able to 3D print things out with Braille or with tactile markings on them that are designed by others. So. I love what Kai's saying, you know, putting putting these menus out there, putting out um, pieces that cer certain community members or somebody else builds or discovers um, so that we can all share these resources. And that's become such a neat part of where we've gotten to in 2021, having YouTube at our disposal or having the ability to share ideas across a user group or across the Facebook group. Um, and, and Joe touched on this too, but I think that's, it's, it's been awesome to see and it's been a huge resource for all of us as we look for solutions um, to maybe problems of interacting with games or maybe something as simple as um, trying to you know find a better way to uh, identify where our house is in the middle of the block or whatever it may be right just uh, being able to share ideas and, and have those forums is really important yeah i don't have a 3d printer either but um ken perry actually is really into 3d printing and um one of the things like he showed me was a military plane. You know, I've never seen one before, uh, never gotten a chance to, you know, go on one or be around one. Uh, and he had one and, and showed me, you know, he, he had it 3D printed and I was able to feel the cabin, the wings, the, you know, just sort of the layout of it. It was, it was really cool. And then and last year, well, actually two years ago, COVID, you know, basically took a year away. <laughs> uh, but two years ago, I went to uh, Perkins School for the Blind and uh, did a tour. And one of the coolest things I had seen was they had tons of 3D models of um, just the human cells and, and different things. And it was really cool from a standpoint of how these kids are getting to see things that, you know, I never got to see growing up and, and just the power that could give a young kid that that's uh, cool blind truth. today. Um, so uh, it, it was really neat. And I think, as Peter said, I, I really hope we can get to a point where we can actually, you know, you know, for teachers of visually impaired, they can have a sort of a catalog they could choose from and get things quickly, you know, so they could use that in schools with their students. Um, so it's not just something, you know, in a few places that a select few have to choose from. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I think 3D printing is is really opened up a lot of opportunities to people. I have one sitting off to my right right here. And um, and I'm working with um, Printing House for the Blind actually right now and uh, the Olympic Committee and Intel. And we're creating solutions for, um, for blind people at the next um, Paralympic Games. And one of the things that we've done so far, we've created uh, phone cases and embedded haptics into them so we could uh, we could do obstacle avoidance. And then just recently, um, I 3D printed out a um, a map, a topographic map that has embedded into it um, resistive filament um, so that if somebody touches it, it will begin to speak where the person ad is or what they're touching on the map. So when they're touching a building, it tells them what building they're touching. So those kind of things are really are really cool. But if you guys can see some of you that have vision, you can see I have a stick that's um, uh, that's poking out my glove. Now I made this before three D printers were um, readily available for most people. It's just a piece of brass that I bent that I tie that I then taped a um, um, uh, stylus onto. That allows me to interface with the a Wacom tablet that's right in front of me right here. Um, and that's a super low tech, easy solution to use technology right there. And it didn't exist and doesn't exist for people with disabilities. So on a regular basis, I'm, you know, explaining or teaching people how to use these things. Have you guys had any opportunities to um, use your, your uh, skills for, for good and to help people out? Um, just like on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's more inspirational just to get their juices flowing because you don't need to be a 3D printer. You don't need to spend $1,000 to get the 3D printer. You can just use a piece of brass, a piece of tape and, and get yourself started. And that's 
like the entry or the gateway drug, you know, because I feel like it's intoxicating. As soon as you've solved the problem for yourself and, um, and move, move that ball forward, it's really exciting. Um, do you have any examples of that? So I, I love this question, Pete, because uh, I worked um, for, for in high school and in college. I worked with a couple of young kids who were totally blind, and I worked as a mentor for them. So on a weekly basis, we would get together and do everything from cooking and cleaning to playing music or socializing or just working on lots of different skills. And a lot of what I would do is we would we would think of common things that maybe that kiddo because uh, these these kids were blind from birth like myself had never seen before so think of something like a baseball diamond um, and what that means when somebody says a fly ball is hit to right field what in the world does that mean and so i would take a post-it note and make that our square baseball diamond and we would have the pitcher's mound in the middle with a marble and we would have this is where the catcher is and this is where first base is and this is right field and this is center field wall and all these things the point being that once I did that, and this is way before 3D printing, and I'll, I'll segue to that in a second because I think this ties in perfectly to it, but we're able to visualize some of those things we've never seen in our lives. So being able to visualize a racetrack or being able to visualize a baseball stadium or, or being able to visualize um, when, you know, a, a, some sort of landforms, right? A, an isthmus versus a, a peninsula versus, you know, a plateau. All of these things that we, and I say we, I'm not included, but that are taken for granted by somebody who can see because you kind of have that visualization piece there. One of the neatest things today is 3D printing gives us the ability to visualize almost anything. Um, I, I've seen, in the, and this goes back to what Joe said as well, but in the last couple of years, a lot of really neat 3D printouts of buildings in the Chicago, uh, that, that make up the Chicago skyline. And I live in the city. I'm born and raised in Chicago. I, I love Chicago like no other. But there are so many pieces that I just don't know anything about. The Sears Tower, for instance, what makes that so unique? How is that so identifiable? Um, you know, the loop as a whole, there are train tracks that run in circles and the outer loop and the inner loop and all these highways and how things come together. So I, I think that pre 3D printing or, or even at the most basic level, it's very important a lot of times to help our blind kids visualize pieces that they may have never seen. And it could be something as simple as uh, a bumblebee um, or realizing that, you know, what is a squirrel? I mean, or, or just where do we live? And, and I'll talk about this later too, but what is a picket fence? What is some of these things, again, that, that we want to be exposing um, our blind kids to who have never seen these things? And that will help their brains start to equate or make this relevant in everyday conversations with sighted peers or just in general help with the curiosity in understanding and uh, how they're relating to the world around them. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Um, Joe or sort of picking backing off of that thought process of, you know, kids just not understanding what something looks like. I'll, I'll never forget going to one of my first ever NFB conventions and they had a sort of a animal exhibit where you could go, you know, feel what a bird felt like, or it, you know, they had sculptures. So, um, you know, growing up on a farm, I just kind of knew what a goat felt like, you know, we had them, uh, I knew what a pig felt like. So I was, I was fortunate in that regard, but so many, you know, being around a situation where so many people had no idea what something was, was kind of new to me. Um, you know, when I was hearing something, I didn't know a goat looked like that, <laughs> you know, it's kind of a uh, unique, but, uh, you know, kind of an inter interesting perspective to sort of take in and, and, you know, realize that, you know, if someone doesn't grow up with the same, you know, it's something we have to think about, like, we're all growing up in a different situation, um, you know, accessibility in general, like, you know, you can say something's accessible, uh, what does that mean? You know, does it, it may pass the guidelines, it, it may be quote unquote accessible, but what's the usability for each person? So, I mean, ultimately, um, I, I just, I, I, I kind of uh, really find 3D printing uh, important in just being able to, to visualize something that people have never seen. And it's going to be cool to see where that goes as as like Kai, you know, has one at home. <laughs> uh, so to kind of see where that that technology goes in the next decade is going to be amazing. I, you know, it'd be be cool. Yeah, I I just uh, love this topic because um, 
one of my passions uh, um, besides uh, testing accessibility for websites and apps is uh, tactile literacy, tactile graphics, um, because um, there, there's definitely many different things that are difficult to understand without uh, getting access to it as a tactile model or a tactile graphic because of its spatial information. Um, and with uh, 3D printing, um, it, it really offers an easy way to uh, understand that. Um, and also um, just going back to uh, uh, solutions that um, some of us are familiar with, with tactile graphics, um, it's a really good tool to learn how to depict uh, 2D tactile graphics using 3D models. Um, and, and so uh, I think 3D printing is definitely exciting uh, in terms of uh, accessing information, uh, but also as uh, wonderful learning tools. Um, and on the other side of things, uh, it's also important to think about us as designers, um, whether that's uh, uh, more traditional coders making programs, um, or uh, those, of, those of us who might not be coders, but uh, are familiar with a lot of the concepts and technology, um, that, that really is something that unfortunately hasn't been highlighted uh, in many discussions when uh, we were talking about tactile graphics or 3D models. Um, th the general discussion really is on uh, consuming uh, those materials, um, but it's important to think about uh, the creation of them. And in terms of 3D printing, um, using OpenNest SCAD uh, is a really wonderful tool that allows you to um, create simple models and uh, to be able to share them with other people. Um, so I think uh, keeping that in mind, whether you're uh, making something with code or even just uh, drawing things out uh, on a raised line kit and then taking a picture, you know, uh, we're, we're all creators as well. Absolutely. I just discovered something interesting here. Um, there's a whole chat section. People are asking questions. I just opened it up. Um, we've got a couple of questions here about what kind of um, software do you use, um, uh, Kai, for doing uh, 3D modeling? I think there that's kind of a double um, question because there's the type that you use on the on the 3D printer, and I use Kira, and I use um, I use Rhino to create stuff. But what what software do you use? Yeah, so. Um, if I want to start from scratch and create a model, I use open SCAD, uh, but, um, mostly I tend to pull models from the web and then slice them, uh, using, um, using the Prusa slicer. So I have a, uh, Prusa 3d printer as well. Um, and, uh, for those who aren't familiar with 3d printing, slicing is basically taking, uh, a digital model, uh, and, uh, literally uh, dividing that into layers uh, so that when it gets reproduced physically, um, it'll be able to uh, be recreated uh, because a 3D printer works in a way where uh, there's a nozzle that um, uh, pulls in this plastic filament, melts it, and then like a glue gun, it uh, moves forward, back, left, and right, and then uh, builds upon layer upon layer of um, uh, of what's in written digitally uh, to recreate the physical model. Right. And then uh, we've got another one here that says, how can blind people uh, that are completely blind use 3D printing if they can't um, if they can't see it? I'm curious about that myself. I mean, every once in a while I look over and I'm like, oh my gosh, hot mess. Um, yeah. And then I can stop it. Um, but then again, I now that I say that, sometimes I'm in the other room and I'm, I can hear it. I'm like, oh crap, I've got to turn that off now. Yeah, uh, I've, I've definitely had my fill of uh, plastic spaghetti, uh, which uh, is a very good tactile indication that something's failed. Um, but there are many uh, audio cues that you can hear from your printer, whether that's scratching or uh, uh, a high-pitched whining, you know, uh, little cues that you learn over time. Um, so uh, that along with um, 
feeling comfortable in, in, in touching uh, the model as it's being printed. So that means uh, keeping track of where the uh, print head is, uh, which is usually a little bit, well, it's, it's quite hot. Uh, so keeping track of where that is and then putting your hand on the rest of the model uh, that isn't being worked on. Uh, so that's a good indication to uh, tell if, say, the um, model is sticking and uh, that type of stuff. So many different, uh, you know, going back to low-tech solutions, uh, those are some of the ways that I use. We got another question here that's asking about what kind of printer you use, and it seems like you're using the de facto standard um, <laughs> that's out there, which is the Prusa. Um, that one has the most available filaments. Um, it's bulletproof in that it um, is really reliable and easy to put together. There's a huge community for it. And I would recommend that for almost any brand new user. And it's mm -hmm. fairly inexpensive. It's not the cheapest one, but it, but you definitely get your money's worth out of it. Um, do you have any suggestions? Yeah, so um, definitely different models. Uh, so uh, something like all 3DP uh, is, is a good resource to look at the different reviews, um, but definitely um, the uh, Prusa printers are great, especially um, because they have a, a very basic accessibility mode that adds those little beeps, uh, which um, allow you to know when the menu uh, starts and ends and when you land on a different option. So even a small change like that uh, makes a huge difference. And so, uh, you know, we've, we've been talking about usability. Uh, and so that's uh, very much um, a usability design. from APH yeah. uh, and I see that there's a question a little further back that's really interesting too if you want um, if you have time or if you have like, other questions uh, I apologize for interrupting yeah, yeah. What, what question are you referring to why don't you uh, it says um, what are the first steps to get into user experience I'm not a coder but studying assistive technologies, and I'm interested in user experience. That's a good question, but I'll actually, I'll, I'll actually kind of kick the answer off there, but I think uh, uh, Peter might actually have quite a bit to say on the subject as well. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, yeah, go for it. Sure thing, Peter. You know, it is a, it is a great question, and uh, <laughs> if you come to my uh, talk this afternoon, you'll hear that I, I never intended fully um, to be in this sort of space. And I, I cannot tell you how much I enjoy and love what I do. But a lot of times what it comes down to, you know, in, in that interest is, is really about whom and how you interact with users of various pieces of technology. Because as Pete said, and he's spot on, I could talk to my, I have a cousin who is quadriplegic in, um, in Linz, Austria. And I could ask Pete and my cousin and many other people I know who are wheelchair users and have all different levels of mobility, 20 questions and probably come up with 18 different answers to those 20 questions. Um, and, and, I tr and then you look for solutions and you try to ask, would these solutions be feasible and try to then help at least a large cross section of a user base um, find what your approach is to be acceptable and then to give you even you know, ways to improve on that. So that is a very long winded way of saying user experience it comes down to talking to users interacting with users thinking outside the box and running those ideas by users i think a lot of times in our community and, and, and that is blind blindness as well as any disability we have a lot of uh, talk about some solution to a problem that doesn't exist um, this happens a lot with with certainly with blind with blind people you know i'm always shown a product that's going to change my life for the better and i'll think well i, I don't need that change to occur um, and so that person maybe has a lot of work to do in user experience or really in identifying sort of the, the, the issues or the problems. But I think it does come down to networking and interacting with users of, of, of the, the, you know, the types of products you're trying to develop and, and determining what the needs really are because the needs will differ, they will vary and you will not find one broad need usually, well, you may and that, that's great because then you can easily solve a problem with one device. But I think it really does come down to just being able to talk to a network with a very, very wide variety of users of the product you're trying to work with. I would actually, I, that's a great um, synopsis there. Thank you. 
Uh, I would also add that um, uh, being somebody who, I'm actually a senior research um, uh, researcher at Intel, um, UX researcher. And one of the things that I, I tell people, and I'm currently reading through a stack of, of job applications for interns right now. I spent way too many hours reading through those last night because we're hiring somebody. But as I'm reading through this, all of these people are brilliant and they're, and they've gone to school for UX. And I'm, and as I'm reading through that, I kind of track, trace back my journey. And I would never, I would never tell anybody to do it the way I did it. I went to a state school. I got a, a visual arts degree and now I'm a senior researcher in a, in a tech lab. I don't know how I got here, honestly. Um, but um, one of the things I have noticed is that design and, um, and any kind of engineering, that alchemy turns into something magical. If you've got somebody who's got both the hard science and a soft, um, uh, a soft artistic background, those two things are hard to beat. You can't, um, you can't kind of develop a career path or develop a career that doesn't have those two things involved in it in some place in today's work environment. You need to have that empathetic background, but you also need to know how to translate it and talk to people that have, uh, have um, more technical backgrounds as well. I think it's easier to say, I want to be an engineer and go out and get a mechanical engineering degree. But since I've been in a wheelchair, um, the, the ball has moved down the, down the court. It used to, it started out with, um, with um, um, architecture back in the 80s when that was the de facto artistic realm for people to use that. And then it moved on to, um, it moved on to graphic design, which then that's where I got my degree because that seemed to be really, and then it moved to industrial design and then, and then um, user interface design. And now it's, and now it's like a lot of people talking about UX design. But the thing is, it's all design. It's all empathetic translation of pure people's needs into, into products and technologies. And so um, I think that having those two things together is really important. Um, all right, everybody. Welcome to the 2021 National Coding Symposium. My name is Adrian Amandi. I'm the director of the California Education Resource Center at the California School for the Blind. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to introduce our next speaker, Peter Tusik, brand ambassador of blindness products for humanware. Peter travels throughout the United States and Canada, supporting teachers and students, as well as presenting throughout the nation. Peter is the primary connection between humanware and the public to ensure that the needs and voices of students, teachers, and blind adults are heard and considered in the development of new devices, such as the BrailleNote Touch Plus, the new Brilliant BI connected Braille displays, and more. Peter gets to be on the cutting edge of technology development in our field while also being grounded with a connection to its users. Peter's education and experience helped him get to this position, but most important is his attitude. When I mentioned to Peter that I had a really cool project that I was working on and wondered if he would be interested in helping, his response before I even got a chance to tell him what it was about was, dude, I'm always down. Just let me know what you need. That's the can-do attitude that helps Peter succeed and lead. It's now my great pleasure to introduce my friend and our next speaker, Peter Tusik. Thank you so much, Adrian, and thanks to everybody uh, for, for being here. And I absolutely, I'm always, uh, when Adrian sends me a note, it might be rather late or rather early, uh, or just could be at a random time, and I'll just say, hey, let's rock and roll. So I'm really glad to be here, and uh, I'm, I'm grateful to see so many people in the attendees list. So it's it means a lot that you're all here and want to learn more about um, and have an interest in coding and programming. And you know, when, when Adrian asked me to contribute, I don't bring that traditional sort of programming and coding sense um, you know, of, of the word into play as I'm not a programmer, but I do work very closely with both the back end as well as kind of the front end of, of, of what we do here at Humanware. Um, and I'll be telling you a little bit about myself and how I got to where I am and really just helping kind of dissect how it is that I got to where I am and also understanding and helping to build that bridge between it, it doesn't have to be necessarily a coding career. 
um, to put you into technology and into the, really the cutting edge or the development side of working with and creating various types of products. So I'll, I'll try to spend a little bit of time on that. I know we're getting a teeny bit of a late start, so I'll certainly try to cut myself off um, and leave time for a question or two if there is one, and then we'll segue over to our friend Dean. Uh, but for those of you who are not familiar with me, I'm from Chicago, and I am totally blind. I have been with Humanware for the last five and a half years, going on six years pretty soon, which is pretty wild to me. Um, I cannot tell you how much I enjoy what I do as the brand ambassador of blindness products. So I primarily work and kind of travel from place to place prior to 2020, working with teachers of the visually impaired, working in classrooms, working with end users. So maybe someone who is newer to vision loss, um, somebody in a VA or a different setting. A lot of users, we do lots of convention work um, with the various blindness organizations here in the United States. And, and I also do a lot of, of global sort of presentations and pieces. But the other side of my job, and one, one of the neatest things that I get to do is work with our development team and also with our product management team on the blindness products. So here at Humanware, we have Braille products as well as the Victor Reader line of products. And I work a lot kind of bringing forward feedback um, and what I'm hearing and also just what I gather as a user myself of these products to help uh, broaden what we're able to offer all of our users out there. And, you know, when I tell my story and I talk about this a lot, and sometimes I'll talk to parent groups or, or other, or, you know, sort of speeches that are outside of humanware and how to use a product, because I do create a lot of content and videos and things. But a lot of what I do when I talk to users or I talk to students, especially, is really try to come back to three main points. The first being problem solving. The second and kind of more important piece is organization. And the third is exposure or being open to trying new things and learning how somebody else uses a device that you might be very comfortable with. And in doing that, that really also comes back to communication skills. So I'll try to touch on that for a few minutes um, before, before I kind of wrap it up here today. When I was growing up, I, I'm totally blind and I always was very curious and fascinated by technology, but I was not somebody who was on that sort of cutting edge. I wasn't taking apart computers or kind of going down that road. And when, what I found more fascinating was how somebody learns how to use a device. How I learn how to use a device meant a lot, right? What, I am somebody who is very uh, focused on kind of solving a problem. Uh, my, my wife and <laughs> a lot of people know that when I'm stuck on a problem, I will not stop until I figured it out. And at times, especially back before we had built-in screen readers on products like iPhones or now TVs and all these things, I used to memorize menus so I could help troubleshoot for my mom or somebody who was sighted in my household um, how to change the source on the TV or how to quickly switch over you know, um, and, and get to different menus or different guides and inaccessible recording software. Um, I, I always kind of found myself not giving up until something was was solved and what that what that kind of got me to is as i moved forward and as i started to work and get into high school i started to mentor younger children and and users kind of in my area who were blind and teaching them how to do various uh, projects and how to work with various pieces of technology so the first thing and the first piece of this is the problem solving side of it regardless of what it is what side or what path you want to take into moving into technology or being employed in any way, problem solving is going to be something you'll inter interact with or encounter on a daily basis that will really help you to succeed, right? The more we're able to think outside the box, and it could be, gosh, I don't have access to this PowerPoint presentation that my peers are using, or wow, I really should learn how to format this document in a professional way. Um, those sorts of things, right? Taking that first step is always going to be that 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 kind of game changer that'll help get you to the point where you're able to start to outwardly communicate in different ways and move it, move yourself forward. So I come back to problem solving because on a daily basis, I'm doing this in my job. Um, I certainly had to do it a lot in college and I definitely wasn't ready for that jump, which I'll touch on. Uh, but being able to problem solve is something I, I come back to all the time. One of the biggest pieces of that that I had to work on was my organization skills. So a lot of times um, when, when we think about what, what it is we want to do, we often want to kind of jump to that end point or, or think, I want to have this great job and I know what I want to do, but 
kind of not thinking about the various steps that are going to get us to that level. And so in high school, and especially when I went into college, I realized that I really had to get better at time management and working with others in, in that sort of organized time management kind of way. I was not the greatest at it. And so I worked in various call centers and I was able to learn how to multitask and really, you know, reading prompts and scripts. I was scheduling appointments. I was working with um, doing surveys and kind of calling prospective patients at various clinics. And it had nothing to do with where I wanted to end up. I knew I wanted to work in sort of a teaching or training sort of field. Um, I was a history major, so I had that. I, I was very interested in the past and kind of learning about history and facts and all these things. But I, I really had to learn how to multitask and work with others and listen to feedback, listen to those around me in learning that my way was not the only way of doing things. And so one of the things when I, when I started working and when I'm coming back to it, this is any opportunities that you have. So if it's something as simple as getting involved with Key Club or being a part of various groups in your high school, so maybe some sort of after school programs, I was in band, um, having experiences that are outside of your comfort zone are going to go a long way as well in really getting you to that next level. So never passing up those pieces and those opportunities that might not be something you, you think of as, as helping you get to that end result or that end goal of that ultimate dream job you, you wanna have. And it's very cliche because a lot of people say that, but I think what I learned and I didn't realize it at the time was my ability to manage my time better helped tremendously with me being organized and organizing my thoughts. So organizing the way that I wanted or that I was able to kind of put myself out there and get to that next level. So working with a lot of sighted peers, um, working with a fast paced work environment, that was not something I'd planned on doing, helped me tremendously because it opened the door to training and presenting at a big level, a, a sort of a, a way, a far bigger level than anything I had ever done. But it also, at the end of the day, I wanted to be involved with content creation or with, you know, with, with helping develop products, but I didn't have any experience in that realm. So I knew that the, one of the pieces in the way I, I tried to get there and eventually did land in that sort of space was to use my ability to train and to communicate with others as a means to say, well, I've listened to many people and I've observed many, you know, needs and, and many folks needs over time. And this is what I think we need to do. And so I, I didn't take that approach of going to school for a programming or coding sort of degree, if you will, uh, because it, it wasn't my style, but that doesn't mean in any way that it, it wasn't or there isn't some alternative way to get into this field of technology. For, for those of you who are out there who want to go into the field of coding and programming, and there are tons and tons of opportunities there, and we hear about this on a daily, weekly, monthly basis, and I was just reading an article, I believe it was in the Wall Street Journal or Associated Press last week about how there are so many unfilled positions at the very top um, sort of pay grades at a lot of these, a lot of many mainstream companies for people who are programmers or coders. And one of the pieces as someone who is blind that is, is another struggle is the whole math and science side of things. And so a lot of what we, we will need to focus on, if that is something that we want to kind of jump into, is having a way or developing and problem solving of ways to to interact with and participate in those kinds of curriculums and it sounds easy right it's easier said than done and i know that because i work in a lot of schools and a lot of places where coding and, and programming is not as accessible or as doable as it can be but it's definitely something that when we hear from blind programmers and you have already heard from a couple today you will certainly hear from more throughout this week They'll talk a lot about how they were able to problem solve and invent ways of making their curriculum or their school and, and communications with their professors ways that they were able to advocate and problem solve and ways that they were able to communicate and succeed in those sort of mainstream programs. And so a lot of times, even though I'm not in that same field, that problem solving and that ability to express myself, right, and say, well, I can't do it the same way everyone else is doing this. However, I know the same concepts or I, I have the same understanding. Can we develop sort of a, an ad, adaptation or something to get me to that level? And then finding ways not only to, to utilize those adaptations or to make something work, but also finding a way to, to really clearly communicate 
with your instructors is going to help tremendously and it will help them want to work with you. And that's also really important because a lot of times when it comes down to advocacy um, and, and when we advocate for something we want or something that might be a struggle, um, you know, we, we, we oftentimes want to remember that we need, we need to try where possible to do it in the most respectful way we can. Because if we explain ourselves to others, and I know there, there's always kind of a time where things get really frustrating where we have to take that next step. But a lot of times when we're communicating in a positive way and we're trying to problem solve and we're coming to the table with solutions to a problem that we might have, the people that we're trying to work with will be much more willing to work with us. And again, it, the, the cliches abound. Um, I, I definitely know that. But I took a class in college. The only coding, most basic sort of coding and programming experience I have was I took a symbolic logic class. And this class is basically a way to break down the English language into visual representations, which is very hard for somebody who is totally blind. And it deals with truth tables and sort of, you know, you're, you're working with if this, then that. Um, or if, or and, and or, and trying to symbolize the English language and, and break things down. And that class was something I had very, very little experience with, and I definitely was very confused by and had no real way of understanding how this stuff worked. But I was able to get creative, and I found a tutor who was willing to, to work with me, who was somebody who had gone to the university prior to myself, but who was still involved in the network. But we came up with a unique way and almost it was the precursor to the math window but we were able to develop a way to work with my professor on an alternative means of answering questions and really putting magnets down with these various symbols so that I could demonstrate that I knew what this symbolic logic sort of what, what these pieces were as we went through the course syllabus and the example is there not in that I'm you know glad I took symbolic logic because it was a very difficult sort of class but it was something that is that type of ambition or that type of kind of problem solving comes into play on a daily basis in the work that I do, even when we're looking at new features to a product um, or, or whatever it may be, trying to think outside the box um, to really get ourselves and, and wrap our head around something that isn't as comfortable or familiar for us as users, as blind people, but work with our sighted sort of peers and our individuals around us to, to get that stuff um, seamlessly kind of to, to help us succeed. So I know, you know, that, that this is moving fast, and I know it's 319 already at this point, central time. Yeah, I mean. But I, I wanted to sort of uh, thank Adrian and everybody again for letting me talk. Yeah, and really, sorry for the oh, Someone was unmuted. Um, but for the opportunity to be here and really to, to take any questions, because I know that this has gone by very, very quickly, and i sorry about the, the late start, but I definitely want to keep us on agenda. Thank you, Peter. That was excellent. Um, we did. Uh, we had a question. We had a couple of people comment about organization being a key challenge. We had one quick question about working at a call center and how can people get involved in working at a call center? That's a, a great question. And a lot of uh, where I started in a lot of your local areas, regardless of where you are, generally, so there are the, the National Industries of the Blind have a lot of call center opportunities and a lot of local lighthouse for the blind organizations have these opportunities as well. I'm in Chicago, so the Chicago Lighthouse has it. I know many other lighthouses around the country do have call center contracts. Also with today's remote environment, there is a lot more opportunity even than there was a year or two ago to take these positions remotely um, and work and, and you know, think of just applying to any call center positions because they will have a lot of systems that will allow for remote access at this point in time. So it's not just something you have to go through a lighthouse for, but the lighthouse certainly is a great place to start because they do have so many locations. Thank you, Peter. Peter, that was fantastic. Thank you for the inspiration. We do have our next presenter here. Dean, while Dean is figuring out his mm -hmm. camera, I will uh, go ahead and introduce him. Um, Dean Hudson is the Accessibility Technical Evangelist at Apple. Um, in his role, Dean works as, with engineering and design teams to raise awareness of Apple's accessibility work and, influence, and, and to influence product direction. Uh, he joined the Apple team in 2006. He's been directly involved in the development of some of the most innovative accessibility features in the industry. 
This includes Apple's groundbreaking voiceover screen reader technology for people who are blind or low vision, the first accessible smart wearable, the Apple Watch, and other initiatives across the entire Apple ecosystem that support a culture of inclusion. To my kids at my home, Dean is the voice of the amazing blind engineer on the interactive exhibit at the Exploratorium. Dean, we are thrilled to have you here. Welcome and thank you for participating. The floor is yours. All right, I don't know if you guys can hear me or not. We, we can hear you. Yes, well. we can. Perfect. All right, and video's working all good? All's good. All right. All right, yes, I am Dean and uh, wanted to give you a little bit of uh, talk about software engineering and sort of uh, related um, uh, uh, careers and then sort of the advantages of programming. But first a little background, um, that's really cool. You sought out that exploratorium piece that was done uh, probably 10, 15 years ago. Um, I was definitely a younger man then. So um, I was fortunate uh, when I was coming up as a teenager, a lot of household didn't have uh, PCs. They just weren't that common. Um, fortunately, my dad did purchase one and I really got excited about just being able to use this new thing, this, this thing called a computer. I mean, I've heard about mainframe computers and but to have this thing on my desk. Um, now I did have some vision, but not very much. Um, so I could see the screen if I got really close, uh, like very close to the screen. But as far as manuals and, and uh, learning how to code, there wasn't a lot about, of accessibility available at the time. Um, so what I would do uh, is I would have family members read these programs and I'd hear a description of a program and then I'd say, oh, no, I'd really like to see how that works. And so they would literally read me the code and I'd type it in. Um, and then after typing it in, after running the code, seeing it working, I could sort of look closer at the code and see what was going on. So that's kind of how I, I got into it as really a hobby. I wasn't really thinking about being a programmer or anything like that uh, at 12. Um, but then I started to get a little bit further into it. And as I started into high school, into, you know, trig and algebra classes, they were talking about things like parabolas and, you know, hyperbolas. And I was like, wait, this is a cool function. I wonder if I could make this work. And so I would plug those equations into my computer and run the values through and I could see the shapes. I could see a shape of a parabola. And I would think, wow, this math teacher actually knows what he's talking about. Um, so I started there and then we just went on and it, it mainly was fueled out of just curiosity. Like I figured out how to draw on the screen and then uh, I bought this D to A converter to convert digital to audio and even learned a little bit of machine learning uh, to uh, to make a make the code run faster, um, and so I, then I was able to even do things like some shoot first person shooter games and things like that, and it was it was really fun. So that's kind of how I got into it, and then came college, um, and I originally actually wanted to be an electrical engineer, and one of the guidance counselors sort of talked me out of it. Uh, and, and really pushed me towards software. Um, so that's kind of how I started. And accessibility technology was not really that great either. Uh, I joke with people and say, you know, you know, the worst screen reader in the world is a human being. Because that's what I have to use. Uh, there were no screen readers uh, and I would just use readers that come in read the code on the screen or you know, read through printouts. And as you know, humans are just not that reliable. They fall asleep, they, they wanna leave, they get bored. Um, so you know, all these sort of obstacles having to, to deal with was just, it was kind of interesting. But, um, but as later on through, uh, through the education, there were, uh, DOS screen readers that came along with Deck Talk. And so that made it a lot easier to sort of get through the courses uh, of uh, computer science. 
Uh, and then lastly, just a background, going to get, becoming employed. Um, and I'll fast forward, I've had uh, a couple of jobs, but uh, I'll start with, with where I began at Apple, because that's been my longest tenure. Uh, I came in as a QA engineer, quality assurance engineer, um, and worked with a really small team at the time, two other people. And what was very fascinating to me was having the coding background really kind of enabled me to connect with the engineers. Um, and that I saw early on was really important because, you know, I would ask for a certain feature and they'd say, oh, well, that can't be done. I go, well, wait a minute. What if we do, you know, look at this, the way that these strings are being built up through the, and they would think, oh, okay, well, he knows a little bit about this. Or I'd say, well, what if we store this in a dictionary and then we could recall it later? And, then, and so I think it really, really helped. And then vice versa, right? They could explain to me, well, it's not going to work like this because you have to use up a ton of memory and we can't always be using this memory for this. And so I think that is pretty important, especially when you're on small teams and you're working on something as important as a scooby deer like voiceover. Um, so yeah, so that's me kind of in a nutshell. Um, I've got some other tits and bits later on, but why don't we jump into uh, some of the, uh, <clears throat> what is software engineering? All right, so um, major roles of software engineering, and these are not clear cut in a box. They often run together, uh, some of them more than others, different times and phases of a project. Um, but before I get into that, I'm gonna talk about what is programming. So programming really is, or software engineering, I should say, really is solving problems, uh, solving problems with code. Uh, if you can think about something like, uh, they've solved this already, but at one time, people were concerned about packages being stole from their port porch if they didn't have some sort of um, person to, to watch over, like a concierge. And, and the other problem is that if you were in one part of the house, you didn't want to run to the door if you didn't want to answer the door. So you wanted to know who was at your door. Um, and they've solved this now, but, but this is the problem. And if we walk through some of the steps of this problem, well, one, it's detection. How do you know, how do you figure out who is at your door? Well, you might need something like a sensor. All right, that's great. Well, that can tell you that something's there, but what about detecting what it is? Well, perhaps now we need a little bit of artificial intelligence to run on this device. Okay, that's great. Now you solve that, but then man, like, you need to get this information to a server. And then once it's to a server, how do you notify the person? So you take a problem like how do I solve finding out who's at my front door? You break it into these different components. Now, of course, each of these components are very, very big problems. Like the server alone, there's a lot you have to do to get that working. Um, not to mention there's machine learning to detect who's at the door. But you've broken it down into a solvable, three solvable problems. So in software, there are four major areas, really five, but I'm gonna talk about four right now. Uh, one is, software analyst. So in software engineering, software analyst is usually the person who is communicating with marketing and the customers, as well as sort of the business strategist for the company. And the, the, the job of this person or persons is to sort of collect this data, these requirements uh, from both the marketing and, and uh, business needs and put them into a formal document. And that is sort of, it becomes approved by management and it becomes sort of the, the product spec for what you're about to design. Next big chunk would be the software architect. Now this particular role takes the document from the software analyst and now starts to lay down the foundation of what this product will look like. So we go to our doorbell example, the product, the uh, software architect might be defining 
well, what system languages are we going to use? And how are we going to, to set up the server? And which servers will it run on? How many do we need? Uh, they might also figure out which is the best camera for us to use. Should we build our own or buy something off the shelf? Um, and then of course, play a major role in sort of designing and adding the frameworks needed to, or libraries needed to uh, show the software on the device that would be receiving notifications. And, and this, here's one of the instances where the software analyst and architect might work together. And that is sort of to define the timelines for this product. What is a reasonable scale for this product to be completed? Um, and so neat input on both sides of that is needed. Okay, so now we get to the, the also just to let you know, um, both the software analysts are usually and software architect are usually seasoned developers. They've been through the ringer a few times, uh, but, and these roles, it's probably not a lot of coding that they would be doing, particularly for the software analyst person. But for the coder, the software coder, which is our third role, that person, yes, uh, day and night, 24 seven coding. But again, they're also closely working with the architect because the coder is the one that is going to start implementing all of the, the details and the UI the coder might run into a problem and say, look, you know, I know that you've had this, we wanted to use this framework for, to drawing the uh, UI on the screen, but it doesn't work in this situation. And so they may have to meet several times to sort of work out any issues back and forth. Um, but primarily, yes, the, the software coder does most of the coding. Now to the fourth one, not the least, uh, software tester and this, person or persons is responsible for one, making sure that the product behaves the way specified by that document, and then also try to um, break the product. That's what I like to say. Run tests that put stress on the device, uh, that things that it's not supposed to do, wanna make sure that just don't break anything. So in our example, one of the things you might be concerned about, well, this is a doorbell, it's gotta be outside. How hot can it take it? Can it, can it take uh, 100 degrees? Can it take 120? Uh, we don't know, you know, we have to test this. Someone has to put it in a freezer for a week and see how it lasts in frigid areas. Um, so that's things that the tester does. And I, I like to say that the tester to me, because I used to be a tester, um, is probably the best or most important part of this cycle because they are the last defense before the product uh, hits the public. Um, and they are the ones that have to sign off and say, yes, this product is ready to be released. All right, so those are the four areas that I talked about. Um, and as I said earlier, there's really five because there is an area called human interface design. And these people are usually very, very critical uh, because one, they have some technical background, they can code a little bit, but that's not where they're um, mostly impactful. These are the folks that design the look and feel of the UI, the user interface. Now they do two things. One is they decide the look of the application. Now that, to me, that's not so important because I'm blind. Uh, so all the design of the buttons, all the designs of graphics, the images showing, um, but they also design the usability of the product. Now that is very important to me. And I'm sure some of you have used some apps where you're like, why do I have to scroll all the way down to the bottom just to get to this one thing that I need more often? Uh, and that, that falls into usability. Someone who understands human behavior and can design sort of the feel of how the application works. Now, um, I say these four areas were sort of uh, run together. Human interface completely runs together, especially when you start getting down to the software architect and the coder. There are just, they are definitely one-on-one -on -one with that person to make sure that every step of the way of the development process that human design is looked at. All right, so.
So um, I was gonna show some, some top 10 careers uh, and typically they are data scientist, uh, web engineer, uh, some PHP, um, lots of uh, those. I, I went on Indeed to sort of check out the top sort of 10 paid uh, career software engineer jobs. And those were sort of the top ones. All right. So talk a little bit about <clears throat> the process overall. I want to talk about front end development. Um, so we talked about that with UI. Um, and now <clears throat> I want to talk about how that looks for front end. That's typically what a front end developer does. They design UI that users, customers interact with. And that's why they're called the front end. And so <clears throat> and they're typically speaking, we're typically speaking about um, web-based applications. So you've probably used things like Facebook, TikTok, some of these other web-based applications. And the front end person is responsible for that particular part of the app, the things that you interact with. However, there is typically a almost always a back end developer. And they are developing software that handles that information. For instance, if you like a photo on Facebook, uh, somebody needs to capture that. Somebody needs to store that. If you take a video, that video needs to get stored somewhere and someone needs to not only store it, find the space for it to make sure it's secret, make sure it's private, make sure that when you share it, it goes to the right person. Those are all things that are done by a back-end developer. Um, they're typically not seen. You're in a, a room somewhere working on some servers to make sure that your stuff is secure, to make sure uh, your stuff gets to where it's supposed to get. Um, but that is typically what they, the world they live in. And usually languages like Ruby on Rails, uh, Python is another good languages for we're dealing with servers. Uh, and so that's kind of in a shell what back end and front air, what's the difference. All right, so how can coding experience help your career? Let's say you, you know, heard about these software architect and it's really, and it's just, uh, those are the things, but what if you don't want to write uh, code? And I just saw someone commented about tech writing. That is another one uh, as part of uh, development pubs. Um, but yes, there are careers that outside of software development that if you have these skills can really make you flexible. Uh, for example, um, if you are, you can imagine uh, people have been hearing a lot about automation and about you know, robots taking over factories. And, and in fact, Apple has two robots, Liam and Daisy, and they are there to disassemble devices but someone has to program those robots. They don't work on their own. Uh, so thinking about <clears throat> how automation scripts, learning just simple scripts can help you in almost every daily job. Even things like augmented reality, we have up on our site, AR kits. And you can imagine just, a, just a, a regular job, like a teacher, history teacher, who wanted their students to be a lot more immersed in say, uh, teaching about the Titanic. Um, using something like AR Kit, if you know how to program within that framework, you now become more than just a teacher talking in front of a class. Now you've got an immersive class. And that's a skill that, you know, is not taught when you're trying to learn to be a teacher. But if you add on with those skills of programming, now you've become the hip teacher and the cool teacher. Um, we also know learning to code, uh, employers tend to pay higher if they know that you have coding skills because they know that they can use you more widely if they need to. And then the other career benefits of coding is just having the experience, even if the job has nothing to do with coding. But let's say you work with people who do have to do coding, being able to sort of talk with them, communicate with them, just makes you more, much more valuable to the company. And then I have here, uh, coding can be useful in jobs that you don't even expect. Um, 
I was looking online and, and it turns out there's a couple of advertising company that was using two Pythons to sort of uh, modify some of their scripts. And that like saved them several hundred dollars a year, actually being able to do that. So that's a job that, you know, advertising has nothing to do with programming, but now that you've introduced some Python scripts to automate some of your advertisements, you've now saved the company money. So that's really cool. All right, so learning code doesn't have to be a career. I mean, you can solve everyday problems uh, if you really think about supplying code. For instance, let's say you were involved in a school project and part of that project was you need to sort hundreds of names like once a week. Now, if you did that manually, that would take you forever. It would be annoying and you probably wouldn't do it most weeks. Mm -hmm. But uh, imagine if you could write some software that would just instantly sort those names for you. Um, and and it's very, very, uh, there are many things that uh, <clears throat> less barriers to get involved in coding. Uh, with today's languages, uh, particularly Swift, uh, even just learning like simple for loops and conditions, you can do some pretty cool stuff. In fact, you that's sort of the main uh, guts of sorting algorithm. And then um, lastly, I'll say, you know, make coding fun. Uh, the, the best way to learn something like coding is to have a problem to solve. Now, there are really fun things you can do, like fly helicopters. You can use code to control robots, uh, all cool things you can do. Um, and you can also use code to just explore things that you want to know more about. I'll, um, I'll tell you guys a, a little bit of a secret. So uh, I started here at Apple, actually, at uh, 2006. Uh, but what you don't know is before that, about a year before that, um, the position was available and I applied and I did not get it. Now, at that time I had been away from coding for a good number of years. And so I was a little rusty during that uh, phone interview um, and I didn't get the job. And I walked away and I thought, you know, okay, I could do better at coding. And I thought, well, you know, I could look some stuff up on the web. I could study some, you know, take some classes. And I just thought, you know, that's not gonna work out. You know that. That lasted for like a couple of days. But then I thought, you know, um, at that time I was really interested in 3D audio via the computer. Like I wanted to create this environment, virtual environment in the computer where I could walk around with this character, interact with objects in that audio world, and then use sort of the 3D aspect of like turning around different angles for the different sounds within the, uh, the uh, environment. So that's what I did. That's what I wanted to know. So I, I took the time to, I think it was Visual C++. Um, and so what I wanted to do is break the problem apart, right? Uh, 3D world, well, how do I get things into a world? How do I get sounds into a world? So I investigated that. Um, and then once I got some objects in, it's like, okay, well now they're here, how do I like, interact? How do I like move around and get different perspective on the audio coming from those sounds? So I investigated a little bit more in the code and figured that out. Um, and ultimately I came up with this little world that had a couple of sounds around me. I could turn different directions, 360 degrees, walk forwards, backwards. Um, but what that did is it, it made me sort of uh, shore up my foundation in objective, object-oriented programming. Um, and so the next year, the same position here at Apple came up and I did apply and I obviously uh, turned out well for me, but it definitely was a difference in the interview this time around. I was more, more confident about what I could do because I'd already done it. Uh, and I definitely was asked about it during the interview. So the point of this story it's just that 
don't look at it like, well, gee, I got to learn these commands and got to learn how to do all these. No, it's, it's if you want to do something or find out about something or learn something, figure out a way how you could make coding a part of that. And then it's not you're learning coding, you're trying to figure out this puzzle. All right, so uh, that's all I have. I did want to let folks know that uh, next week here uh, virtually is Global Accessibility Awareness Day. Uh, and then later on in the month of June is our worldwide developer conferences. You definitely want to pay attention to those uh, for some exciting accessibility features. All right, thank you guys very much. Any uh, questions? Yeah, Dean, this is Adrian. Thank you for that presentation. Greatly appreciated. And we'll put a link to Global Accessibility Awareness Day in the chat. We did have a couple questions. We had one quick one from a student. He said, uh, hey, Dean, you had mentioned a variety of careers and things. Um, do you have a suggestion for how many coding languages I should learn before trying to get a job? Well, the good news uh, is that you don't have to learn a ton of them. Um, <coughs> You can focus on ones, uh, I, I think I would recommend Swift, but uh, I think you can learn any high level language. And what you will find that after about two or three, they start to look the same. Like you go into the language trying to look for constructs, like, well, how do I make a loop in this language? How do I do an if statement in this language? Every language has those constructs. Got it, good advice. We have another, um... Uh, question about, well, I'll just read the question. Do you have any tips for new people entering the job market or applying to an internship, including how can students sell their visual impairment as a skill or asset? Yes. Um, so internships are fantastic. If you can get involved in an internship, that is really, really valuable. Um, I, I, I think that employers today are not necessarily, especially when you're talking about high tech jobs like programming, uh, I'm assuming that's what you're going after. Um, they're really looking for skills. Uh, if you can demonstrate that you have the skills and can perform their tasks, they just don't care. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say so. They care, but it's not, it's not going to affect your opportunities to get there because they really want your skills. Um, and I would tell you that to improve your chances of getting a job, it's always good to have a project that you can show or something you've demonstrated, a website, something that you can demonstrate that even if you didn't have a disability, you were able to complete this. And when you do have a disability, it, just, it even makes it better. It's like, wow, this person did that and they have a disability? I mean, you're definitely gonna have a good uh, impression on that employer. Fantastic. I think we have so many supports set up, even with this coding symposium in and of itself, to support our kids finding those avenues to enhance their skills. Uh, Dean, I am seeing it is 150. I really appreciate your presentation and your involvement um, and Apple's commitment to coding and supporting our students uh, with visual impairments. Middle school, high school, college, we have a lot of people here and others seeking employment. And thank you very much for uh, kind of shedding a light on what coding is in the world of employment and coding. All right, I love the comments. You guys are, that's great. Uh, glad it's uh, some encouragement to you. Awesome. We appreciate it. Yes, are... Thank you. What does it take to get a job in coding? Our moderator today is Anna Vilka. Did I say that correctly? Vilke? Tilka, you, you, okay. said, you had it almost right. <laughs> um, she is the Director of Design Accessibility at CVS Health. And joining her um, on the panel is Matthew Bollinger, Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor and Youth Businesses. Uh, I, I shortened that. Matthew, you may have to fill, re repeat that later. Uh, coordinator at the Oregon Commission for the Blind. Carl Weiss, Director of Software Engineering at Vespero. And Mike Huss, he is the Executive Director and Founder of Blind Institute of Technology. Thanks everyone for joining us. And Anna, um, 
floor is yours. Well, before Anna gets started, let me do some a quick announcements real quickly here. Um, make sure everybody knows your mic is going to be, it needs to stay muted. Please do not use emojis in the chat. They're difficult to um for screen readers to pick up. Um, and if you have any questions, please put those in the chat. Um, and that way we can uh, put them in a, in a FAQ that we are planning to put together. And, um, and then we can also share them with um, our Q&A panelists for Friday. And um, so I just wanted to let you all know that. So go ahead and take it away, Anna. Awesome. Um, great to be here. Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Anna Tilka. Let's just do some quick intros. Um, Denise definitely um, did the, the high level, but let's just take a couple of minutes and introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Anna Tilka. I'm the Director of Design Accessibility for CVS Health. Um, I'm blind. I have low vision. I use a white cane. I'm a designer, um, and it's been a really fun gig. Prior to coming to CVS Health, I uh, launched a tech startup raised $2.6 million for my startup, um, had an app on the iOS store, uh, had a web app, um, super fun stuff. So I'm, I'm definitely geeky. Um, that's why I'm here. <laughs> um, so nice nice to meet everyone. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Mike Hess, who's, who's a, a fellow colleague of mine. Thank you, Anna. Uh, I just want to make sure everybody can hear me okay. Yep. Awesome. Uh, yeah, my name is Mike Hess. I am the executive director and founder of a Colorado-based nonprofit called Blind Institute of Technology. Uh, let's see here. Before I founded BIT, I was um, I was a, a tech. I was a techie. I started uh, I'm kind of an old guy. So back in the early mid '90s, I started in technology as a coder. Moved over to the network side of the house. Uh, Cisco certified network engineer. And over my nearly 20 year technology career, one thing was always uh, very evident in the private sector that I was the token blind person. And so I left uh, my six figure income after uh, nearly 20 years to start an organization that was solely focused on uh, really bridging the gap between what I consider the greatest untapped resource on the planet, which is the blind and visually impaired community and the Fortune 10,000. And ultimately that's what Blind Institute of Technology does. We help uh, very large organizations, very small organizations tap into the amazing talent pool, which is the blind and visually impaired community. That's all I got. Awesome. Yeah, I, <laughs> I got you, 10-4. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard for me to get off, off meet really fast, but um, Carl, maybe we'll go with you next if you wanna give your intro. Sure, sure. my name is Carl Wise. I work for uh, Freedom Scientific or Vispero, uh, a director of software engineering. And I really, uh, I came into the industry uh, kind of with a non-traditional approach. I was actually, uh, my, my background with this was in math education. And I was teaching at a small private school and a couple of my students were the daughters of Ted Henner who um, invented uh, JAWS for Windows and uh, started Henner Joyce. So he knew I was kind of a poor fledgling uh, teacher and he asked me to come over in the evenings and weekends and do some work building out old Arkin clone machines from Arkenstone. And that's kind of how I got my foot in the door at Freedom Scientific. And just within a few weeks of just working there on the side, I knew that I had found my, my niche. I wanted to work in the AT field and particularly at Henner Joyce. I just loved what they were doing. And um, it was a real family atmosphere there. So uh, it was a really kind of a small company back then just getting started. Uh, Windows was really ramping up and JAWS for Windows was just releasing. This was back around 94. But I kind of worked, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> My first office there was in a broom closet with a handmade computer. And I just worked uh, it with various roles in that company from shipping to technical support. And uh, one day as I was managing the tech support team, Ted popped in my door and said, how, how would you like to be on the software engineering team? I had, I had worked with some of the scripts for JAWS and uh, I didn't hesitate there. That was a dream come true. And so for the last uh, 20 years or so, I've been working on the engineering team and eventually moved into the director of software engineering where I, I manage uh, the engineers that work on JAWS and ZoomText and Fusion. And uh, I'm very grateful that I, I, you know, that that opened up for me. Um, it's just been a great ride uh, working for this company and seeing it grow 
over the years, and I'm really thrilled and honored to be sitting here today with you guys. So I'm looking forward to participating on this panel. Awesome. Thanks, Carl. Um, and we have one person left, Matthew. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I'm Matthew Ballinger, and I'm maybe the kind of odd person out here, uh, as I'm not actually work, I do not work in the tech industry, but I work in the employment side of things. I work for the Oregon Commission for the Blind, part of the vocational rehab kind of um, services offered in Oregon. And my role is, I have a couple of different roles in the agency, as Denise was doing the introduction, and my very wordy um, stack of, of job description or titles. Um, on one hand, um, I do, I'm a vocational rehabilitation counselor, so I work with individuals who are blind in the state of Oregon um, to get, maintain, or advance in their employment um, and building whatever skills needed to, to do that. Um, and then on the other side of my job, I'm the youth business relations coordinator. Um, and so what I'm doing there is really working with our transition aged youth who are from high school into kind of early college age youth to really make sure that they are building the skills that they need to transition into the adulthood um, and the, the career path that works for them. And, you know, that a lot of that definitely includes things like technology skills um, and just some of those like soft skills job readiness, all of those kinds of things that are really super important for, I think like what you were saying, Mike, that untapped resource that is the, the, the blind and visually impaired community, um, part of what bridges that into actually getting jobs and, and um, being able to use that amazing skill set for employers is building all those other skills so you can really stand out, speak to your strengths, know what you, um, know how to talk about your strengths in an interview and a lot of those kinds of self-advocacy pieces. Um, and also as a business relations coordinator, what I am doing and, and myself and two other business relations coordinators in the state are really working with employers to help bridge that again, to be like, I don't know if you all know this, but we have all of these amazing people that are so motivated to get work. They're going through all of this training, all of this effort to come and work or a place like you, and you have really got to see what they have to offer. So we're talking to employers and helping to um, build more comfort maybe for them into hiring people who um, experience vision loss um, and just kind of envisioning what that could actually look like. Um, and then I also help to coordinate our summer work experience program, which is our summer youth program where students are working in the community for by, uh, four to five weeks and maybe a lot of their their first job building those experiences working with employers this year we're doing it for the first time kind of virtually offering virtual work experiences um, so we're providing work experiences across the whole state which is new and exciting and full of uh, challenges also so um, yeah that's that's kind of me in a in a nutshell happy to be here thanks Matthew um yeah, you had a really good note in there um, just around self-advocacy. Um, that's huge for me too. It has been big. I know it's big just in the disability community, um, you know, just letting folks know what you need and um, making the space for, for being successful. Um, but I'm curious, like from this panel, um, maybe we'll start with you, Carl. Um, I'm curious, like, um, you know, you, you mentioned a little bit about your past and how you got started. Um, what What is the biggest piece of advice you'd have in terms of um, resources, like how do, how do people know if they like coding? How, how do they know? Um, is there something they can dive into that you can think of um, or does anything come to mind that, that you, would, you would find highly recommended so that somebody might be able to explore and, and just see, hey, is this something I'm interested in um, from, a, from a, a specific level? You know, if you, if you were, when you were a toddler found yourself or was always getting in trouble for tearing apart everything and <laughs> putting it back together, <laughs> I'm raising my hand. With parts left over, you know, you might be interested in software engineering. I mean, it's a, it's kind of like a, a mechanical endeavor. You know, people who like building, you know, building things and the pieces. It's a virtual way of building, you know, a universe around yourself. And it's what really drew me to software engineering, you know, myself. So my experience was, you know, when I was in high school, I loved computers. You know, all of us old guys like to get around and talk about our first PC, which mine was 
you know, a portable computer, which meant basically it was about the size and weight of a sewing machine with a handle on top. But that kind of planted the seed for technology that, you know, when opportunities arose, um, I started, you know, really, really turning on to it. So I didn't even know when I was in college that that's what I wanted to do. But as opportunities came up um, in Henner Joyce and, and Freedom Scientific, it just, oh, wow, this is, this is it. This is what I want to be doing. And I, you know, I talked to a lot of uh, interviewees who didn't know when they started college that they wanted to be a software engineer. And just some ancillary class that they took just suddenly lit up that world for them. So maybe it's an area where you have to kind of explore a little bit and see if that's, if that's an area of interest, because a lot of people find themselves three or four years into their degree and they're, they're not certain what they want to do. But when they take some ancillary class where they come in contact with that technology, it just lights up that world for them. That's a good point. And I, I think there's a, a big, um, kind of nod to, um, you know, puzzles and like, you know, creative problem solving, right? Mm -hmm. um, building things. Uh, there's so many different uh, components to, to coding and um, engineering that, that are pretty fascinating. Mike, I'm curious what, um, you know, what would you recommend in terms of resources for folks um, who might want to explore and see if they're interested in, in a career or even just getting involved uh, on a recreational basis of coding? <laughs> Uh, mine, mine is a little less uh, conventional, quite honestly. And uh, like I was, uh, <laughs> uh, when the opportunity availed itself for me um, when I was at Red Rocks Community College uh, on the west side of Denver, the Denver metro area, uh, there was a computer training for people with disabilities program uh, that started just after the Americans with Disabilities Act um, passed under George H. Um, w. Bush, and so under I'm sorry, George H. Bush, sorry, George Senior, and um, and so uh, IBM gave a grant to three community colleges. Uh, they all happened to be west of the Mississippi, and Community College of Denver happened to be the uh, one of the recipients of this, and it was literally to create more computer programmers, and specifically from the disability community. And so my access teacher at Red Rocks Community College has, has started talking to me about this program. And she says, uh, you know, what, you know, what, what are your, what are your, what are your thoughts? And I said, well, what's a computer programmer? Like I had no, no idea. And they're like, well, and it's, again, this is, I'm an old guy. And she goes, you know, word perfect 5.1. And I'm like, yeah, of course. And she goes, well, programmers make that. And I'm like, okay. And then my next question was how much do they make? Um, so I, I, <laughs> I was, uh, I, I was engaged at the time and I was like, okay, well, I, I know how much I make now. Can I make more money by doing computer programming? And the, the short answer was yes. Um, so I, uh, did, uh, so I, I had no clue of what computer programming was, but, uh, in, at the halfway mark of the program, I was absolutely dead last in the class from turning everything in. And then uh, by the end of class, I had one student of the year award because I may not be the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm very tenacious. And I think you know that about me, Anna. So, um, so I, uh, you know, and, and to me, programming is one of those, like we, we, there's almost like the stereotype of what a computer programmer needs to be. And, and Carl, I totally appreciate like, you know, with math and everything else, like I didn't have any of that. But once I started to get taught, like, you know, this is what a computer program can do and started saying, and just logically saying, oh, there are if else statements, if else, if else and or statements, like, and you just start realizing like, well, I can follow logic and start breaking down computer programming to be a little bit more fundamental than, um, uh, than, than maybe typical education is. And just recognize like, this was really a viable, like I wanted to make sure I could support my, my family and all of those kind of things. So I was super motivated just to learn this. Now, ultimately what I found out in technology is, you know, that was, I was a fair d developer, but I really had an aptitude honestly for network engineering, which is still logic based, but it just it, a little different than uh, typical coding camps. And so what I love about just exploring coding, exploring uh, tech is just to realize like, there are so many avenues you can take. And I, I, I know you know this with a huge organization like CVS or like if you just have the aptitude to follow logic, 
Like there are so many avenues you can take once you once you uh, dip your toe in that uh, technology pond. And that's that's what I'm a big fan of when it comes to the broader tech system. Yeah, I definitely get that. Um, in fact, you know, even in my work, uh, you know, working with engineers and product and, um, you know, being part of a design organization, um, I want to see more non-visual designers, to be honest. Like we have a couple, um, we're working with a couple of people in that capacity, but even that um, has its own sort of follow the logic uh, introduction to tech, right? If you're doing tech, you're putting out software, you're part of that life cycle. Um, Matthew, over to you. Um, what, what would you recommend in terms of, um, you know, for the folks listening in and um, maybe interested in a career in technology or just ex interested in exploring? Yeah, um, I think there are a few options that come to mind for me. I mean, I think you know, kind of what I'm hearing, like Carl and Mike say, like, there are so many options that are available to you. And I think what we often see kind of in, in my world is especially young folks who, you know, because they're using technology, of course, just anyways, it's all over their world. But if they're also using a lot of like adaptive technology, um, they're, they're feeling themselves kind of drawn, like I have a lot of tech skills and maybe a lot of my peers don't have, is tech right for me? Maybe it is and maybe it isn't. And I think just really kind of building that sense of exploration is really important. Um, so I think of things like informational interviews. If you want to like learn about different kinds of jobs in the tech world, get a hold of people and, and you know lean on um, supports that you might have to do so. People love generally to talk about the work that they do. Most people that are out there in the tech world doing their work may not get a lot of people knocking on their door saying, hey, tell me about what's really cool about your job. Um, and people are generally really willing to give some of their time to talk to people that are interested in their field. Um, and I really, really recommend that to a lot of the people that I support um, to build that sense of efficacy. And like, I can just reach out to somebody and say like, I would like to talk to you about the work that you do so I can learn a little more about it. What do you like about it? What do you find challenging about it? Um, I also think that exploring um, resources like through some of the like career centers, right? So in um, in our area in Portland, Oregon, um, we have uh, WorkSource and they have a program called TechRise. Um, and that is a program that is free for eligible students um, where they can go and get kind of this intensive tech training. It's like going to information sessions for places like TechRise or Job Corps if they have tech programs, all these different places that might offer training before you actually get to that training, there are information sessions and you can learn a lot more. So just really building that sense of like, I can go out into the world and like sample, get a little bit more information, start to build a picture maybe of what I, I want to do. Um, I think if you can kind of exercise that muscle of, of, of kind of exploration and adventure, that will inevitably steer you on the right path. You'll find the thing that like lights up in the back of your brain, like, ooh, that's interesting. And if you learn to follow that, uh, you'll you'll get where you need to go. That's that's great advice, actually. Um, the old communication, right? <laughs> uh, reaching out to people and and just saying, hey, what is it about your job um, that really like sparks you? And I think um, we've heard we've already heard a lot of that coming through from this whole panel. So that's um, that's a great recommendation. I know for a fact that um, people that I know, um, you know, if if you're actually listening in. Um, and you have questions about any of the things we're talking about, like, I think we're all like very open to, to paving the way to, to finding you um, the right person to talk to. So um, I, I would encourage you to reach out. Um, Carl, with, with Vespero, um, what, have, what, have, what have your experiences been in the past? Like, what would you point to as um, a couple of the things, the characteristics that have made candidates successful just across the board? that have made engineers successful in our yes. organization? Yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think one, especially when it comes to, you know, blind and low vision engineers is, you know, just a very strong sense of ownership. And I think I heard this come through from you, Anna and Mike is, you know, ownership of your, of your access technology, really knowing the types of tools that are available to you. Because if you, you know, when you go to work in an organization, there's a good chance that they're not going to know what you need and they're not going to try to solve that for you so if you can you know surround yourself with some skills with your with with braille or with screen reading technology you know the, the kind of tools that you need and be 
familiar with what's available to you. That's a, that's a huge leg up. And then taking ownership to another level is be responsible. I've seen engineers um, be successful because they really take ownership of their own technical growth. And this is, this is particularly, as I've you know, again interviewed so many um, college graduates, um, you need to basically supplement what you're learning in school. You know, let, let your passion for engineering feed you know, personal projects and things that you do. When I, when I see a resume and it has um, some internships on it around programming, or it sees personal projects that you've done. And when I interview people and I find out, well, they've been working on projects and things on the side to supplement their education, you know, reading books, um, you know, basically taking ownership of their, um, of the technology. That really, you know, I know that's gonna be a successful person. When they get into the job, um, they're gonna keep being successful because they're, if they're curious, they're reaching out and, and learning. So I think that's a, that's a, a very positive thing. And then even when you get the, when you get an engineering job, that doesn't mean you're done learning. That's really just the beginning. Um, keep, you know, I, I've had several engineers on our team through time that were most notably students of software engineering far into their career. They continued reading and honing their craft and their skill. And software engineering is a craft. You know, it's a, it's a skill that you develop through experience over time. And, you know, one of the, one of the resources available is, uh, you know, great books on software engineering. And uh, I know through Kindle, you know, these are these, uh, yeah, I think O'Reilly books. I mean, these are, these are accessible platforms where you can find lots of books like design patterns, um, things like that, that kind of give you general knowledge about software engineering. And so, I mean, I just think that that hunger and passion for self-learning and self-motivation will make you, you know, successful in your job. Totally valid. Um, actually, that that rings true with me too. Like as a as an engineer and in, in my own personal, or, sorry, as an entrepreneur in my own personal experiences, um, you know, just even as a hiring manager, right? Like one of the things I've noticed is um, when you see somebody with drive and passion, who's like willing to just tear through and get through things no matter what. Um, yeah, you're willing to like actually look past like if there's if there's not the quite the technical chops or if there's not quite something else like you know that person's going to catch up. Mm -hmm. um, so give me one second. I'm getting a call here. Um, that's my hope. Um, Mike, how about you? Like how how would you um, what would you recommend in terms of um, you know the top or what would you say are the top char char characteristics for placing folks in an engineering positions? Um, well, that kind of what hasn't been said, like I, it, it just kind of differently, um, it, 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 like I, I call it the double A standard or double A standard, it's aptitude and attitude. And there are so many times, um, uh, Carl said it and you said it in just a little bit different way, but that attitude of, um, uh, yeah, this, this is difficult, but uh, you know, my, <laughs> uh, kind of my chip on my shoulder, which, uh, living here in the mile high city is a mile high and a mile wide. Like I, uh, what's, what's made me, uh, successful over my career and some of the information that I like to impart on our candidates that we, uh, place all over the country, uh, and now all over the world, which is really exciting. But, um, we look for that attitude of just, um, recognizing and and you know for blind visually impaired folks like i i literally asked the question like is your blindness is it an obstacle or is it uh, a barrier and uh, you know us from the blind visually impaired community understand why i'm asking that question because quite honestly, if you're still, if, if folks are still hung up around the wheels around, and we all know that blindness is an emotional ride. It's a spiritual ride. It's a, it's a mental ride, even though it's a physical obstacle. But if people are still really struggling emotionally with their blindness, you know, we let them know like, hey, we're probably not the right organization for you. 
But if your blindness is truly just, you know, an obstacle, it's something I got to maintain and manage and get over with. Like, that's an amazing trait that we know that we can do something with. And then aptitude, like we don't need, um, yeah, if you've got code out there, you know, that's out on GitHub or, you know, whatever it is, like wherever, you know, if you've got actual sites that you want to show off, all of that is fantastic. Um, you know, but more importantly, like we want to know, like what, what you continue to do to, to sharpen those skills instead of like, oh, I finished a two-year program, I finished a four-year program, I finished a certification, that's great. But what took me, you know, my success was, again, like I didn't just have a single certification. I had a whole bunch of certifications. I stayed thirsty for learning new platforms. And that's why I was a six-figure engineer. Um, and, and, you know, with, within a very competitive space, I wasn't the token blind guy that just got fed a lot of money. Um, I am a badass engineer because of my blindness, not despite my blindness. Solid, solid, Mike. High fives. <laughs> um, Anna, can I, can I chime in on that real, real yes. quick? I mean, you know, in our organization, I mean, some of our, our best engineers are our blind engineers. I mean, they just bring a different approach and it was interesting. I was discussing that with, uh, with one of our blind engineers earlier today and just noting that the approach to software engineering for a blind person is a little different and maybe more comprehensive where it seems like they just, they, maybe it's retention, you know, remembering what they hear. Um, but some of our blind engineers have the best comprehensive view of a, you know, an enormous code base and of the architecture around it. And I just have the utmost respect for, for our blind engineers and who have succeeded. I mean, it's, it's definitely a doable, it's a doable thing. I mean, it's, it's a hurdle that can be overcome. And like I said, I wouldn't trade those guys for anybody out there. I mean, you could line up a thousand engineers. I'd pick these guys. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, it's, um, and I will say like, um, like, you know, even for my own self, um, having experienced vision loss over 10 years or so, um, not, I now look at this not as an impairment, but an empowerment. Um, it's different for me. Like it's turning a corner and making a decision and, and, and becoming the lion, <laughs> you know? really saying, Rar, let's get out there and do this. Um, how about you, Matthew? Like, um, do you have any, any characteristics that come to mind um, in addition, or should we should we switch up the 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 question? I mean, I just want to I want to say how much I love the aptitude and attitude piece that, that Mike mentioned. I think that's mm -hmm. that's just spot on. And you know, when I talk to you know the folks that I'm working with, like, yes, having the like base skill set and is is fantastic. But really having that that mindset of wanting to learn, wanting to progress, wanting to, I think just having the passion. Um, if the passion is there and the attitude is there, like everything else follows behind that. Um, and like the skills, the skills can be taught, the like ins and outs of how to do the work can be taught if you're in a space to be able to learn. And um, I think that that's where that like, exploration piece and really making sure you're doing something that um, feeds you, um, even if it is challenging you, it's also feeding you and making you want to go further and learn more and challenge yourself even more. Um, that's where you'll find that sweet spot. So if, if someone is in that place, um, I think that they're in a, in a good place to succeed. And then I also think just the other piece is just making sure that they're finding the work environment that's really gonna work for them, finding the employers and places that, like we're saying here, like really value the perspective that they're bringing to the table. Um, if that can happen, I feel like it's just a, it's a home run most of the time. Yeah, definitely, um, 100%. Um, so, I mean, that, that kind of brings me to another question. Um, I know in my organization, like in my team, I guess, um, something I try to create just culturally um, is, is a sense of psychological safety. Um, and the foundation of that and sort of, you know, the core of that is so that we can all be kind of point blank and honest with, with each other, right? I think that's a really important thing as you get into any, any career and just any profession in general, um, the ability to give and receive critical feedback 
Um, I'm curious, are there other um, sort of core things that you think go into the equation there um, from your all, all of your different perspectives um, that make success? Um, it could be a, a core value, it could be, um, you know, any, any other ingredient for this recipe. Um, Mike, maybe we'll start with you. Uh, it's, a, it's a great question and I, I love that so much has been brought to light with the pandemic uh, with culture because there have been some amazing LinkedIn articles uh, and Reddit articles that have talked about how, how quite honestly, the, uh, the virtual space has really um, challenged, <laughs> to say it lightly, uh, uh, culture. And I, I honestly believe, you know, so BIT, since we are a hundred percent, like we, like we were, we were so ready for the pandemic. It wasn't even funny because we were already 80% remote. Right. And so, um, and I, I truly believe, uh, that, uh, we actually had a talk about this, that, uh, since, you know, 13 of our 15, uh, uh, uh team members are all from the, you know, blind, visually impaired community, um, we, we also were able to talk about this, this <laughs> I, I think what's, uh, we, we bring to the game that quite honestly, uh, it just comes innate is resiliency. Like that, that ability just to, like we've, you know, how many of us on the call who are part of the blind visually impaired community have not been lost in a great big place before, um, have not, you know, stumbled over something, run into something. Uh, I personally have been hit by four cars. I do not recommend it. Um, like there, there are all these things, you know, like I, you know, just that to me that builds up that resiliency muscle. And, and quite honestly, when, so part of our coaching that we give our candidates, and again, we put, you know, I mean, we just this, I mean, literally this month we've placed seven people, Right. And we're always letting them know, like, say, you know, be be super comfortable with like the amazing person that you are, the challenges that you have to overcome because they differentiate you from all the competition out there. So and I know like disclosing is a very personal choice, but the way we coach it is approaching it as an asset, like resiliency and all these amazing skills that you've had to learn to overcome things is a true asset to organizations and it adds value to an organization's bottom line and culture. Struggling to get off mute again. Uh, love it, love it. Um, Carl, I wonder, um, do you have any, any thoughts there? Yeah, kind of along the same line. Um, yeah, I think a key attribute is open-mindedness when you're working in, a, you know, in team situations. Uh, you know, I know we have, you know, I've seen lots of engineers who are really, um, you know, bright, bright coders, but if they can't work well with other people, I, I, I remember we had this one, this one engineer that worked for our company that um, he was kind of, he was a great, he was a great engineer, but um, kind of, kind of hung up on himself a little bit and uh, commented out a bunch of somebody else's code with an if def do stupidly comment block. And the other engineer, of course, called me just, you know, <laughs> Why was this guy picking on me? You know, and, and eventually that guy moved on to another organization, another company, but years later came back, you know, looking for a job. And that was not, you know, we wanted people who would actually really work together well. And in our company, we try to set up good, you know, mentorship types of programs and get our engineers really working together as a team and to have that open mindedness to realize that, you know, after you get some experience, it's not your way or the highway, but the ability to work with other people and work collaboratively to create solutions. I think that's a really strong, a really strong tool and attribute that helps people be successful. And I've noticed this on our team. I mean, we have a lot of engineers um, that they're not, they're not territorial. They're very happy to share their experiences and their knowledge and to help raise up young talent coming into the workforce. So we, we set up in our company an apprenticeship program, actually where we could take young engineers that maybe even still in college, and that this is a pre-engineering position where they could actually work as an apprentice in a very collaborative and nurturing environment where they can kind of learn their skill set on the job. And again, that, that ability to just work collaboratively, you know, until you become more independent in your craft is a, a really strong attribute. 
It's a great point. Um, yeah, it's like collaboration plus uh, humility and um, yep, mm -hmm. just working well with people. Great point. Matthew, what about you? I'm definitely agreeing with the points that have been shared so far. And I think part of it is also, you know, just that, um, that mindset for problem solving. If, if, if you are encountering a problem and your inclination is to like dive into it rather than to shy away from it, that, that to me seems like such a huge piece. Um, and what I think is true of most of the folks that uh, we support, that's absolutely the case. You know, they're there solving problems every day, especially if they're new to blindness, um, new to work. Um, there are all kinds of puzzles and problems that are coming up every day. So to kind of go back to what Mike was saying, really realizing that your experience as someone um, who's navigated vision loss and employment and school and whatever um, is such a strength and, 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 and implies such a larger skill set and implies resilience. Um, and if that like piece of that like desire to problem solve and really jump into the middle of it and, and pull it apart and figure it out um, is there, I think that that is um, a, really, a really strong attribute for someone to bring into a job like, like programming or engineering. 100%. Um, actually, Matthew, like, uh, curious, like, you know, you, you have a unique perspective where you're working with multiple folks and um, different employers, um, and Mike, too, um, I guess, you know, for the most part. I'm curious, like, what do you find, um, like, what's, like, the, the perfect uh, sort of match look like? Like, um, how do you think about, like, matching, you know, um, different people? Because, different people will be successful in different places. Um, is there any kind of um, um, way of thinking or philosophy that you have um, or, or, or mechanism or methodology that you have on, on placing or making those introductions? I mean, I think, you know, it's, it's equal parts science and art, right? It's, it's very much, it, you know, we have the luxury of really being able to work on a very individual level with the um, people that we are supporting and as well with, with the, the employers. We really get to know the employers. We develop long-term relationships with employers um, as part of our kind of like business relations. And we really develop very kind of um, close relationships with the clients that we're serving as well and the job seekers that we're supporting. Um, and so it's as much intuition as anything, right? It's really like getting to see like, is this someone who is gonna just do really well independently from the jump, in which case this employer is really looking for that. That might be an environment they would really succeed in. Um, or is it someone who really might need a lot of flex? We don't really know what this is gonna look like. This employer has been really fantastic at being flexible, at figuring out what's gonna work, at maybe a job adapting um, maybe job tasks so we can like start with what we know works and then add on from there. Is that going to be the most successful environment? So, I mean, there's, there's, I think my, my overarching strategy is that there is no overarching strategy. It really comes down to, um, working with individuals and thinking through and talking through, um, what the best environment for them is going to be. Um, and also starting, you know, we really believe in kind of progressive employment. So starting small, doing things like meet and greets, informational interviews, short-term work experiences to try it out, and then eventually maybe moving toward um, actual employment and placement. So, um, and what someone is ready for at any given time um, just depends on where they are kind of in their path. So a human conversation. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah, Mike, Mike, do you have any any thoughts there? Uh, like methodologies or is it do you feel it's pretty much the same? Just, um, you know, some of it's you know, some of it's science, but some of it's art. Right. Um, making the introduction. Does this fit? Um, does it seem right? It, it, honestly, Matthew said it uh, pretty spot on with uh, almost equal parts science and art with that. Now, with some of the relationships that we've had for, you know, a number of years with uh, uh, CVS and Spectrum and some of other, uh, some of our other long-term clients, like we get, we get to know their culture as well. 
And so that certainly helps. But so much of our business, quite honestly, is opening up new doors. So within CVS, cool, we've placed 11 people within the A11Y space. However, you know, we're, we're opening up doors within the Salesforce space and, you know, other parts of CVS. I mean, CVS is a small city when it comes to the size of teammates that are there. And so, you know, getting to know different um, supervisors and managers, we actually lead um, now, Anna, with, we lead with what we call empowerment training. And we found that uh, this is a great way to um, help educate uh, managers and leaders uh, for the, maybe for the first time, often for the first time. Um, if you've never, digitally communicated with somebody with a disability, somebody who's blind, uh, somebody who's deaf. What, is, what does that look like? What does that sound like from a, a manager, a director level kind of perspective? So we lead with this empowerment training and help, help folks realize like, oh, you mean you have to create a PDF like uh, to be, make it accessible? Like this is what you do. And we walk them through the process and oh, the same thing kind of applies with web content. And so we we empower the supervisors on, you know, feeling more comfortable with the broader professionals with disabilities community. And so, it, yes, it's it's art and science, but we also like we, we lead and we've had some great success uh, opening up a whole lot more doors by leading with this empowerment training. That's awesome. Um... Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely see that. And, and you're right, CBS is kind of a small, <laughs> small city. Carl, I don't know if you have anything to, to, to add here. Yeah, sure. I mean, when we're, when we're looking for candidates, I mean, we do look for a technology overlap, you know, for experiences that match our technical environment, you know. Um, but, those, but those shortcomings can be overlooked if there are other really strong attributes. And sometimes... You know, when you're reaching out for a job and you're in an interview, sometimes a question that you can't answer can actually become your strongest asset in the interview. You know, when somebody doesn't know an answer, but they're willing to engage in conversation and talk about uh, a question or an approach and work through it, um, then we start looking for things like, well, how, you know, how are they catching on to different technical concepts? And how do they converse technically? You know, if they're comfortable talking about technology, then those, those discussions start to take on a life of their own and can actually make somebody really, really shine, even when they don't know the answer. The worst thing you can do is go in and, and try to pretend like you know all the answers when actually not knowing something can become a strong attribute. That's fair. Um, something I've, I've, I've said about, um, you know, even in, in my hiring process and for myself as a leader is, um, be open to being wrong, you know, or being open to not knowing what, what the answers are. And that's where you get some curiosity and um, some depth and just authenticity, right? So that's, mm -hmm. that's good. Um, all right. Well, I, I, I have one, one more thing, um, kind of, but of all the things, like, what is the, what is the, what is a good um, recommendation? What, what would you recommend for folks who might be in the interview process? So I don't know, where um, our audience um, falls in terms of maybe some people are just getting curious about, about tech and coding. Maybe some people um, have a little experience, but maybe there are folks who are um, you know, in the interview process and they're already working you know, to, to go to these interviews. What's a, a piece of advice that you would give? Matthew, maybe we'll start with you. Um, I think my advice maybe is kind of twofold. One is to um, really be thoughtful about um, describing your strengths. I think kind of being able to talk about your strengths in a very descriptive way is always helpful to paint a picture for an interviewer. So talking about how maybe you've used access technology to do a job, how you can really like um, describe those things in a realistic way, painting a little picture and really being strengths focused and like solution focused. Um, I think that can really help an employer, especially if they're not someone who is experienced, if they haven't had a lot of experience with employees who have um, visual impairments, to be able to say, like, oh, I can envision how this has actually happened because they just told me how it's happened for them in the past, how they've gotten stuff done. So I think that's one piece that I really think about. Um, and then also, you know, maybe this is, is more rudimentary, but I think it's also something that gets maybe overlooked is 
doing your research before you go into the interview, having really thoughtful questions, really like um, recognizing that the interview is both for the employer to know that you're right for them, but also for you to know that that employer is right for you and to be able to ask them questions about their culture and about um, whatever it is that you need to know about them. And that involves first going in and familiarizing. Don't ask them a question that's on the front page of their website. You know what I mean? Um, that's going to show interest and it's going to show that you're also um, in a space of self-efficacy going into that interview, really wanting to make sure that it's a good fit for you. That's great advice. Um, yeah, and I can see too, um, exactly like you said, uh, you know, making sure that it's an interview both ways, right? Uh, making sure that the the employer or the person that you, the the company, the organization you're talking to, sort of checks the box that, and makes you feel like you're in the good place. Carl, what about you? Do you have advice for for people? I know you just gave a good piece of advice. So, you know, um, Matt you took more. my he took my very special one just now, oh. which is you know research the company that you're interviewing for. I mean, we love to hear people who identify with the mission and what we do as a company. So that's a, that's a great one, Matt. And then, um, you know, going with the mindset that they, they're they actually looking for somebody. They've taken the first step by interviewing you. They want you, you know, when I'm interviewing somebody, I really want them to succeed. I'm on their side, you know? So I know interview, you know, interviewing is kind of a grueling process and you go in, you feel like the light is shining on your head and, you know, you're sweating and, you know, but remember that we're kind of all on the same, we're on the same page here, you know, we're looking for somebody and we're hoping that they succeed. And then I guess the, the other tip I would say is, you know, if you've accumulated some experiences, some things that you've done, some personal projects or volunteer work or, you know, some coding projects, then don't, don't hesitate to get down into the details of it because it's pretty quick when you're interviewing, you know, it's pretty quick to detect when you're interviewing somebody that they, if they won't dig into actual details and everything is in big general terms, you pretty quickly come to the conclusion that this person really doesn't, doesn't have a grasp of the technology. So if you start talking at a function level or things that you've designed or constructed at a detailed level, talk about the, the classes that you've put together and how they work together, then that's, that lets me know, you know right away that this is somebody who's actually been in it. They've actually been uh, you know, working on things and learning the technology. That's a great point too. Um, like even if you don't have that direct experience, do you have a parallel experience? Or if you haven't worked on, you know, exactly that project or exactly that technology, how can you apply that sort of thinking or that sort of logic or um, how have you solved problems in that way? Um, I really like that. It shows strength in a, in a candidate. Um, Mike, what would you um, say is uh, an interview methodology or um, uh, advice that you would give? Sure. Um... And, and this kind of sounds like a sales pitch, Anna, but it's it's not because we offer it for free. Uh, so what we we actually started uh, last summer a, a free workshop every month. Uh, and we have people all over the country that attend, but it's a tell me about yourself workshop. And again, 100% free. Anybody can sign up for it because at the end of the day, our end goal for BIT is to help uh, uh, professionals be ready and crush their interview. And we help uh, kind of connect the dots between we, we, we think that the resume is this, you know, completely separate thing that just gets you that interview. And then you get the interview and it's this completely separate thing. And actually, they're not disparate. They're actually connected. And we help uh, professionals connect those dots. And Matthew and Carl, you both, uh, you already kind of said this, but what we do is we, we talk about your career highlights, and your career highlights isn't just professional experience. It is absolutely educational career and your volunteerism career. And you can talk about some of the amazing things that you've done. Each one of you have some amazing skills. You really do. And it's just being able to frame them in a way that when you get asked that very, very important question that gets asked in various ways, tell me a little bit about yourself. And all of a sudden now, when you have the practice and you've actually put some of that thought into your resume, and then you realize like, oh my gosh, now I have a framework to be able to answer that question in that very, because here's, I mean, here's the deal. You have two and a half minutes, maybe to make an impression. We just all know that that's, that's the science when, when you're talking about this and not to put any more pressure on you, but to, to understand, and you have about 
you know, 30 to 45 seconds to really capture somebody's attention. And so to practice this, to actually put some thought into your career highlights, and we actually help um, individuals, professionals, job seekers, career seekers with this skill set to be able to help them out. And, and for example, we have examples of, and these are, these are real live LinkedIn profiles of a stay at home mom. Uh, and, and I think you'll appreciate this because of the transfer of being an entrepreneur and a startup and how it related to, you know, uh, being a, a, you know, manager in a huge company like you are now, like the transferable skills where well, there was a, there was a, a young lady's profile who talked about for 14 years, 14 years, she was a stay at home mom. She was a stay at home mom, but yet in her profile, her LinkedIn profile, she talks about how she was the CEO of her household. And she gives ex ex excellent examples of how she was the CEO of her household, how she was the CFO, chief financial officer of her household. And she gave fantastic examples of how she was the CFO of her household and how those skills are 100% transferable. And so we help individuals you know, understand like you've got great experience that each and every single one of you have great experience. But how do you then put that on paper? And then how does that transfer over to that very awkward question? Tell me a little bit about yourself. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, high fives to that too. And with um, that, Anna, we are mm -hmm. at our, we have gone just a couple minutes over time and okay. we want to give yep. everyone a break. So I'm sorry to interrupt because this has been a really great conversation. So many uh, wonderful comments in the chat about um, how awesome this is and how much they enjoyed it. So thanks to all of our panelists. Thank you, Anna, for moderating. And uh, we appreciate your time and your stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Matthew, thank Carl, thank you. Anna, as always, yeah. what a pleasure. Indeed. Right. Thank Indeed. You. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Adrian Amandi. I'm the director of the Education Resource Center at the California School for the Blind. Uh, very excited to uh, introduce this next panel, a bunch of people that I have a ton of respect for myself. Uh, moderating this panel will be Mike May, Chief Evangelist for Good Maps, Dave Pinto, the executive director of the Academy of Music for the Blind and the president of Yes Accessible. John Gardner, professor at Oregon State University, go Beavs, and founder of View Plus, and Joe Jorgensen, the founder of Accessibike. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Mike, the floor is yours. Great, thanks Adrian. Thanks to all the organizing committee and thanks for uh, everyone who's listening. As uh, we said, I'm Mike May. I live in Reno, Nevada. I'm really from Northern California, and I am currently in Nashville, Tennessee. The company I work for is based in Louisville, so I'm kind of a, a, a bi-coastal, cross-coastal person, and I've been involved in startups for most of my career, and somewhat by accident, I realized that having gone blind at age three, there's one thing we all learn that's a real benefit to being blind is you have to learn to be adaptable. And I think my other colleagues on the panel here would agree that being adaptable is key to being an entrepreneur. Now, I didn't figure that out when I was three or even when I was 13 or 20. But when I really started my career and I had traditional roles at some big companies, uh, all of a sudden I found that in those companies, I was ending up in the startup components of different departments and eventually with my own company and startup uh, that was uh, built the world's first and only laser turntable. And so now I can look back and say, hey, those skills of being blind and being adaptable and finding workarounds and using alternative tools and techniques was key to being an entrepreneur. So although I've worked for other companies, I've played that startup role in a lot of those companies. So we have uh, three wonderful different perspectives. I think we're gonna have some things in common uh, from our group, and I'm gonna have each one of them do a, a one minute introduction, and then you'll kind of know their voices and, and what their backgrounds are. And then I've got, oh, about seven or eight questions that I'm gonna pose, and everybody doesn't have to answer all of them. I think a lot of us will, will overlap, so. And what I'll do is I'll put those questions out there and 
uh, one or two of us can jump in and answer each one and then I'll move on to the next. We're gonna leave about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for your questions. So feel free to put them in the chat and they'll accumulate and then be read off to us and then we'll answer uh, at that uh, point in time. So let me uh, turn it over to Joe for an introduction. Hey, I am Joe Jorgensen and I founded Accessibyte and do like 95% of the work with that. I also have been in the blind rehabilitation field for the last 10 years, spent a lot of time with assistive tech, O&M, VRT stuff. So I've seen the field from a lot of angles. I uh, you know, have family members who are blind and visually impaired as well. So I like to uh, you know, just kind of roll my sleeves up, dig in and get things done for people who need it. Great, thanks, Joe. And where are you? I am just outside of Chicago, two blocks away. I'm in Oak Park, Illinois. Okay, well, not too far from me. Um, John, how about you? Are you out there in Oregon? Um, yes, I am. Um, I'm in Corvallis, Oregon, as Adrian pointed out, the home of Oregon State University, where I was a faculty member in the physics department for, uh, I don't even know how many years, 29 years, something like that. Felt like a thousand. Um, I really got to be an entrepreneur kind of kicking and screaming. I didn't really want to do it. Uh, but, um, well, when I lost my sight, uh, one of my major challenges in continuing my career in physics was graphics. Um, I was doing solid state experimental physics and the results all came back as graphics and had to be analyzed by graphics. And I didn't have any way to do it. So um, I got interested in trying to make graphics accessible. Uh, uh, one of my students and I invented a new technology. We developed some software and I went off and tried to peddle it to other companies and nobody wanted to do it. Everybody said, blind people don't need graphics. <laughs> um, well, I was blind and I needed graphics. So um, I started a company. View plus, and I, I will. I will have to say, I still feel like a. a it succeeded more by luck, uh, and uh, the courtesy of strangers than anything I did, because I'm an academic, and academic, academics don't know anything about business. I know more than I did, but I certainly don't know a lot. Uh, but that's how I got here, and. Uh, I will be happy to tell people everything I know. It probably won't take long. <laughs> Back to you, Joe, uh, Mike. Yeah, th thanks, John. And I think anybody who's blind and reads Braille has probably had their hands on something produced from uh, View Plus. So thanks for that. It's re really enriched our lives because uh, Braille graphics or tactile graphics are something that uh, is a very important tool whatever we do, whether it's in a startup company or in other aspects of life. Uh, Dave, how about you? Um, I'm in Los Angeles. And uh, by the way, John, just a couple of years ago, we bought a Columbia ambassador for our Academy of Music for the Blind. It's working great. Good choice. And uh, so um, I'm a musician and I was teaching a class in uh, recording technology. Uh, in 96 and a blind musician walked in to a class of 20 uh, sighted guys on earphones banging away on their uh and nope and so this and the blind guy was a came in and started playing the piano and he was very good but he was disturbing the class that's how i got started uh supporting the blind in music um I realized he couldn't do anything on the computer like a sighted peer. So I quickly got up to speed in, uh, and made a couple of mainstream um, music applications accessible to the blind. And I had the good fortune of teaching one of them to Ray Charles for a year. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, so I started uh, uh, teaching youth and I thought I'd started a, a conservatory of music for the blind. So we started that and we had the young kids uh, trying to make music on the computer, but they didn't know the keyboard. So I quickly made a uh, application that taught them typing. Alert. And I was astounded to see, uh, I made it a lot of fun, how uh, 
their attention was so uh, captured by it. And, and so I created a piece of software called uh, Typeability. So uh, that we sell commercially and um, it's been a blast these last 25 years. I really enjoy being in such a steam company right now too. <laughs> nice. Well, there aren't, aren't a lot of companies that are doing what you're doing and um, what Bill McCann is doing and, you know, the, the music genre from, a, from an educational and from a technology and startup standpoint is, is kind of small. Um, you know, I think we often think of entrepreneurs as, you know, Silicon Valley and startups in, in electronics and computer science. And there is a big role for, for that background. But from, um, I think to help our students kind of think about this, uh, maybe, maybe John um, or Joe would have a perspective on um, how important is a computer science degree? What does that look like in terms of a startup company? Either one of you? Well, well um, I, I think I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to answer that question because my degree is in physics. And um, <laughs> when I was an undergraduate, uh, computers were only barely being invented. In fact, I learned programming on, with a programming program, uh, a program called Fortran, not Fortran 2 or 7 or just Fortran. Um, I, I, I personally do not think that computer science is an absolute requirement for being a good software engineer, a good coder. Um, it, it's probably helpful, but we certainly know a lot of people who are really excellent computer uh, produ uh, software producers who have degrees in other fields. And I know quite a few physicists who have uh, turned to, to computer programming software and made some remarkable choices. So, um, I, I, I think it's would be a not a bad choice, but it's certainly not uh, an absolute requirement. Yeah, well, I think the um, good points and our second question, I think you've all addressed and, and I haven't so much, so I will mention it, a comment on it. Uh, how did you get started uh, with your startup company? Um, I had a little bit of a, Am I getting a phone call? You guys still hear me okay? We can yes. uh, hear, hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, so my real f first startup, you know, separate from the big companies was a laser turntable that we, uh, we did really because we were passionate about music and stereo. And this is before the CD had taken hold. And so playing vinyl records with a laser instead of a needle meant that you wouldn't wear them out. So my, my colleague and I who started this really did it out of a, a hobby and a passion for music that we turned in to uh, an actual startup project and raised $7 million, which is a big deal back in the 80s. And we, there was a certain amount of being naive because Sony and Philips had tried to do this and they had not succeeded. And that's why they went on to the CD. We didn't really know any better. So there's something about being young, having a fresh idea and youth and uh, that can contribute to, to making some revolutionary breakthroughs that you might not have if you're, you know, old season guys like um, John and I and, and others. So that's kind of how I got started. It also was a little bit by chance. Um, so what cool ideas didn't work out? Now, this is an important thing for any entrepreneur, any startup, because there's plenty of things that you, you got to throw away. And I know people like Steve Jobs would say, oh, you know, I started four things that failed before I had one thing that was uh, a real success. And I think that's a true thing. Um, any of you guys have anything to talk about in terms of cool ideas that didn't work out? Gosh, I bet we've all had so many, many ideas um, pursuing them is a different thing. Like in our imaginations, I bet Joe and John had a lot of different ideas, but actually to work, do you mean uh, to actually try something out and it didn't work? Uh, well, I guess in, 
you know, some ideas come to fruition, some of them come and go. I, I think my perspective is you got to wade through a good eight or nine bad ideas before you get to a good one. Well, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and as far as um, I, I have three products, uh, one is to make a sonar, uh, which is a digital recording music um, application on Windows, uh, make that accessible. And the other one was to make Sibelius, which is a music printing program, make that accessible. And then Typeability, which is a standalone application teaching how to use the computer and how to type. And each one of those, I had some ideas that didn't come to fruition. One was, one was with Typeability. About four years ago, I got together with a um, guy at Irvine, um, college to make a haptic glove so that we could recognize what finger was being pressed. Uh, Joe, you you have typeo, right? Correct. Yeah. So I imagine you also thought, gosh, it would be good to have finger recognition. Well, uh, we spend a long time on this, but the gloves were so cumbersome, but I imagine pretty soon they will not be. And if, if the price point would come down, it'd be really great to get a, a glove that would then send the information to the computer so you would know which finger was being used to type. So that never came to fruition just because I think the state of the art was not mm -hmm. good enough at that time. Yeah. Joe, were there any things before your, your successful startup, anything that led up to that? Oh, there are plenty of them. A lot of little goofy ideas. I was making kind of throwaway games on the app store um, for Apple. You know, it's kind of testing the waters, getting used to developing some stuff and putting things out there. Even Typeo, which is Accessibyte's primary application, it started as a Windows build and was specifically made for adults who were learning to type. And as kids started using it, some different needs came up cross-platform stuff. Um, so going to the web made natural sense at that point. And it kind of steered from there more towards the needs of kids in school, became a little goofier, more games, things like that. So it just was a different uh, product than I had originally envisioned that that was needed. Um, so just kind of follow your nose with all this stuff that comes up. You know, before you know it, you have a uh, a different path ahead of you, but it all makes a lot of sense in retrospect of how you got there. Yeah. Well, I'm thinking back when I came up with the first accessible GPS in 1999, 2000, and had been working on that for three or four years before it. And the timing just wasn't right. GPS wasn't accepted in the market enough. There was a lot of uh, wires and hardware and expense. And it wasn't until two or three years after I did start it, before it started to get some traction and we got some competitors. So it was a good six to eight years before the first notion of accessible GPS in 1994, before you started seeing it on the Braille node and on phones and other technologies. So timing is a key component. Uh, probably my idea that kind of flared and then died was something called the bun warmer. And this was, if you picture, um, you know, this is, this is non-tech, but you picture hand warmers and the powder that you open up a packet and it starts heating from the air because it's, it's a process of rusting and the rust creates heat. So we made one that was, and the idea was in sports stadiums, it was cold like Green Bay and Buffalo. People needed to have a warmer that they'd put under their jacket. And we learned that the NFL actually controls all of the concessions for all of the stadiums. And if you're not in the old boys network and part mm -hmm. of that uh, NFL thing, you can't sell into those stadiums. So I'm, I didn't really research the market and know what I was getting into enough. I had a cool idea, but it flopped. And where it really would have been successful was in the medical market where they need emergency heat uh, at accident locations. But by the time I figured that out, I'd run out of money and had to um, get rid, can that idea and move on. You know, Mike, it's uh, really interesting that you mentioned 
being a little early on some of these ideas. <laughs> um, a very recent example of that that came up with Accessibyte was I thought for a long time, one of the draws with the platform having its accessibility built in was students could use the apps on any device, like even their parents' cell phone or random Chromebook sitting around. And I got a lot of people tell me, well, you know, this is all controlled in the classroom and the teachers are there with them and they use dedicated hardware. And I get that. But then when this last year COVID hit and all of a sudden everybody was like forced remote instantly, a lot of people started using uh, the platform on all these random devices and it came in pretty handy. And I kind of saw, well, yeah, that's exactly what I thought would happen. Not the circumstances I anticipated, but, you know, it's kind of a need that people may not have uh, agreed with, but you just keep doing it sometimes. Mm -hmm. I, <clears throat> I, I understand what Mike is saying about timing. Um, when we uh, introduced the tactile graphics and bosser back in year 2000, um, I, I, there were maybe a handful of his ed teachers in the world who believed that tactile graphics were important, but they kept hiding from me. Uh, we really did have trouble getting it to market. Um, and the only thing that actually made us succeed was that the phys ed teachers began to notice that even though they kept telling me that blind people didn't need graphics, there were 20 or 30 blind people lined up in front of our booth at trade shows because they wanted to see those cool maps we were making and things like that. So um, it's finally catching on. Um, I think that U plus is slowly, slowly changing, uh, changing the world, but I still am very disappointed how few people, blind people or people who make things and do things for blind people, um, believe that graphics are important. I mean, graphics are everywhere. And yet blind people, by and large, uh, have to be satisfied with somebody telling them what it looks like. Mm -hmm. um, one, of, one of my disappointments, I, I don't call it a failure because I, I don't concede it's failed yet is um, a decade long or more uh, work on trying to develop an audio tactile product we call Iveo. Um, and it, it really does give really good access to graphics, but um, very few people use it except a lot of second world countries, third world countries um, have adopted it and uh, we get a lot of business from those, but first world countries, I don't know why. It's so. very interesting, very interesting. I remember about 15 years ago at CSUN, I think it was 15, you guys will remember, uh, this guy came out with a computer uh, and the screen you could feel, so you could know what the desktop felt like. Mm -hmm. He mm -hmm. thought that was the cat's pajamas. And so I just rounded up as many of the um, line guys at, uh, at, at the right time from the different booths to come and check this out. Mm -hmm. And they all thought, oh, that's great, but that was the end of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I can I can understand that it it wasn't the end of it for us, but uh, it certainly was disappointing because I I needed it so badly, and I thought, well, we put this on the market and everybody's going to just jump all over it. <laughs> Didn't happen. But yeah, little by but, little. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, one of the things that keeps coming up over and over again. And sometimes these things emerge from university projects because some student thinks they want to do something for the blind. And often it is an obstacle detection device. And we all know that it's been for 40 years or more, people have tried obstacle detection devices on the hat, on the chest, on the cane, and they keep failing uh, some of them have more success than others. The laser cane was all right because the VA would buy it. But when you go research the market and you do your fundamentals, which everybody should do for any project, project idea, try to kick your tires really hard. If you ask blind people, they say the cane is fine. The dog is fine. The sighted guide is fine. I, I'm going to run into that door uh, in, a, in a half a second anyway. I don't need to know that it's there uh, a second ahead of time with an obstacle detection device. Uh, and those devices keep failing and people keep trying them again. And there's, there's you know, it's just sometimes the way things go, you, you have to know, is there a real need? 
And then you have the mystery things like John's saying, you know, yeah. another country likes to have a product, but then this country, people in this country might not. Hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the questions um, that was on the list too is, uh, is a degree required to be an entrepreneur? And if so, which one? Very good question. That, yeah, yeah. You go ahead, Dave. Yeah, well, I think it's the same thing that John said in regards to, do you have to have a, you know, you have to go to school to be a programmer. It's much easier not to go to school these days to get all the skills. You know, you have YouTube, and you have all the resources to learn how to do things. I personally, I'm a high school graduate. I avoided school in the 60s. I just totally rejected it and learned everything myself. And I became a concert pianist and a programmer just by picking the right teachers and the right circumstances. I did take a few uh, things in college, but I think my personally a degree uh, is not necessary, except it's a great piece of paper to have. And that might count if you're gonna get a job with a company, but if you're forming your own company, I don't think it matters. Yeah, I'll agree with uh, Dave and John and kind of just point out we have physicists and musicians and a guy who studied English literature and Japanese here who all went into <laughs> developing tech stuff. So if there's a passion for it, you'll figure it out and you can learn it. Does it help uh, shorten the runway on a lot of stuff and make your life a lot easier when you hit unknowns? Yeah, definitely. Any knowledge you have is helpful, but uh, yeah, you can get the job done without it. One of the yeah. it's been- and one of the advantages of going to to college are the connections that you make. Honestly, mm-hmm. learning is 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 great. I'm an academic. I certainly would never say that uh, universities are not good for a lot. But uh, as to become an entrepreneur, it's I guess it's nice, but it's not required. Yeah, maybe less so if somebody's not super academically inclined and isn't able to go get a PhD or whatever, then maybe they, if they're really clever and work hard, those kinds of uh, aspects are it, it's probably as important as any in, in terms of um, startup companies and making things successful because it, it takes a lot of hard work and, and um, ten, tenacity to hang in there and, and make, some, make a, a product into uh, a supporting company. Mm-hmm. So beyond education, then let's talk about what tools uh, do you recommend a student be proficient in, uh, in order to be in a startup environment? <laughs> you got to be able to get back up after you get knocked down. <laughs> <laughs> kind of a Gumby thing, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, you got to, you really got to know everything. If you're going to be an entrepreneur and set out to build something and get people on board with using it. Um, every tool that you can have, you got to be able to leverage and use and build upon. And like John said, you really have to develop a thick skin. You're going to hear so many no's before you hear any yeses. And most likely the reason you got into it is because what you want to do doesn't exist or something like that. So, you know, people may think, oh, there's not a need for that or Nobody wants it or else it would already be there. Well, maybe it's not the case. So you just kind of roll up your sleeves and fortify your mind and, you know, just get ready for, for a wild ride. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the key is, uh, number one, you, you have to be passionate about what you're doing, what you have to offer. You know, you know, oh, this is good. It doesn't exist quite like this. There's a niche for this. Um, so you have to have the passion, but you also have the practicality. You have to know that your limits. You might be a great visionary, but have no business sense. So you, so you, you have to be practical enough to go. Okay, I need a partner or partners here to do the things that I don't do well. And if you have that right. passion, you, you'll find those partners. 
Yeah, I hear everybody talking about connections and networks and partners. That That is huge because we don't accomplish any of these things solo. Mm. You know, in, t in terms of that, I'm just thinking of one of the things that when I went from the laser turntable company on to the bun warmer company, <laughs> one of the things was that we were about 40 people in, the, in our laser turntable company in Silicon Valley. And one of the things I thought was, a successful company is not just about how much money you make and being profitable, but it's also about quality of life. And I thought I would really not really rather not live in Silicon Valley. It's just kind of a cement jungle. And uh, wouldn't it be nice to live some other place? But once you start up a company, you get going, it's pretty hard because those people that you depend on your, your colleagues, your compatriots, they're not going to move. So when I started my next company, I decided I was moving first. And then I would start a company and have people that were already in the new place. So I picked Ashland, Oregon, and moved and lived there for six years. And that's where I did, did my next projects. But that's something to think about, particularly in this era that people are now more open to remote work that um, think about your quality of life and not just how much money you might make. Pick a good spot and make sure there's resources, people you can hire. Uh, that, and of course, being blind in, in transportation is key. And think about all those practical aspects before you start something up. Because if you do have a cool idea, it may not just be you and your garage. It might grow into something bigger. Do you guys have any other practical aspects when you think about the location and where you've started up and how you've gotten your resources? One of the things that you need <clears throat> to start a, <coughs> excuse me, one of the things you need to start a business is money. And uh, I don't know how young people manage. I started View Plus, I was past 50. Um, I was comfortable. Um, and I had a lot of uh, friends who were academics who, had uh, done reasonably well and had a little money in the bank. And I was able to raise some money from friends and family. Um, my mother uh, put in $100,000. Um, I, I don't think I could have done that 20 years earlier. I just, uh, I don't think the company would have even gotten off the ground. Might not need so much money if you're if you're bootstrapping a software company, which is mostly what we're talking about, but uh, this was a hardware and company and you alert. just, you just needed money. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, you know, we, we managed to get enough. Well, we ne never had enough, but we, <laughs> we got by, but uh, I still don't know how to mm. do it. Yeah. You really cut to the chase, John. That is, that is the fundamental thing that everybody's going to need in one one way or another. What about uh, Joe and Dave? How, how did you guys find getting this all funded? Mm, well, with Accessibyte, and this may be kind of the counter to John's side, but you nailed it on the head. With software, it can be a little different. So Accessibyte was bootstrapped. I had a not great computer. I was running Windows 8 and because it was a while back. And I just started developing and making the products that I wanted. And uh, it was a real slow start. I didn't have any sort of capital injection. Once things got moving a little bit um, and we're, you know, self-sustainable, that's when people start coming around and wanting to invest. But by that point, I thought, well, I built all this on my own. Why give any of that up now? Um, you know, would it shorten runways here and there and make bigger deals come quicker? Without a doubt. But sometimes you also have to protect uh, the ideas you have and what you want to do with those ideas and also just the direction you want for yourself. Just decide, you know, is this something that you want to kind of shoulder mostly on your own financially or just kind of let it be a slower build? That can be okay. And it does show that you can take simple tools and cheap tools and really get the ball rolling that way and then start fleshing everything out later. The full online platform that I have today and everything that's gone into it, I never could have hosted it, never could have built it all out, you know, in the beginning, but slowly 
but surely it kind of brought it to that point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the word that comes to my mind to, to, to be safe is versatility. Uh, uh, to put all, uh, uh, what are they, all your eggs in one basket? Is that, mm -hmm. is that the term? Yeah. While you're developing something, that's dangerous. Um, so, for instance, um, when I developed all this software that I've done, I was also earning um, uh, earning a living as a musician and as a teacher and as a ranger. It's just so many different things. And so I could afford to spend time on my pet projects. And as they started to develop, um, succeed or fail, uh, my life wasn't succeeding. Or fail. I was still eating. So I think it's important to be versatile, uh, to have other fires, other irons in the fire. Um, yeah, uh, that's what yeah. I would contribute to that. Well, and as musicians know, and artists know, they often have, happen to have a day job in order to make their, their passion work and to pay for it until they can afford to do their their passion full time. Um, yep. I've certainly spent a good part of my career in, in uh, startups. Uh, when, when you're the boss and you're paying the bills, you're, you're the last one to get paid. And so you need to develop a cushion through your, let's say through your big company job where you, you get, get some savings. So you can, you can fund yourself like John, I got some, some family funding, some small amount of funding. Um, <clears throat> In the, in the uh, laser turntable company, that was the traditional venture capital, or as we like to call it, vulture capital money. And we went around to the traditional VCs in Palo Alto, Page Mill Road, and raised uh, a lot of funds from them. But there's an important thing to know when you do that, they expect 10 times return on their money. So if they put in $100,000, they want a million out. And that's because a lot of their companies fail. And so they got to make up for the failures. And you give up a lot of ownership in that process. So it's important to make a decision as you go along, which is, do I want to be a small fish in a big pond, which is what happens when you sell out to VCs? Or do you want to be a big fish in a small pond, which is when you maintain ownership yourself, you fund it, you you bootstrap it, whatever it takes. So that you're the, you're the big fish in that equation. And then the other thing to think about is uh, whether you set up as a nonprofit or a for-profit and there are benefits to both approaches, but it's something to consider because it's, it's hard to change from one to the other. If you realize, Hey, I just want to make a decent living. I don't care if I sell off my company or I don't need to have a lot of control. I, I'm fine just having it as a nonprofit. That's fine. But the for-profit, of course, is, is a different equation and uh, something to consider when, when you're looking at these funding mechanisms. Yeah, um, yeah, the Academy of Music for the Blind is a nonprofit. That was, that was a, a, a deliberate decision. I couldn't imagine it as a profit making. Uh, now, just because a nonprofit doesn't mean that you don't earn money uh, being in it, you do. Um, but the sky is not the limit. And uh, in, in a for-profit, you, you can potentially earn a lot more. So for the Academy for the Blind, we established as a nonprofit to serve a, a talented blind youth uh, musically, you know, uh, but for my software company, it's it's a profit making. <laughs> hopefully, it, it does make a profit. But um, it, it's a for profit company deliberately. I couldn't imagine mm -hmm. why I would want to be non profit. Maybe others have an idea. Of why would you want to go non profit? Anybody else? You know, um, with Accessibite, one of the things that initially did uh, move my hand towards being a for-profit was all of the uh, record keeping and hoops you got to jump through with a nonprofit. It just it was a lot to learn and take on. So I just said, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay a for-profit business and make it easy on myself and just build from that direction. 
Yeah, if you have a product that is going to be serving a small market, a niche market, like the blindness market, then it's worth seriously considering about being a nonprofit because um, you may not ever have the scale that it takes to to make the big box. Uh, and uh, as as Dave says, you know you can you can make a decent living and still have a nonprofit stature. Um, one of the other things that were, really was important to me and Sendero Group and our GPS company was grants. We got really good at getting federal grants. We probably got $5 million over several years. And accessible GPS would not have happened without, um, with, without having that funding. And there's a question about uh, social, social entrepreneur uh, and that's something that's really a, becoming very popular, particularly in, in the younger set, people who are 20 or 30 right now, they are oriented more towards, I want to contribute. I don't have to make a whole, you know, 10 times return like the VCs do, but I'd, I'd like to have, you know, 1% return or <laughs> something positive, but I really want to make a difference. And I think that's the social component is something that I think is a really interesting um, mechanism now that people can take advantage of. Anybody else on that? Oh, it's just amazing to me how many young, young guys do open source mm -hmm. software, great products. And they're not thinking about money at all. Well, when you're that young, but it's so yeah. so good. It it competes with you know the older guys who are seasoned and uh, need to uh, support a couple of kids and a wife. <laughs> so it's amazing to me what what how many good products come out for free. Yeah, that's kind of a good point too. You got to be able to support yourself. You got to support your business as well um, with Accessibyte. In the beginning, I was just like giving stuff away, but it was costing me money every time I did so. You just can't do it. You do have to make sure you do have a plan and reevaluate that as you go. It, you know, stuff gets expensive to produce and maintain. Before you know it, it can be a little overwhelming if you're not, you know, pulling in money that's covering those bases. One of the things that's hard in uh, in, in in this field is pricing because you just can't use the mainstream as a as a guide for pricing. Um, uh, our embossers cost, uh, I mean, they're just horribly expensive compared to getting a pretty nice printer that you can get for $99 from from Office uh, Depot or someplace like that. Um, and when we first brought it out, we were uh, looking at a profit margin uh, considerably less than, than what we eventually got. And uh, we fortunately had a really good advisor who came up and said, well, look, uh, you have to understand you have um, not only uh, are you not able to take advantage of economies of scale, which is important, but not that important. What is important is that um, you have such a dilute market and, and you're gonna have to pay your dealers and distributors or, or deal and distribute yourself uh, over vast distances. And we, we have some software products that we initially put on the, I put on the accessible graphing calculator on the market for something like $75 originally. Uh, we didn't expect to make a lot of money out of it no matter what, um, but nobody would buy it because they wanted to buy it from a dealer and no dealer would handle it because they'd have to sometimes drive, some of our dealers had to drive for several hundred miles to demonstrate a product and you're not gonna drive several hundred miles to demonstrate a $75 product. So uh, it's now selling, I don't even know what it is now, but like $400, something like that. And it's simply because uh, that's what, it, I mean, I don't make any money. B plus doesn't make any mm -hmm. money from the product, but, but um, the dealers have to make money from it. And this is just so much different from the mainstream. You, you just need different pricing models, different, profit margins because if you if you don't do this and your company goes bankrupt it's not going to help anybody yeah so you have to make enough money that your company stays alive well one of the one of the things to think about if you have an idea 
when you can, particularly if it's blindness oriented, try to make it be multi-purpose. And so, for example, what I'm currently doing now with Good Maps, we, we do indoor maps and our focus is accessible navigation. The way we make it multi-purpose is by creating maps indoors. You think of, well, sighted people can use maps indoors. And what about asset tracking? People need to know where stuff is. Hospitals lose equipment. They don't know where expensive equipment is. So if you have an indoor map and you have a, a tracking device on something expensive, you, you know where it is. Uh, first responders need maps indoors. Um, so by having that multi-purpose application, you can make something affordable for a blind person that you can't otherwise. And I certainly learned that with our the, when we came out with our first iPhone GPS in about 2012, and we were charging, you know, $99 and $69 and things like that. And everybody else's apps were 99 cents. Uh, people just said, I, I'm not going to pay it. And like like John's product, 69 and 99 didn't pay for the product. Uh, but 99 cents sure wouldn't, and we would never have a million customers at 99 cents. So you, you got to figure out the equation that's going to work, and you can make it dual purpose or multi purpose. That's um, awesome. This is, this is Adrian. Uh, Mike, I don't, we do are limited on time, and I wanted to say that comment about multi purpose almost ties into one of the questions from the chat, which is, um, how did you learn to write a good business plan for your startup? Um, and did you resource that out? Did you connect with people? How did you how did you take your good idea and develop it into something that might be multi-purpose? And what stages are actually in that development? Anybody have a business plan? Oh my, yes, I had a business plan. Actually, I, I, every once in a while, I go back and look at the business plan that I wrote and what was it? 1999 or something like that. Um, and I, I, I find I did a very good job of projecting the business plan, except for time scale. <laughs> My time scale was off by about a factor of, oh, maybe five, maybe even more. Uh, I thought it'd be much faster. Um, but it is I, important to have a plan, even if it's not right. It you have to have a plan if you're going to, especially if you're going to try to raise money, you've got to tell people what it is you plan to do. And writing a plan is sort of like writing a, a grant proposal, it forces you to organize your thoughts. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can't sit down and write yourself a plan that makes sense, then you're, you're in the wrong business. You, you ought to not try to start a business, you've got to think it through. and decide what it is, what's important. What are you going to try to accomplish? That's, that's really critical. And you know, these helps days, you... oh, they, these days they like to call it a pitch deck. You know, nobody says business plan anymore. <laughs> and uh, they want, they want, you got to create a deck. Yeah. Whether go it's ahead, a pitch Joe. deck or a business plan, it also helps you kind of work in, in reverse. You can work backwards. You can say, okay, what's like the big goal here and how do I make that happen? How do I make, that next step happen, et cetera, et cetera, working backwards, because the gap between starting up a business and having a fully functioning, self-sustaining business is pretty huge. So sometimes some of those pieces you may not know right off the bat until you do sit down and just start knocking it out. Adrian, any other questions? We do have a young man who has been with us all day who is very interested and in, he's saying, do you have any advice for starting a game business? <laughs> yeah, pivot it to uh, education stuff instead. Uh, accessible, I originally just wanted to build a bunch of accessible games and I started doing that, but it was so hard to get them moving and to get them paid for and to sustain them that uh, it ended up shifting a lot more into all the typing stuff and the other academic apps. And so Accessibyte Arcade is a small piece of what I had originally thought that I wedged into that, just to make sure there are games, but I kind of disguise them in with all the other uh, education apps. Thank you. Any more, Adrian? Um, I, we have one more here. Uh, how, so a couple of you mentioned getting uh, literally funding help from family and friends, but how else did 
uh, family and friends and your relationships help you in the process of going through the highs and lows of starting a business? Mm. Anybody have their teammates uh, in helping out? I think so. Hard to deal without the, the family support. Well, yeah, I certainly have had family support. Uh, my wife was, uh, was actually working for the company before I was um, and has continued. She's the glue that makes the financial parts run together. And uh, nowadays, uh, my sons are involved in the business one way or another. And uh, thank goodness for that, because uh, uh, I was a lousy CEO. And you need a good CEO to, to be able to make things work. And uh, my son, Dan, who is CEO now, is, uh, is, um, is really has all the talents to, to make the company work. And I wouldn't be able to afford him if he wasn't committed mm -hmm. to me as, a, as my son. There's also an emotional element to having, you know, people to lean on. It's super stressful doing any of this stuff. And there are so many ups and so many downs. So just having uh, like a personal outlet that you can lean into, whether it's friends, family, you know, acquaintances, whatever it may be. Um, but <laughs> a little piece of advice I learned is you got to keep an ear out for when enough business talk is enough business talk, because it may be your passion, but not everybody <laughs> else's. <laughs> yeah when we were hitting up those nfl stadiums it was my sighted wife who was driving around all over the east coast from stadium to stadium um and uh, so that that uh, was key i think there was one last question about uh, do any of us do coding uh i never did I write JavaScript, and I do it badly. It's I mean, it is absolutely ugly. But um, I'm probably not good enough for uh, actual commercial software. But it's great for research. So learning, learning what the important things are, and then get somebody else to make it work better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. I uh, you know I knock out a lot of stuff. I think leaning towards simple tools that are flexible and you can do more with is a good solution rather than any sort of, you know, coding or programming that you're struggling with because you always can hire somebody and bring them on to clean up bad code or, you know, get your ideas put on, uh, on the screen. Yeah, it's important to be technical enough to understand and communicate with the, the programmers and the engineers. You don't necessarily have to do it yourself. Yeah, but you should have good familiarity uh, with the tools so you can evaluate who's doing well and not. Yeah, and if you can't afford, you know, to hire other people and you are just kind of maybe testing out a minimum viable version of what you're doing, knocking it out in any fashion will give you a lot of, uh, of good information you can work with, even if it's not the most clean code you've ever written. And, and if it's your business, you're the leader and you need to understand enough about what other people are doing to, uh, to be able to evaluate it, to help them, give them resources, know when, know when they're doing well. And if you don't know anything about coding um, in a modern business that, that does software, I, I think that that's, a serious disadvantage. You do need to know, know at least the language. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think those are good words of wisdom to uh, wrap up on. I, I think we're um, at the end of our time, Adrian. Am, am I right? We are at the end of the time. I really appreciate each and every one of you as people and as leaders in our field. Um, I appreciate the time you took today to share um, and just did an excellent panel there that we are looking forward to being able to host on the APH YouTube site in the future. Um, and we hope will be an inspiration to young students who are interested in, in technology fields. And I think this particular panel is stretched beyond that. I think you're gonna reach out to kids who are just interested in making a difference and making positive social change, uh, whether they're making money or not. 
Um, just that <laughs> idea of, of delivering on, on a great idea. Um, thank you again. Um, for all of you, we do have a closing code um, for those of you looking for credits. And actually, Alaya, can you jump yep. in? Um, I'm missing it. The closing code is quorum. <laughs> the closing code is quorum. It is in the chat box. Nice. Thank you, Alaya. So this is the end of day one of the 2021 National Coding Symposium. We will be here all week. Um, so the same Zoom link that you joined today, uh, please join in for the rest of the week. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday look very similar. We start off each AM and PM session if you're on the West Coast or PM and later PM if you're on the East Coast or somewhere in the middle um, with a keynote, an inspirational keynote, followed by a presentation, followed by two different panels. Um, if, you, if you have somebody who's interested, who you think is interested in this particular panel today or another panel that you caught today, they will be repeated with different panelists later in the week. Um, we certainly, as those of you who uh, participated today recognized, uh, we didn't take lightly who we invited to these panels. By no means did we know everybody or necessarily invite, we probably didn't get an invitation out to a lot of people who would have been fantastic. Um, but the people that are participating in this coding symposium are true leaders in our field and truly people who um, who have a big presence and an impact and inspiration to our students. Um, so again, I'd like to thank everybody and I want to thank the participants in our chat and the students and uh, people who have joined. I'd like to thank you for all of the fantastic engaging questions that you've had. And it's not just the questions, the resources that you've given each other in the chats as these conversations have been going on throughout the day. Um, have me with a web page open with way too many tabs, uh, trying to be like, what's that? Oh, I gotta look into that. That, that looks fantastic and interesting. Um, so definitely interesting. Uh, we will be trying to collect and capture all of those resources and put them on the, uh, the coding symposium website at the APH Connect Center. Um, so hopefully we'll see you all again tomorrow. Um, and by the end of the week, you'll join us in a Q&A. Some of these guys will be back for an open question and answer, totally open mic um, for all of you to participate and ask questions directly, um, as well as our announcement of the award opportunity for students. We have five students who are very well deserving um, who are winning a, uh, a product offering from Vespero Humanware and APH, um, as well as a few hundred dollars, maybe to start uh, put in the bank and invest in their next business. So thank you again, everybody. And we'll see it again tomorrow morning. We start again at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, please check the website. You're welcome to jump in at any point during the day and the week for this coding symposium. Thank you, Mike. And thank you, Adrian. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks all. I wanted thanks, to guys. jump in and thank you all myself. This is Denise at APH. Thank you thank for, you, for Denise. being here. You're welcome. It's it's, Mike, it's, been, it's been fun. Thanks for inviting us. Oh, <laughs> so glad to have glad to have met all of you. Look forward to working with you again. Yeah. Mike, yeah. who Bye -bye. is that lovely, um, sweet dog yeah. that's joined My you? My golden retriever. It's her dinner time. Oh, oh, she's, she's, okay. she's letting you know she's nudging you there, huh? <laughs> but I also wanted to thank you on behalf of the APH Connect Center. Um, thank you so much for for doing all that you do and for contributing everything that you contribute to this field. I totally agree with Adrian. You are an inspiration and, and just leaders for our students. So we appreciate your time today and look forward to continuing to work with you um, down the road. Thank you so much.